Publisher's Preface, Introduction, and Translator's Preface of the 1907 English Language Publication of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Publisher's Preface of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner For more than twenty years I have entertained the design of publishing an English translation of Der Einzige und Sein Eigentum. When I formed this design, the number of English-speaking persons who had ever heard of the book was very limited. The memory of Max Stirner had been virtually extinct for an entire generation. But in the last two decades there has been a remarkable revival of interest, both in the book and in its author. It began in this country with a discussion in the pages of the anarchist periodical Liberty, in which Stirner's thought was clearly expounded and vigorously championed by Dr. James L. Walker, who adopted for this discussion the pseudonym Tock-Cock. At that time, Dr. Walker was the chief editorial writer for the Galveston News. Some years later, he became a practicing physician in Mexico, where he died in 1904. A series of essays which he began in an anarchist periodical, Egoism, and which he lived to complete, was published after his death in a small volume, The Philosophy of Egoism. It is a very able and convincing exposition of Stirner's teachings, and almost the only one that exists in the English language. But the chief instrument in the revival of Stirnerism was, and is, the German poet, John Henry Mackay. Very early in his career, he met Stirner's name in Lange's History of Materialism, and was moved thereby to read his book. The work made such an impression on him that he resolved to devote a portion of his life to the rediscovery and rehabilitation of the lost and forgotten genius. Through years of toil and correspondence and travel, and triumphing over tremendous obstacles, he carried his task to completion, and his biography of Stirner appeared in Berlin in 1898. It is a tribute to the thoroughness of McKay's work that since its publication, not one important fact about Stirner has been discovered by anybody. During his years of investigation, McKay's advertising for information had created a new interest in Stirner, which was enhanced by the sudden fame of the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, an author whose intellectual kinship with Stirner has been a subject of some controversy. Der Einzige, previously obtainable only in an expensive form, was included in Philip Reclam's Universal Bibliothèque, and this cheap edition has enjoyed a wide and ever-increasing circulation. During the last dozen years, the book has been translated twice into French, once into Italian, once into Russian, and possibly into other languages. The Scandinavian critic Brandes has written on Stirner, a large and appreciative volume entitled Le Individualisme Anarchiste Max Stirner from the pen of Professor Victor Bosch of the University of Rennes has appeared in Paris. Another large and sympathetic volume, Max Stirner, written by Dr. Anselm Ruest, has been published very recently in Berlin. Dr. Paul Elsbacher, in his work De Anarchismus, gives a chapter to Stirner making him one of the seven typical anarchists, beginning with William Godwin and ending with Tolstoy, of whom his book treats. There is hardly a notable magazine or a review on the continent that has not given at least one leading article to the subject of Stirner. Upon the initiative of McKay, and with the aid of other admirers, a suitable stone has been placed above the philosopher's previously neglected grave, and a memorial tablet upon the house in Berlin where he died in 1856. And this spring, another is to be placed upon the house in Bayreuth where he was born in 1806. 
As a result of these various efforts, and though but little has been written about Stirner in the English language, his name is now known to at least thousands in America and England, where formerly it was known only to hundreds. Therefore conditions are now more favorable for the reception of this volume than they were when I formed the design of publishing it more than twenty years ago. The problem of securing a reasonably good translation, for in the case of a work presenting difficulties so enormous it was idle to hope for an adequate translation, was finally solved by entrusting the task to Stephen T. Byington, a scholar of remarkable attainments, whose specialty is philology, and who is also one of the ablest workers in the propaganda of anarchism. But, for further security from error, it was agreed with Mr. Byington that his translation should have the benefit of revision by Dr. Walker, the most thorough American student of Stirner, and by Emma Heller Schum and George Schum, who are not only sympathetic with Stirner, but familiar with the history of his time, and who enjoy a knowledge of English and German that makes it difficult to decide which is their native tongue. It was also agreed that, upon any point of difference between the translator and his revisers which consultation might fail to solve, the publisher should decide. This method has been followed, and in a considerable number of instances it has fallen to me to make a decision. It is not only fair to say, therefore, that the responsibility for special errors and imperfections properly rests on my shoulders, whereas, on the other hand, the credit for whatever general excellence the translation may possess belongs with the same propriety to Mr. Byington and his coadjutors. One thing is certain. Its defects are due to no lack of loving care and pains. And I think I may add with confidence, while realizing fully how sh far short of perfection it necessarily falls, that it may safely challenge comparison with the translations that have been made into other languages. In particular, I am responsible for the admittedly erroneous rendering of the title. The Ego and His Own is not an exact English equivalent of Der Einzige und sein Eigentum. But then, there is no exact English equivalent. Perhaps the nearest is The Unique One and His Property. But The Unique One is not strictly Der de Einzige, for uniqueness connotes not only singleness, but an admirable singleness, while Stirnitz Einzigkeit is admirable in his eyes only as such, it being no part of the purpose of his book to distinguish a particular Einzigkeit as more excellent than another. Moreover, the unique one in his property has no graces to compel our forgiveness of its slight inaccuracy. It is clumsy and unattractive, and the same objections may be urged with still greater force against all the other renderings that have been suggested. The single one and his property, the only one and his property, the lone one and his property, the unit and his property, and last and least and worst, the individual and his prerogative. The ego and his own, on the other hand, if not a precise rendering, is at least an excellent title in itself, excellent by its euphony, its monosyllabic incisiveness, and its telling Einzigkeit. Another strong argument in its favor is the emphatic correspondence of the phrase his own with Mr. Byington's renderings of the kindred words Eigenheit und Eigne. Moreover, no reader will be led astray who bears in mind Sterna's distinction I am not an ego along with all other egos, but the sole ego. I am unique. And to help the reader bear this in mind, the various renderings of the word Einzige that occur through the volume are often accompanied by footnotes showing that, in the German, one and the same word does duty for all. If the reader finds the first quarter of this book somewhat forbidding and obscure, he is advised nevertheless not to falter. Close attention will master almost every difficulty, and if he will but give it, he will find abundant reward in what follows. 
For his guidance, I may specify one defect in the author's style. While controverting a view opposite to his own, he seldom distinguishes with sufficient clearness his statement of his own view from his restatement of the antagonist view. As a result, the reader is plunged into deeper and deeper mystification until something suddenly reveals the cause of his misunderstanding, after which he must go back and read again. I therefore put him on his guard. The other difficulties lie, as a rule, in the structure of the work. As to these, I can hardly do better than translate the following passage from Professor Bosch's book, alluded to above. There is nothing more disconcerting than the first approach to this strange work. Stirner does not condescend to inform us as to the architecture of his edifice or furnish us the slightest guiding thread. The apparent divisions of this book are few and misleading. From the first page to the last, a unique thought circulates but it divides itself among an infinity of vessels and arteries in which each runs a blood so rich in ferments that one is tempted to describe them all. There is no progress in the development, and the repetitions are innumerable. The reader who is not deterred by this oddity, or rather absence of composition, gives proof of genuine intellectual courage. At first, one seems to be confronted with a collection of essays strung together with a throng of aphorisms. But, if you read this book several times, if, after having penetrated the intimacy of each of its parts, you then traverse it as a whole, gradually the fragments weld themselves together, and Stirner's thought is revealed in all its unity, in all its force, and in all its depth. A word about the dedication. McKay's investigations have brought to light that Maria Danhot had nothing whatever in common with Stirner, and was unworthy of the honor conferred upon her. She was no Eigene. I therefore reproduce the dedication merely in the interest of historical accuracy. Happy as I am in the appearance of this book, my joy is not unmixed with sorrow. The cherished project was as dear to the heart of Dr. Walker as to mine and I deeply grieve that he is no longer with us to share our delight in the fruition. Nothing, however, can rob us of the masterly introduction that he wrote for this volume, in 1903, or perhaps earlier, from which I will not longer keep the reader. This introduction, no more than the book itself, shall that Einzige, death, make his eigentum. February 1907 Benjamin R. Tucker, Publisher Introduction Fifty years sooner or later can make little difference in the case of a book so revolutionary as this. It saw the light when a so-called revolutionary movement was preparing in men's minds which agitation was, however, only a disturbance due to desires to participate in government and to govern and to be governed, in a manner different to that which prevails. The revolutionists of 1848 were bewitched with an idea. They were not at all the masters of ideas. Most of those who since that time have prided themselves upon being revolutionists have been, and are, likewise but the bondmen of an idea, that of the different lodgment of authority. The temptation is, of course, present to attempt an explanation of the central thought of this work, but such an effort appears to be unnecessary to one who has the volume in his hand. The author's care in illustrating his meaning shows that he realized how prone the possessed man is to misunderstand whatever is not molded according to the fashions in thinking. The author's learning was considerable. His command of words and ideas may never be excelled by another and he judged it needful to develop his argument in manifold ways. So those who enter into the spirit of it will scarcely hope to impress others with the same conclusion in a more summary manner, or, if one might deem that possible after reading Stirner, still one cannot think that it could be done so surely. The author has made certain work of it, even though he has to wait for his public, but still, 
The reception of the book by its critics amply proves the truth of the saying that one can give another arguments, but not understanding. The system makers and the system believers thus far cannot get it out of their heads that any discourse about the nature of an ego must turn upon the common characteristics of egos to make a systematic scheme of what they share as a generality. The critics inquire what kind of man the author is talking about. They repeat the question, what does he believe in? They fail to grasp the purport of the recorded answer, I believe in myself, which is attributed to a common soldier long before the time of Stirne. They ask, what is the principle of the self-conscious egoist, the Einzige? To this perplexity, Stirner says, Change the question, put who instead of what, and an answer can then be given by naming him. This, of course, is too simple for persons governed by ideas, and for persons in quest of new governing ideas. They wish to classify the man. Now, that in me which you can classify is not my distinguishing self. Man is the horizon or zero of my existence as an individual. Over that I rise as I can. At least I am something more than man in general. Pre-existing worship of ideas and disrespect for self has made of this ego at the very most a somebody, often or an empty vessel to be filled with the grace or the leavings of a tyrannous doctrine, thus a nobody. Stirner dispels the morbid subjugation and recognizes each one who knows and feels himself as his own property to be neither humble nobody nor befogged somebody, but henceforth flat-footed and level-headed Mr. This Body, who has a character and good pleasure of his own, just as he has a name of his own. The critics who attacked this work and were answered in the author's minor writings rescued from oblivion by John Henry Mackay, nearly all display the most astonishing triviality and impotent malice. We owe to Dr. Edward von Hartmann the unquestionable service which he rendered by directing attention to this book in his Philosophie des Unbewussten, the first edition of which was published in 1869, and in other writings. I do not begrudge Dr. von Hartmann the liberty of criticism which he used, and I think the admirers of Stirner's teaching must quite appreciate one thing which Dr. Hartmann did at a much later date. In Der Eigene of August 10, 1896, there appeared a letter written by him and giving, among other things, certain data from which to judge that, when Nietzsche wrote his later essays, Nietzsche was not ignorant of Stirner's book. Von Hartmann wishes that Stirner had gone on and developed his principle. Von Hartmann suggests that you and I are really the same spirit, looking out through two pairs of eyes. Then, one may reply, I need not concern myself about you, for in myself I have us. And at that rate, Von Hartmann is merely accusing himself of inconsistency. For, when Stirner wrote this book, von Hartmann's spirit was writing it, and it is just the pity that von Hartmann in his present form does not endorse what he said in the form of Stirner, that Stirner was different from any other man, that his ego was not Fichte's transcendental generality, but this transitory ego of flesh and blood. It is not as a generality that you and I differ, but as a couple of facts which are not to be reasoned into one. I is somewise Hartman, and thus Hartman is I, but I am not Hartman, and Hartman is not I. Neither am I the I of Stirner, only Stirner himself was Stirner's I. Note how comparatively indifferent it is with Stirner that one is an ego, but how all-important it is that one be a self-conscious ego a self-conscious, self-willed person. Those not self-conscious and self-willed 
are constantly acting from self-interested motives, but clothing these in various garbs. Watch those people closely in the light of Stierner's teachings, and they seem to be hypocrites. They have so many good moral and religious paths of which self-interest is at the end and bottom. But they, we may believe, do not know that this is more than a coincidence. In Stirner we have the philosophical foundation for political liberty. His interest in the practical development of egoism to the dissolution of the state and the union of free men is clear and pronounced and harmonizes perfectly with the economic philosophy of Josiah Warren. Allowing for difference of temperament and language, there is a substantial agreement between Stierna and Proudhon. Each would be free, and sees in every increase of the number of free people and their intelligence an auxiliary force against the oppressor. But, on the other hand, Will anyone for a moment seriously contend that Nietzsche and Proudhon march together in general aim and tendency? That they have anything in common except the daring to profane the shrine and sepulchre of superstition? Nietzsche has been much spoken of as a disciple of Stirner, and owing to favorable callings from Nietzsche's writings, it has occurred that one of his books has been supposed to contain more sense than it really does so long as one has read only the extracts. Nietzsche cites scores, or hundreds, of authors. Has he read everything, and not read Stirner? But Nietzsche is as unlike Stirner as a tightrope performance is unlike an algebraic equation. Stirner loved liberty for himself, and loved to see any and all men and women taking liberty, and he had no lust for power. Democracy was to him sham liberty, egoism the genuine liberty. Nietzsche, on the contrary, pours out his contempt upon democracy because it is not aristocratic. He is predatory to the point of demanding that those who must succumb to feline rapacity must be taught to submit with resignation. When he speaks of anarchistic dogs, scouring the streets of great civilized cities. It is true, the context shows that he means the communists. But his worship of Napoleon, his bathos of anxiety for the rise of an aristocracy that shall rule Europe for thousands of years, his idea of treating women in the oriental fashion, show that Nietzsche has struck out in a very old path, doing the apotheosis of tyranny. We individual egoistic anarchists, however, may say to the Nietzsche school, so as not to be misunderstood, we do not ask of the Napoleons to have pity, nor of the predatory barons to do justice. They will find it convenient for their own welfare to make terms with men who have learned of Stirner what a man can be who worships nothing, bears allegiance to nothing. To Nietzsche's rhodomontade of eagles in baronial form, born to prey on industrial lambs, we rather tauntingly oppose the ironical question, where are your claws? What if the eagles are found to be plain barnyard fowls, on which more silly fowls have fastened steel spurs to hack the victims, who, however, have the power to disarm the sham eagles between two sons. Stirner shows that men make their tyrants as they make their gods, and his purpose is to unmake tyrants. Nietzsche dearly loves a tyrant. In style, Stirner's work offers the greatest possible contrast to the puerile, padded phraseology of Nietzsche's Zarathustra and its false imagery. Whoever imagined such an unnatural conjuncture as an eagle toting a serpent in friendship, which performance is told of in bare words, but nothing comes of it? In Stirner we are treated to an enlivening and earnest discussion, addressed to serious minds, and every reader feels that the word is to him, for his instruction and benefit, so far as he has mental independence and courage to take it and use it.
The startling intrepidity of this book is infused with a wholehearted love for all mankind, as evidenced by the fact that the author shows not one iota of prejudice or any idea of division of men into ranks. He would lay aside government, but would establish any regulation deemed convenient, and for this only our convenience is consulted. Thus, there will be general liberty only when the disposition toward tyranny is met by intelligent opposition that will no longer submit to such a rule. Beyond this, the manly sympathy and philosophical bent of Stirner are such that rulership appears by contrast of vanity, an infatuation of perverted pride. We know not whether we more admire our author or more love him. Stirner's attitude toward women is not special. She is an individual if she can be, not handicapped by anything he says, feels, thinks, or plans. This was more fully exemplified in his life than even in his book, but there is not a line in the book to put or keep women in an inferior position to men. Neither is there anything of caste or aristocracy in the book. Likewise, there is nothing of obscurantism or affected mysticism about it. Everything in it is made as plain as the author could make it. He who does not so is not Stirner's disciple, nor successor, nor co-worker. Someone may ask, how does plumbline anarchism train with the unbridled egoism proclaimed by Stirner? The plumbline is not a fetish, but an intellectual conviction, and egoism is a universal fact of animal life. Nothing could seem clearer to my mind than that the reality of egoism must first come into the consciousness of men before we can have the unbiased Einzige in place of the prejudiced biped who lends himself to the support of tyrannies a million times stronger over me than the natural self-interest of any individual. When plumb line doctrine is misconceived as duty between unequal-minded men, as a religion of humanity, it is indeed the confusion of trying to read without knowing the alphabet and of putting philanthropy in place of contract. But if the plumb line be scientific, it is or can be my possession, my property, and I choose it for its use, when circumstances admit of its use. I do not feel bound to use it because it is scientific in building my house, but as my will to be intelligent, it is not to be merely willful. The adoption of the plumb line follows the discarding of incantations. There is no plumb line without the unvarying lead at the end of the line, not a fluttering bird or a clawing cat. On the practical side of egoism versus self-surrender and for a trial of egoism in politics, this may be said. The belief that men not moved by a sense of duty will be unkind or unjust to others is but an indirect confession that those who hold that belief are greatly interested in having others live for them rather than for themselves. But I do not ask or expect so much. I am content if others individually live for themselves and thus cease in so many ways to act in opposition to my living for myself, to our living for ourselves. If Christianity has failed to turn the world from evil, it is not to be dreamed that rationalism of a pious moral stamp will succeed in the same task. Christianity, or all philanthropic love, is tested in non-resistance. It is a dream that example will change the hearts of rulers, tyrants, mobs. If the extremist self-surrender fails, how can a mixture of Christian love and worldly caution succeed? This, at least, must be given up. The policy of Christ and Tolstoy can soon be tested, but Tolstoy's belief is not satisfied with the present test and failure. 
He has the infatuation of one who persists because this ought to be. The egoist who thinks, I should like this to be, still has the sense to perceive that it is not accomplished by the fact of some believing and submitting, inasmuch as others are alert to prey upon the unresisting. The pharaohs we have ever with us. Several passages in this most remarkable book show the author as a man full of sympathy. When we reflect upon his deliberately expressed opinions and sentiments, his spurning of the sense of moral obligation as the last form of superstition, may we not be warranted in thinking that the total disappearance of the sentimental supposition of duty liberates a quantity of nervous energy for the purest enjoyment and clarifies the intellect for the more discriminating choice of objects of merit? J. L. Walker Translator's Preface If the style of this book is found unattractive, it will show that I have done my work ill and not represented the author truly. But, if it is found odd, I beg that I may not bear all the blame. I have simply tried to reproduce the author's own mixture of colloquialisms and technicalities, and his preference for the precise expression of his thought, rather than the word conventionally expected. One especial feature of the style, however, gives the reason why this preface should exist. It is characteristic of Stirner's writing that the thread of thought is carried on largely by the repetition of the same word in a modified form or sense. That connection of ideas which has guided popular instinct in the formation of words is made to suggest the line of thought which the writer wishes to follow. If this echoing of words is missed, the bearing of the statements on each other is in a measure lost, and where the ideas are very new one cannot afford to throw away any help in following their connection. Therefore, where a useful echo, and there are a few useless ones in the book, could not be reproduced in English, I have generally called attention to it in a note. My notes are distinguished from the authors by being enclosed in parentheses. One or two such coincidences of language, occurring in words which are prominent throughout the book, should be borne constantly in mind as a sort of carry perpetuum. For instance, the identity in the original of the words spirit and mind, and of the phrases supreme being and highest essence. In such cases I have repeated the note where it seemed that such repetition may be absolutely necessary, but have trusted the reader to carry it in his head where a failure of his memory would not be ruinous or likely. For the same reason, that is, in order not to miss any indication of the drift of the thought, I have followed the original in the very liberal use of italics, and in the occasional eccentric use of a punctuation mark, as I might not have done in translating a work of a different nature. I have set my face as a flint against the temptation to add notes that were not part of the translation. There is no telling how much I might have enlarged the book if I had put a note at every sentence which deserved to have its truth brought out by fuller elucidation, or even at every one which I thought needed correction. It might have been within my province, if I had been able, to explain all the allusions to contemporary events, but I doubt whether anyone could do that properly without having access to the files of three or four well-chosen newspapers of Schirner's time. The illusions are clear enough, without names and dates, to give a vivid picture of certain aspects of German life then. The tone of some of them is explained by the fact that the book was published under censorship. I have usually preferred, for the sake of the connection, to translate biblical quotations somewhat as they stand in the German, 
rather than conform them altogether to the English Bible. I am sometimes quite as near the original Greek as if I had followed the current translation. Where German books are referred to, the pages cited are those of the German editions even when, usually because of some allusions in the text, the titles of the books are translated. Stephen T. Byington End of Front Material Next section, The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner Translated by Stephen T. Byington This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany the Ego and His Own by Max Stirner Introduction All things are nothing to me. What is not supposed to be my concern? First and foremost, the good cause. Then God's cause. The cause of mankind. Of truth. Of freedom of humanity, of justice. Further, the cause of my people, my prince, my fatherland. Finally, even the cause of mind and a thousand other causes. Only my cause is never to be my concern. Shame on the egoist who thinks only of himself. Let us look and see then how they manage their concerns, those for whose cause we are to labor, devote ourselves, and grow enthusiastic. You have much profound information to give about God, and have for thousands of years searched the depths of the Godhead, and looked into its heart, so that you can doubtless tell us how God himself attends to God's cause which we are called to serve. And you do not conceal the Lord's doings, either. Now, what is his cause? Has he, as is demanded of us, made an alien cause, the cause of truth or love, his own? You are shocked by this misunderstanding, and you instruct us that God's cause is indeed the cause of truth and love but that this cause cannot be called alien to him, because God is himself truth and love. You are shocked by the assumption that God could be like us poor worms in furthering an alien cause as his own. Should God take up the cause of truth if he were not himself truth? He cares only for his cause, but because he is all in all, Therefore all is his cause. But we, we are not all in all, and our cause is altogether little and contemptible. Therefore we must serve a higher cause. Now it is clear, God cares only for what is his, busies himself only with himself, thinks only of himself, and has only himself before his eyes. Woe to all that is not well-pleasing to him. He serves no higher person, and satisfies only himself. His cause is a purely egoistic cause. How is it with mankind whose cause we are to make our own? Is its cause that of another, and does mankind serve a higher cause? No. Mankind looks only at itself. Mankind will promote the interests of mankind only. Mankind is its own cause. 
that it may develop. It causes nations and individuals to wear themselves out in its service, and when they have accomplished what mankind needs, it throws them on the dung heap of history and gratitude. Is not mankind's cause a purely egoistic cause? I have no need to take up each thing that wants to show its cause on us and show that it is occupied only with itself, not with us, only with its good, not with ours. Look at the rest for yourselves. Do truth, freedom, humanity, justice, desire anything else than that you grow enthusiastic and serve them? They all have an admirable time of it when they receive zealous homage. Just observe the nation that is defended by devoted patriots. The patriots fall in bloody battle or in the fight with hunger and want. What does the nation care for that? By the manure of their corpses the nation comes to its bloom. The individuals have died for the great cause of the nation, and the nation sends some words of thanks after them and has the profit of it. I call that a paying kind of egoism. But only look at that sultan who cares so lovingly for his people. Is he not pure unselfishness itself? And does he not hourly sacrifice himself for his people? Oh yes, for his people. Just try it. Show yourself not as his, but as your own. For breaking away from his egoism, you will take a trip to jail. The sultan has set his cause on nothing but himself. He is to himself all in all. He is to himself the only one, and tolerates nobody who would dare not to be one of his people. And you will not learn by these brilliant examples that the egoist gets on best? I, for my part, take a lesson from them and propose, instead of further unselfishly serving those great egoists, rather, to be the egoist myself. God and mankind have concerned themselves for nothing, for nothing but themselves. Let me then likewise concern myself for myself, who am equally with God the nothing of all others, who am my all, who am the only one. If God, if mankind, as you affirm, have substance enough in themselves to be all in all to themselves, then I feel that I shall still less lack that, and that I shall have no complaint to make of my emptiness. I am not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but I am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself as creator create everything. Away, then, with every concern that is not altogether my concern. You think at least the good cause must be my concern? What's good? What's bad? Why, I myself am my concern, and I am neither good nor bad. Neither has any meaning for me. The divine is God's concern. The human is man's. My concern is neither the divine nor the human, not the true, good, just, free, etc., but solely what is mine, and it is not a general one, but is unique, as I am unique. Nothing is more to me than myself. End of introduction. Part First, Chapter One of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Part First Man Man is to man the supreme being, says Feuerbach. 
Man has just been discovered, says Bruno Bauer. Let us then take a more careful look at this supreme being and this new discovery. Chapter 1. A Human Life From the moment when he catches sight of the light of the world, a man seeks to find out himself and get a hold of himself out of its confusion, in which he, with everything else, is tossed about in motley mixture. But everything that comes into contact with the child defends itself in turn against his attacks and asserts its own persistence. Accordingly, because each thing cares for itself and at the same time comes into constant collision with other things, the combat of self-assertion is unavoidable. Victory or defeat? Between the two alternatives, the fate of the combat wavers. The victor becomes the lord, the vanquished one, the subject. The former exercises supremacy and the rights of supremacy. The latter fulfills in awe and deference the duties of a subject. But both remain enemies and always lie in wait. They watch for each other's weaknesses children for those of their parents, and parents for those of their children, their fear, for example. Either the stick conquers the man, or the man conquers the stick. In childhood, liberation takes the direction of trying to get to the bottom of things, to get at what is back of things. Therefore we spy out the weak points of everybody, for which it is well known. Children have a sure instinct. Therefore we like to smash things, like to rummage through hidden corners, pry after what is covered up or out of the way, and try what we can do with everything. When we once get at what is back of things, we know we are safe. When we have got at the fact that the rod is too weak against our obduracy, we no longer fear it, have outgrown it. Back of the rod, mightier than it, stands our obduracy, our obdurate courage. By degrees we get at what is back of everything that was mysterious and uncanny to us. The mysteriously dreaded might of the rod, the father's stern look, etc. And back of all we find our ataraxia, our imperturbability, intrepidity, our counter-forces our odds of strength, our invincibility. Before that which formerly inspired in us fear and deference, we no longer retreat shyly, but take courage. Back of everything we find our courage, our superiority. Back of the sharp command of parents and authorities stands, after all, our courageous choice or our outwitting shrewdness. And the more we feel ourselves, the smaller appears that which before seemed invincible. And what is our trickery, shrewdness, courage, obduracy? What else but mind? Through a considerable time we are spared a fight that is so exhausting later. The fight against reason. The fairest part of childhood passes without the necessity of coming to blows with reason. We care nothing at all about it, do not meddle with it, admit no reason. We are not to be persuaded to anything by conviction, and are deaf to good arguments and principles. On the other hand, coaxing, punishment, and the like are hard for us to resist. This stern life-and-death combat with reason enters later, and begins a new phase. In childhood we scamper about without racking our brains much. Mind is the name of the first self-discovery, the first undeification of the divine, that is, of the uncanny, the spooks, the powers above. Our fresh feeling of youth, this feeling of self, now defers to nothing. The world is discredited, for we are above it, we are 
mind. Now, for the first time, we see that hitherto we have not looked at the world intelligently at all, but only stared at it. We exercise the beginnings of our strength on natural powers. We defer to parents as a natural power. Later, we say, Father and mother are to be forsaken, all natural power to be counted as riven. They are vanquished. For the rational, the intellectual man. There is no family as a natural power. A renunciation of parents, brothers, etc. makes its appearance. If these are born again as intellectual, rational powers, they are no longer at all what they were before. And not only parents, but men in general, are conquered by the young man. They are no hindrance to him, and are no longer regarded. For now, he says, one must obey God rather than men. From this high standpoint, everything earthly recedes into contemptible remoteness, for the standpoint is the heavenly. The attitude is now altogether reversed. The youth takes up an intellectual position, while the boy, who did not yet feel himself as mind, grew up on mindless learning. The former does not try to get hold of things, for instance, to get into his head the data of history, but of the thoughts that lie hidden in things, and so, therefore, of the spirit of history. On the other hand, the boy understands connections, no doubt, but not ideas, the spirit. Therefore he strings together whatever can be learned, without proceeding a priori and theoretically, without looking for ideas. As in childhood, one had to overcome the resistance of the laws of the world. So now in everything that he proposes he is met by an objection of the mind, of reason, of his own conscience. That is unreasonable, unchristian, unpatriotic, and the like, cries conscience to us, and frightens us away from it. Not the might of the avenging Eumenides, not Poseidon's wrath, not God, far as he sees the hidden. Not the Father's rod of punishment do we fear, but conscience. We run after our thoughts now, and follow their commands just as before we followed parental, human ones. Our course of action is determined by our thoughts, ideas, conceptions, faith, as it is in childhood by the commands of our parents. For all that, we were already thinking when we were children, only our thoughts were not fleshless, abstract, absolute, that is, nothing but thoughts, a heaven in themselves, a pure world of thought, logical thoughts. On the contrary, they had been only thoughts that we had about a thing. We thought of the thing so or so. Thus we may have thought, God made the world that we see there, but we did not think of, search, the depths of the Godhead itself. We may have thought, that is the truth about the matter, but we did not think of truth itself, nor unite into one sentence, God is truth. The depths of the Godhead, who is truth, we did not touch. Over such purely logical, theological questions, what is truth, Pilate does not stop, though he does not therefore hesitate to ascertain in an individual case what truth there is in the thing, whether the thing is true. Any thought bound to a thing is not yet nothing but a thought, absolute thought. To bring to light the pure thought, or to be of its party, is the delight of youth, and all the shapes of light in the world of thought, like truth, freedom, humanity, man, illumine and inspire the youthful soul. 
but when the spirit is recognized as the essential thing, it still makes a difference whether the spirit is poor or rich, and therefore one seeks to become rich in spirit. The spirit wants to spread out so as to found its empire, an empire that is not of this world, the world just conquered. Thus then, it longs to become all in all to itself. For, although I am spirit, I am not yet perfected spirit, and must first seek the complete spirit. But with that I, who had just now found myself as spirit, lose myself again at once, bowing before the complete spirit as one not my own but supernal, and feeling my emptiness. Spirit is the essential point for everything, to be sure. But then is every spirit the right spirit? The right and true spirit is the ideal of spirit, the holy spirit. It is not my or your spirit, but just an ideal, supernal one. It is God. God is spirit. And this supernal Father in heaven gives it to those that pray to him. The man is distinguished from the youth by the fact that he takes the world as it is, instead of everywhere fancying it amiss and wanting to improve it, model it after his ideal. In him, the view that one must deal with the world according to his interest, not according to his ideals, becomes confirmed. So long as one knows himself only as spirit, and feels that all the value of his existence consists in being spirit, it becomes easy for the youth to give his life, the bodily life, for nothing, for the silliest point of honor. So long it is only thoughts that one has, ideas that he hopes to be able to realize some day when he has found a sphere of action. Thus one has meanwhile only ideals, unexecuted ideas, or thoughts. Not till one has fallen in love with his corporeal self, and takes a pleasure in himself as a living flesh and blood person, but it is in mature years in the man that we find it so. Not till then has one a personal or egoistic interest, an interest not only of our spirit, for instance, but of total satisfaction, satisfaction of the whole chap, a selfish interest. Just compare a man with a youth, and see if he will not appear to you harder, less magnanimous, more selfish. Is he therefore worse? No, you say. He has only become more definite, or as you also call it, more practical. But the main point is this, that he makes himself more the center than does the youth, who is infatuated about other things, for example, God, fatherland, and so on. Therefore the man shows a second self-discovery. The youth found himself as spirit, and lost himself again in the general spirit, the complete, holy spirit. Man, mankind. In short, all ideals. The man finds himself as embodied spirit. Boys had only unintellectual interests, those interests devoid of thoughts and ideas, youths only intellectual ones. The man has bodily, personal, egoistic interests. If the child has not an object that it can occupy itself with, it feels ennui, for it does not yet know how to occupy itself with itself. The youth, on the contrary, throws the object aside, because for him thoughts arose out of the object. He occupies himself with his thoughts, his dreams, occupies himself intellectually, or his mind is occupied. The young man includes everything not intellectual under the contemptuous name of externalities. 
if he nevertheless sticks to the most trivial externalities, such as the customs of students' clubs and other formalities. It is because, and when, he discovers mind in them, when they are symbols to him. As I find myself back of things, and that as mind, so I must later find myself also back of thoughts, to wit, as their creator and owner. In the time of spirits thoughts grew till they overtopped my head, whose offspring they yet were. They hovered about me and convulsed me like fever fantasies, an awful power. The thoughts had become corporeal on their own account, were ghosts such as God, Emperor, Pope, Fatherland, etc. If I destroy their corporeity, then I take them back into mine and say, I alone am corporeal. And now I take the world as what it is to me, as mine, as my property. I refer all to myself. If, as spirit, I had thrust away the world in the deepest contempt, so, as owner, I thrust spirits or ideas away into their vanity. They have no longer any power over me, as no earthly might has power over the spirit. The child was realistic, taken up with the things of this world, till little by little he succeeded in getting at what was back of those very things. The youth was idealistic, inspired by thoughts, till he worked his way up to where he became the man, the egoistic man, who deals with things and thoughts according to his heart's pleasure, and sets his personal interest above everything. Finally, the old man? When I become one, there will still be time enough to speak of that. End of chapter. Part First, Chapter Two, Section A of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Chapter Two, and of the Old Times and the New. How each of us developed himself, what he strove for, attained, or missed, what objects he formerly pursued, and what plans and wishes his heart is now set on, what transformations his views have experienced, what perturbations his principles, in short, how he has today become what yesterday or years ago he was not. This he brings out again from his memory with more or less ease, and he feels with a special vividness what changes have taken place in himself when he has before his eyes the unrolling of another's life. Let us therefore look into the activities our forefathers busied themselves with. Section A. The Ancients. Custom having once given the name of the Ancients to our pre-Christian ancestors. We will not throw it up against them that, in comparison with us experienced people, they ought properly to be called children, but will continue rather to honor them as our good old fathers. But how have they come to be antiquated, and who could displace them through his pretended newness? We know, of course, the revolutionary innovator and disrespectful heir, who even took away the sanctity of the father's Sabbath to hallow his Sunday, and interrupted the course of time to begin it himself with a new chronology. We know him, and know that it is the Christian. But does he remain forever young? And is he today still the new man? Or will he too be superseded, as he has superseded the ancients. The fathers must doubtless have themselves begotten the young one who entombed them, 
Let us then peep at this act of generation. To the ancients, the world was the truth, says Feuerbach, but he forgets to make the important addition, a truth whose untruth they tried to get back of, and at last really did. What is meant by those words of Feuerbach will be easily recognized if they are put alongside the Christian thesis of the vanity and transitoriness of the world. For, as the Christian can never convince himself of the vanity of the divine world, but believes in its eternal and unshakable truth, which, the more its depths are searched, must all the more brilliantly come to light and triumph. So the ancients on their side lived in the feeling that the world and mundane relations, such as the nature of ties of blood, were the truth before which their powerless eye must bow. The very thing on which the ancients set the highest value is spurned by Christians as the valueless, and what they recognized as truth, these brand as idle lies, the high significance of the fatherland disappears, and the Christian must regard himself as a stranger on earth. The sanctity of funeral rites, which sprang a work of art like the Antigone of Sophocles, is designated as a paltry thing. Let the dead bury their dead. The infrangible truth of family ties is represented as an untruth, which one cannot promptly enough get clear of, and so in everything. If we now see that to the two sides opposite things appear as truth, to the one the natural, to the other the intellectual, to one earthly things and relations, to the other heavenly, the heavenly fatherland, Jerusalem that is above, etc., it still remains to be considered how the new time and that undeniable reversal could come out of antiquity. But the ancients themselves worked toward making their truth a lie. Let us plunge at once into the midst of the most brilliant years of the ancients, into the Periclean century. Then the sophistic culture was spreading, and Greece made a pastime what had hitherto been to her a monstrously serious matter. The fathers had been enslaved by the undisturbed power of existing things, too long for the posterity not to have to learn, by bitter experience, to feel themselves. Therefore the sophists, with courageous sauciness, pronounced the reassuring words, Don't be bluffed and diffuse the rationalistic doctrine. Use your understanding, your wit, your mind against everything. It is by having a good and well-drilled understanding that one gets through the world best, provides for himself the best lot, the pleasantest life. Thus they recognize in mind man's true weapon against the world. This is why they lay such stress on dialectic skill command of language, the art of disputation, etc. They announce that mind is to be used against everything, but they are still far removed from the holiness of the spirit, for to them it is a means, a weapon, as trickery and defiance serve children for the same purpose. Their mind is the unbribable understanding. Today we should call that a one-sided culture of the understanding, and add the warning. Cultivate not only your understanding, but also, and especially, your heart. Socrates did the same. For, if the heart did not become free from its natural impulses, but remained filled with the most fortuitous contents and, as an uncriticized avidity, Altogether in the power of things, nothing but a vessel of the most various appetites, then it was unavoidable that the free understanding must serve the bad heart, and was ready to justify everything that the wicked heart desired. 
Therefore Socrates says that it is not enough for one to use his understanding in all things, but it is a question of what cause one exerts it for. We should now say, one must serve the good cause. But serving the good cause is being moral. Hence Socrates is the founder of ethics. Certainly the principle of the sophistic doctrine must lead to the possibility that this blindest and most dependent slave of his desires might yet be an excellent sophist, and, with keen understanding, trim and expound everything in favor of his coarse heart. What could there be for which a good reason might not be found, or which might not be defended through thick and thin? Therefore Socrates says, you must be pure-hearted if your shrewdness is to be valued. At this point begins the second period of Greek liberation of the mind, the period of purity of heart. For the first was brought to a close by the sophists and their proclaiming the omnipotence of the understanding. But the heart remained worldly-minded, remained a servant of the world, always affected by worldly wishes. This coarse heart was to be cultivated from now on, the era of culture of the heart. But how is the heart to be cultivated? What the understanding, this one side of the mind, has reached, to wit, the capability of playing freely with and over every concern, awaits the heart also. Everything worldly must come to grief before it, so that at last family, commonwealth, fatherland, and the like are given up for the sake of the heart, that is, of blessedness, the heart's blessedness. Daily experience confirms the truth that the understanding must have renounced a thing many years before the heart has ceased to beat for it. So the sophistic understanding, too, had so far become master over the dominant ancient powers that they now needed only to be driven out of the heart, in which they dwelt unmolested, to have at last no part at all left in the man. This war is opened by Socrates. And not till the dying day of the old world does it end in peace. The examination of the heart takes its start with Socrates, and all the contents of the heart are sifted. In their last and extremest struggles, the ancients threw all the contents out of the heart and let it no longer beat for anything. This was the deed of the skeptics. The same purgation of the heart was now achieved in the skeptical age, as the understanding had succeeded in establishing the sophistic age. The sophistic culture has brought it to pass that one's understanding no longer stands still before anything, and the skeptical, that his heart is no longer moved by anything. So long as man is entangled in the movements of the world and embarrassed by relations to the world, and he is so till the end of antiquity, because his heart still has to struggle for independence from the worldly. So long he is not yet spirit, for spirit is without body and has no relations to the world and corporality. For it the world does not exist, nor natural bonds, but only the spiritual and spiritual bonds. Therefore man must first become so completely unconcerned and reckless, so altogether without relations, that the skeptical culture presents him, so altogether indifferent to the world that even its falling in ruins would not move him, before he could feel himself as worldless, that is, as spirit. And this is the result of the gigantic work of the ancients, that man knows himself as a being without relations and without a world, as spirit. Only now, after all worldly care has left him, is he all in all to himself, 
Is he only for himself? Is he spirit for the spirit? Or in plainer language, he cares only for the spiritual. In the Christian wisdom of serpents and innocence of doves, the two sides, understanding and heart, of the ancient liberation of mind are so completed that they appear young and new again, and neither the one nor the other lets itself be bluffed any longer by the worldly and natural. Thus the ancients mounted to spirit and strove to become spiritual. But a man who wishes to be active as spirit is drawn to quite other tasks than he was able to set himself formerly to tasks which really give something to do to the spirit, and not to mere sense or acuteness, which exerts itself only to become master of things. The spirit busies itself solely about the spiritual, and seeks out the traces of mind in everything. To the believing spirit, everything comes from God, and interests him only to the extent that it reveals this origin. To the philosophic spirit, everything appears with the stamp of reason, and it interests him only so far as he is able to discover in it reason, that is, spiritual content. Not the spirit, then, which has to do with absolutely nothing unspiritual, with no thing, but only with the essence which exists behind and above things with thoughts. Not that did the ancients exert, for they did not yet have it. No, they had only reached the point of struggling and longing for it, and therefore sharpened it against their too powerful foe, the world of sense. But what would not have been sensuous for them, since Jehovah, or the gods of the heathens, were yet far removed from the conception, God is spirit since the heavenly fatherland had not yet stepped into the place of the sensuous, etc. They sharpened against the world of sense their sense, their acuteness. To this day the Jews, those precocious children of antiquity, have got no farther, and with all the subtlety and strength of their prudence and understanding, which easily becomes master of things, and forces them to obey it. They cannot discover spirit, which takes no account whatever of things. The Christian has spiritual interests, because he allows himself to be a spiritual man. The Jew does not even understand these interests in their purity, because he does not allow himself to assign no value to things. He does not arrive at pure spirituality, a spirituality such as is religiously expressed, for instance, in the faith of Christians, which alone, without works, justifies. Their unspirituality sets Jews forever apart from Christians, and the spiritual man is incomprehensible to the unspiritual, as the unspiritual is contemptible to the spiritual. But the Jews have only the spirit of this world. The ancient acuteness and profundity lies as far from the spirit and the spirituality of the Christian world as earth from heaven. He who feels himself as free spirit is not oppressed and made anxious by the things of this world, because he does not care for them. If one is still to feel their burden, he must be narrow enough to attach weight to them, as is evidently the case, for instance, when one is still concerned for his dear life. He to whom everything centers in knowing and conducting himself as a free spirit gives little heed to how scantily he is supplied meanwhile, and does not reflect at all on how he must make his arrangements to have a thoroughly free or enjoyable life. He is not disturbed by the inconveniences of the life that depends on things, because he lives only spiritually and on spiritual food, 
while aside from this he only gulps things down like a beast, hardly knowing it, and dies bodily to be sure, when his fodder gives out, but knows himself immortal as spirit, and closes his eyes with an adoration or a thought. His life is occupation with the spiritual, is thinking. The rest does not bother him. Let him busy himself with the spiritual in any way that he can, and chooses, in devotion, in contemplation, or in philosophic cognition. His doing is always thinking. And therefore Descartes, to whom this had at last become quite clear, could lay down the proposition, I think, that is, I am. This means, my thinking is my being or my life. Only when I live spiritually do I live. Only as spirit am I really. Or, I am spirit through and through, and nothing but spirit. Unlucky Peter Schlimmer, who has lost his shadow, is the portrait of this man become a spirit, for the spirit's body is shadowless. Over against this, how different among the ancients! Stoutly and manfully as they might bear themselves against the might of things, they must yet acknowledge the might itself, and got no farther than to protect their life against it as well as possible. Only at a late hour, did they recognize that their true life was not that which they led in the fight against the things of the world, but the spiritual life, turned away from these things. And when they saw this, they became Christians, the moderns, and innovators upon the ancients. But the life turned away from things, the spiritual life, no longer draws any nourishment from nature, but lives only on thoughts, and therefore is no longer life, but thinking. Yet it is not to be supposed now that the ancients were without thoughts, just as the most spiritual man is not to be conceived of as if he could be without life. Rather, they had their thoughts about everything, about the world, man, the gods, etc., and showed themselves keenly active in bringing all this to their consciousness. But they did not know thought, even though they thought of all sorts of things, and worried themselves with their thoughts. Compare with their position the Christian saying, My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And remember what was said above about our child thoughts. What is antiquity seeking, then? The true enjoyment of life. You will find that at bottom it is all the same as the true life. The Greek poet Simonides sings, Health is the noblest good for mortal man. The next to this is beauty. The third riches acquired without guile. The fourth, the enjoyment of social pleasures in the company of young friends. These are all good things of life, pleasures of life. What else was Diogenes of Sinope seeking for than the true enjoyment of life, which he discovered in having the least possible wants? What else Aristippus, who found it in a cheery temper under all circumstances? They are all seeking for cheery, unclouded life courage, for cheeriness. They are seeking to be of good cheer. The Stoics want to realize the wise man, the man with practical philosophy, the man who knows how to live, a wise life. Therefore, they find him in contempt for the world, in a life without development, without spreading out, without friendly relations with the world thus in the isolated life, in life as life, not in life with others. Only the Stoic lives, all else is dead for him. 
The Epicureans, on the contrary, demand a moving light, for which it is yet necessary that what can be and what is repelled should remain existing, otherwise there would be no longer anything to repel. He reaches at most an extreme degree of liberation, and is distinguished only in degree from the less liberated. If he even got as far as the deadening of the earthly sense, which at last admits only the monotonous whisper of the word Brahm, he nevertheless would not be essentially distinguishable from the sensual man. Even the stoic attitude in manly virtue amounts only to this, that one must maintain and assert oneself against the world. And the ethics of the stoics their only science, since they could tell nothing about the spirit but how it should behave toward the world, and of nature, physics, only this, that the wise man must assert himself against it, is not a doctrine of the spirit, but only a doctrine of the repelling of the world and of self-assertion against the world. And this consists in imperturbability and equanimity of life, and so in the most explicit Roman virtue. The Romans, too, Horace, Cicero, and others, went no further than this practical philosophy. The comfort, Herone, of the Epicureans is the same practical philosophy the Stoics teach, only trickier, more deceitful. They teach only another behavior toward the world, exhort us only to take a shrewd attitude toward the world. The world must be deceived, for it is my enemy. The break with the world is completely carried through by the skeptics. My entire relation to the world is worthless and truthless. Timon says, The feelings and thoughts which we draw from the world contain no truth. What is truth? cries Pilate. According to Pyrrho's doctrine, the world is neither good nor bad, neither beautiful nor ugly, but these are predicates which I give it. Timon says that, In itself, nothing is either good or bad, but man only thinks of it thus or thus. To face the world only ataraxia, unmovedness, and aphasia, speechlessness, or, in other words, isolated inwardness, are left. There is no longer any truth to be recognized in the world. Things contradict themselves. Thoughts about things are without distinction. Good and bad are all the same. So the what one calls good and other finds bad. Here the recognition of truth is at an end. And only the man without power of recognition, the man who finds in the world nothing to recognize, is left. And this man just leaves the truth vacant world where it is and takes no account of it. So antiquity gets through with the world of things, the order of the world, the world as a whole. But to the order of the world, or the things of this world, belong not only nature, but all relations in which man sees himself placed by nature, as in the family, the community. In short, the so-called natural bonds. With the world of the spirit, Christianity then begins. The man who still faces the world armed is the ancient, the heathen, to which class the Jew, too, as non-Christian, belongs. The man who has come to be led by nothing but his heart's pleasure, the interest he takes, his fellow feeling, his spirit, is the modern, the Christian. As the ancients work toward the conquest of the world, and strove to release man from the heavy trammels of connection with other things. At last they came also to the dissolution of the state, and giving preference to everything private. Of course, community, family, and so forth, as natural relations, are burdensome hindrances which diminish my spiritual freedom. End of chapter 2, section A. Part 1st, chapter 2, 
Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Section B. The Moderns. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is passed away. Behold, all is become new. As it was said above, to the ancients the world was a truth. We must say here, to the moderns the spirit was a truth. But here, as there, we must not omit the supplement, a truth whose untruth they tried to get back of and at last they really do. A course similar to that which antiquity took may be demonstrated in Christianity also, in that the understanding was held a prisoner under the dominion of the Christian dogmas up to the time preparatory to the Reformation, but in the pre-Reformation century asserted itself sophistically and played heretical pranks with all tenets of the faith. And the talk then was, especially in Italy and at the Roman court. If only the heart remains Christian-minded, the understanding may go right on, taking its pleasure. Long before the Reformation, people were so thoroughly accustomed to find spun wranglings that the Pope, and most others, looked on Luther's appearance, too, as a mere wrangling of monks at first. Humanism corresponds to sophisticism, and as in the time of the Sophists, Greek life stood in its fullest bloom, the Periclean Age. So the most brilliant things happened in the time of humanism, or, as one might perhaps also say, of Machiavellianism, printing, the New World, etc. All this time the heart was still far from wanting to relieve itself of its Christian contents. But, finally, the Reformation, like Socrates, took hold seriously of the heart itself, and since then hearts have kept growing visibly more unchristian. As with Luther, people began to take the matter to heart. The outcome of this step of the Reformation must be that the heart also gets lightened of the heavy burden of Christian faith. The heart, from day to day more unchristian, loses the contents with which it had busied itself, till at last nothing but empty warm-heartedness is left it. The quite general love of men, the love of man, the love of freedom, self-consciousness. Only so is Christianity complete, because it has become bald, withered, and void of contents. There are now no contents whatsoever against which the heart does not mutiny, unless, indeed, the heart unconsciously or without self-consciousness lets them slip in. The heart criticizes to death with hard-hearted mercilessness everything that wants to make its way in, and is capable, except, as before, unconsciously or taken by surprise, of no friendship no love. What could there be in men to love, since they are all alike egoists? None of them man as such. None are spirit only. The Christian loves only the spirit. But where could one be found who should really be nothing but spirit? To have a liking for the corporeal man with hide and hair, why, that would no longer be a spiritual warm-heartedness. It would be treason against pure warm-heartedness, the theoretical regard. For pure warm-heartedness is by no means to be conceived as that kindliness that gives everybody a friendly handshake. On the contrary, pure warm-heartedness is warm-hearted toward nobody. It is only a theoretical interest concern for man as man, not as a person. The person is repulsive to it, 
because of being egoistic, because of not being that abstraction, man. But it is only for the abstraction that one can have a theoretical regard. To pure warm-heartedness or pure theory, men exist only to be criticized, scoffed at, and thoroughly despised. To it, no less than to the fanatical parson, they are only filth and other such nice things. Pushed to this extremity of disinterested warm-heartedness, we must finally become conscious that the spirit, which alone the Christian loves, is nothing. In other words, that the spirit is a lie. What has here been set down roughly, summarily, and doubtless as yet incomprehensibly, will, it is to be hoped, become clear as we go on. Let us take up the inheritance left by the ancients, and as active workmen, do with it as much as can be done with it. The world lies despised at our feet, far beneath us in our heaven, into which its mighty arms are no longer thrust and its stupefying breath does not come. Seductively as it may pose, it can delude nothing but our senses. It cannot lead astray the spirit, and spirit, alone after all, we really are. Having once got back of things, the spirit has also got above them, and become free from their bonds, emancipated, supernal, free. So speaks spiritual freedom. To the spirit which, after long toil, has got rid of the world, the worldless spirit. Nothing is left after the loss of the world and the worldly but the spirit and the spiritual. Yet, as it has only moved away from the world and made of itself a being free from the world, without really being able to annihilate the world. This remains to it a stumbling block that cannot be cleared away, a discredited existence. And, as, on the other hand, it knows and recognizes nothing but the spirit and the spiritual. It must perpetually carry about with it the longing to spiritualize the world, to redeem it from the blacklist. Therefore, like a youth, it goes about with plans for the redemption or improvement of the world. The ancients, we saw, served the worldly, the natural, the natural order of the world, but they incessantly asked themselves of this service, and, when they had tired themselves to death in ever-renewed attempts at revolt, then, among their last sighs, was born to them the God, the conqueror of the world. All their doing had been nothing but wisdom of the world, an effort to get back of the world and above it. And what is the wisdom of the many following centuries? What did the moderns try to get back of? No longer to get back of the world, for the ancients had accomplished that. But back of the God whom the ancients bequeathed to them, back of the God who is spirit, back of everything that is the spirits, the spiritual. But the activity of the spirit, which searches even the depths of the Godhead, is theology. If the ancients have nothing to show but wisdom of the world, the moderns never did, nor do, make their way further than to theology. We shall later see that even the newest revolts against God are nothing but the extremest efforts of theology, that is, theological insurrections. End of section. Part 1st, Chapter 2, Section B 
of the Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. The Moderns. Subdivision 1. The Spirit. The realm of spirits is monstrously great. There is an infinite deal of the spiritual. Yet let us look and see what the spirit, this bequest of the ancients, properly is. Out of their birth pangs it came forth, but they themselves could not utter themselves as spirit. If they could give birth to it, it itself must speak. The born God, the Son of Man, is the first to utter the word, the Spirit. He, God, has to do with nothing earthly and no earthly relationship, but solely with the Spirit and spiritual relationships. Is my courage, indestructible under all the world's blows, my inflexibility and my obduracy, perchance already Spirit, in the full sense, because the world cannot touch it? Why, then it would not yet be at enmity with the world, and all its actions would consist merely in not succumbing to the world. No, as long as it does not busy itself with itself alone, as long as it does not have to do with its world, the spiritual, alone, it is not free spirit, but only the spirit of this world, the spirit fettered to it. The spirit is free spirit, that is, really spirit, only in a world of its own. In this, the earthly world, it is a stranger. Only through a spiritual world is the spirit really spirit, for this world does not understand it, and does not know how to keep the maiden from the foreign land from departing. But where is it to get this spiritual world? Where but out of itself? It must reveal itself, and the words that it speaks, the revelations in which it unveils itself, these are its world. As a visionary lives and has his world only in the visionary pictures that he himself creates, as a crazy man generates for himself his own dream world, without which he could not be crazy, so the spirit must create for itself its spirit world, and is not spirit till it creates it. Thus its creations make its spirit, and by its creatures we know it, the Creator. In them it lives, they are its world. Now, what is the spirit? It is the creator of a spiritual world. Even in you and me, people do not recognize spirit until they see that we have appropriated to ourselves something spiritual. Though thoughts may have been set before us, we have at least brought them to live in ourselves. For as long as we were children, the most edifying thoughts might have been laid before us without our wishing, or being able, to reproduce them in ourselves. So the spirit also exists only when it creates something spiritual. It is real only together with the spiritual, its creature. As, then, we know it by its works, the question is what these works are. But the works or children of the spirit are nothing else but spirits. If I had before me Jews, Jews of the true metal, I should have to stop here and leave them standing before this mystery, as for almost two thousand years they have remained standing before it, unbelieving and without knowledge. But as you, my dear reader, are at least not a full-blooded Jew, for such a one will not go astray as far as this. We will still go along a bit of road together, till perhaps you too turn your back on me because I laugh in your face. If someone told you you were altogether spirit, you would take hold of your body and not believe him, but answer, I have a spirit, no doubt. It do not exist only as spirit, but as a man with a body. You would still distinguish yourself from your spirit. But... 
replies he. It is your destiny, even though you are yet going about in the fetters of the body, to be one day a blessed spirit. And however you may conceive of the future aspect of your spirit, so much is yet certain that in death you will put off this body and yet keep yourself, your spirit, for all eternity. Accordingly, your spirit is the eternal and true in you, the body only a dwelling here below, which you may leave and perhaps exchange for another. Now you believe him. For the present, indeed, you are not spirit only. But when you emigrate from the mortal body, as one day you must, then you will have to help yourself without this body. And therefore it is needful that you be prudent and care in time for your proper self. What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet suffered damage in his soul? But, even granted the doubts, raised in the course of time against the tenets of the Christian faith, have long since robbed you of faith in the immortality of your spirit, you have nevertheless left one tenet undisturbed, and yet ingenuously adhere to the one truth, that the spirit is your better part, that the spiritual has greater claims on you than anything else. Despite all your atheism, in zeal against egoism, you concur with the believers in immortality. But whom do you think of under the name of egoist? A man who, instead of living to an idea that is a spiritual thing, and sacrificing it to his personal advantage, serves the latter. A good patriot, brings his sacrifice to the altar of the fatherland. But it cannot be disputed that the fatherland is an idea. Since for beasts incapable of mind, or children as yet without mind, there is no fatherland and no patriotism. Now if anyone does not approve himself as a good patriot, he betrays his egoism with reference to the fatherland. And so the matter stands in innumerable other cases. He who in human society takes the benefit of a prerogative sins egoistically against the idea of equality. He who exercises dominion is blamed as an egoist against the idea of liberty, and so on. You despise the egoist because he puts the spiritual in the background as compared with the personal, and has his eyes on himself where you would like to see him act to favor an idea. The distinction between you is that he makes himself the central point, that you the spirit, or that you cut your identity in two and exalt your proper self, the spirit, to be ruler of the paltrier remainder, while he will hear nothing of this cutting in two, and pursues spiritual and material interests just as he pleases. You think, to be sure, that you are falling foul only of those who enter into no spiritual interest at all. But, in fact, you curse at everybody who does not look on the spiritual interest as his true and highest interest. You carry your nightly service for this beauty so far that you affirm her to be the only beauty of the world. You live not to yourself, but to your spirit, and to what is the spirit's, and that is, ideas. As the spirit exists only in its creating of the spiritual, let us take a look about us for its first creation. If only it has accomplished this, there follows thenceforth a natural propagation of creations, as according to the myth only the first human beings needed to be created, the rest of the race propagating of itself. The first creation, on the other hand, must come forth out of nothing. The spirit has toward its realization nothing but itself, or rather, it has not yet even itself, but must create itself. Hence, its first creation is itself, the spirit. Mystical as this sounds, we yet go through it as an everyday experience. Are you a thinking being before you think? In creating the first thought, you create yourself, the thinking one. For you do not think before you think a thought, or have a thought. Is it not your singing that first makes you a singer, your talking that first makes you a talker, 
Now so too it is the production of the spiritual that first makes you a spirit. Meantime, as you distinguish yourself from the thinker, singer, and talker, so you no less distinguish yourself from the spirit, and feel very clearly that you are something besides spirit. But, as in the thinking ego, hearing and sight easily vanish in the enthusiasm of thought, so you also have been seized by the spirit enthusiasm, and you now long with all your might to become holy spirit, and to be dissolved in spirit. The spirit is your ideal, the unattained, the otherworldly. Spirit is the name of your God. God is spirit. Against all that is not spirit, you are a zealot. And therefore you play the zealot against yourself, who cannot get rid of the remainder of the non-spiritual. Instead of saying, I am more than spirit, you say with contrition, I am less than spirit. And spirit, pure spirit, or the spirit that is nothing but spirit, I can only think of, but am not. And since I am not it, it is another, exists as another, whom I call God. It exists in the nature of the case that the spirit that is to exist as pure spirit must be an otherworldly one. For since I am not it, it follows that it can only be outside me, since in any case a human being is not fully comprehended in the concept spirit. It follows that the pure spirit, the spirit as such, can only be outside of men, beyond the human world, not earthly, but heavenly. Only from this disunion in which I and the spirit lie, only because I and spirit are not names for one and the same thing, but different names for completely different things, only because I am not spirit and spirit not I, only from this, do we get a quite tautological explanation of the necessity that the spirit dwells in the other world, that is, is God. But from this it also appears how thoroughly theological is the liberation that Feuerbach is laboring to give us. What he says is that we had only mistaken our own essence, and therefore looked for it in the other world, but that now, when we see that God was only our human essence, we must recognize it again as ours and move it back out of the other world into this. To God, who is spirit, Feuerbach gives the name our essence. Can we put up with this, that our essence is brought into opposition to us, that we are split into an essential and an unessential self, do we not therewith go back into the dreary misery of seeing ourselves banished out of ourselves? What have we gained then, when for a variation we have transferred into ourselves the divine outside us? Are we that which is in us, as little as we are that which is outside us? I am as little my heart as I am my sweetheart, this other self of mine. Just because we are not the spirit that dwells in us, just for that reason we had to take it and set it outside us. It was not we, did not coincide with us, and therefore we could not think of it as existing otherwise than outside us, on the other side from us, in the other world. With the strength of despair, Feuerbach clutches at the total substance of Christianity, not to throw it away, no, to drag it to himself, to draw it, the long year and forth, ever distant, out of its heaven with a last effort, and keep it by him forever. Is not that a clutch of the uttermost despair, a clutch for life or death, and is it not at the same time the Christian yearning and hungering for the other world? The hero wants not to go into the other world, but to draw the other world to him and compel it to become this world. And since then has not all the world, with more or less consciousness, been crying that this world is the vital point and heaven must come down on earth and be experienced even here? 
Let us, in brief, set Feuerbach's theological view and our contradiction over against each other. The essence of man is man's supreme being. Now by religion, to be sure, the supreme being is called God and regarded as an objective essence. But in truth, it is only man's own essence, and therefore the turning point of the world's history is that henceforth no longer God, but man is to appear to man as God. To this we reply, the supreme being is indeed the essence of man, but just because it is his essence and not he himself, it remains quite immaterial whether we see it outside him and view it as God, or find it in him and call it essence of man, or man. I am neither God nor man, neither the supreme essence nor my essence, and therefore it is all one in the main whether I think of the essence as in me or outside me. Nay, we really do always think of the supreme being as in both kinds of otherworldliness, the inward and the outward, at once. For the spirit of God is, according to the Christian view, also our spirit, and dwells in us. It dwells in heaven and dwells in us. We poor things are just its dwelling, and if Feuerbach goes on to destroy its heavenly dwelling and force it to move to us bag and baggage, then we, its earthly apartments, will be badly overcrowded. But after this digression, which, if we were at all proposing to work by line and level, we should have had to save for later pages in order to avoid repetition, we return to the spirit's first creation, the spirit itself. The spirit is something other than myself. But this other, what is it? End of section. Part 1st, Chapter 2, Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Subdivision 2. The Possessed. Have you ever seen a spirit? No, not I, but my grandmother. Now, you see, it's just so with me, too. I myself haven't seen any, but my grandmother had them running between her feet all sorts of ways, and out of confidence in our grandmother's honesty, we believe in the existence of spirits. But had we no grandfathers, then, and did they not shrug their shoulders every time our grandmothers told about their ghosts? Yes, these were unbelieving men who have harmed our good religion much, those rationalists. We shall feel that. What else lies at the bottom of this warm faith in ghosts, if not the good faith in the existence of spiritual beings in general? And is not this latter itself disastrously unsettled if saucy men of the understanding may disturb the former? The Romanticists were quite conscious what a blow the very belief in God suffered by the laying aside of the belief in spirits or ghosts, and they tried to help us out of the baleful consequences, not only by their reawakened fairy world, but at last, and especially, by the intrusion of a higher world, by the somnambulists of Prevorst, etc. The good believers and fathers of the church did not suspect that with the belief in ghosts the foundation of religion was withdrawn, and that since then it had been floating in the air. He who no longer believes in any ghost need only to travel on consistently in his unbelief to see that there is no separate being at all concealed behind things. No ghost, or what is naively reckoned as synonymous even in our use of words, no spirit. Spirits exist. Look about in the world and say for yourself whether a spirit does not gaze upon you out of everything. Out of the lovely little flower there speaks to you the spirit of the Creator, who has shaped it so wonderfully. The stars proclaim the spirit that established their order. From the mountaintops a spirit of sublimity breathes down. 
Out of the waters a spirit of yearning murmurs up. Not of men, millions of spirits speak. The mountains may sink, the flowers fade, the world of stars fall in ruins, the men die. What matters the wreck of these visible bodies? The spirit, the invisible spirit, abides eternally. Yes, the whole world is haunted. Only is haunted? Nay, it itself walks. It is uncanny through and through. It is the wandering, seeming body of a spirit. It is a spook. What else should a ghost be, then, than an apparent body, but real spirit? Well, the world is empty, is not, is only glamorous semblance. Its truth is the spirit alone. It is the seeming body of a spirit. Look out near or far. A ghostly world surrounds you everywhere. You are always having apparitions or visions. Everything that appears to you is only the phantom of an indwelling spirit. It is a ghostly apparition. The world is to you only a world of appearances, behind which the spirit walks. You see spirits. Are you perchance thinking of comparing yourself with the ancients, who saw gods everywhere? Gods, my dear modern, are not spirits. Gods do not degrade the world to a semblance, and do not spiritualize it. But to you the whole world is spiritualized, and have become an enigmatical ghost. Therefore do not wonder if you likewise find in yourself nothing but a spook. Is not your body haunted by your spirit? And is not the latter alone the true and real, the former only the transitory, not, or a semblance? Are we not all ghosts, uncanny beings that wait for deliverance, to wit, spirits? Since the spirit appeared in the world, since the word became flesh, since then the world has been spiritualized, enchanted, a spook. You have spirit, for you have thoughts. What are your thoughts? Spiritual entities. Not things, then? No, but the spirit of things. The main point in all things. The inmost in them. Their idea. Consequently, what you think is not only your thought. On the contrary, it is that in the world which is most real that which is properly to be called true. It is the truth itself. If only I think truly, I think the truth. I may, to be sure, err with regard to the truth, and fail to recognize it. But if I recognize truly, the object of my cognition is the truth. So, I suppose, you strive at all times to recognize the truth. To me, the truth is sacred. It may well happen that I find a truth incomplete and replace it with a better, but the truth I cannot abrogate. I believe in the truth, therefore I search in it. Nothing transcends it. It is eternal. Sacred, eternal is the truth. It is the sacred, the eternal. But you who let yourself be filled and led by this sacred thing, are yourself hallowed. Further, the sacred is not for your senses, and you never as a sensual man discover its trace, but for your faith, or more definitely still, for your spirit. For it itself, you know, is a spiritual thing, a spirit, is spirit for the spirit. The sacred is by no means so easily to be set aside as many at present affirm, who no longer take this unsuitable word into their mouths. If even in a single respect I am still upbraided as an egoist, there is left the thought of something else which I should serve more than myself, and which must be to me more important than everything. In short, somewhat in which I should have to seek my true welfare, something sacred. However human this sacred thing may look, though it be the human itself, 
that does not take away its sacredness, but at most changes it from an unearthly to an earthly sacred thing, from a divine one to a human. Sacred things exist only for the egoist who does not acknowledge himself, the involuntary egoist, for him who is always looking after his own and yet does not count himself as the highest being, who serves only himself and at the same time always thinks he is serving a higher being, who knows nothing higher than himself and is yet infatuated about something higher. In short, for the egoist who would not like to be an egoist, and abases himself, combats his egoism, but at the same time abases himself only for the sake of being exalted, and therefore of gratifying his egoism. Because he would like to cease to be an egoist, he looks about in heaven and earth for higher beings to serve and sacrifice himself to. But, However much he shakes and disciplines himself, in the end he does all for his own sake, and the disreputable egoism will not come off him. On this account, I call him the involuntary egoist. His toil and care to get away from himself is nothing but the misunderstood impulse to self-dissolution. If you are bound to your past hour, if you must babble today because you babbled yesterday, if you cannot transform yourself each instant. You feel yourself fettered to slavery and benumbed. Therefore, over each minute of your existence, a fresh minute of the future beckons to you. And developing yourself, you get away from yourself, that is, from the self that was at that moment. As you are at each instant, you are your own creature, and in this very creature, you do not wish to lose yourself, the creator. You are yourself a higher being than you are, and surpass yourself. But that you are the one who is higher than you, that is, that you are not only creature, but likewise your creator. Just this, as an involuntary egoist, you fail to recognize. And therefore, the higher essence is to you an alien essence. Every higher essence, such as truth, mankind, and so on, is an essence over us. Alienness is a criterion of the sacred. In everything sacred, there lies something uncanny, strange, such as we are not quite familiar and at home in. What is sacred to me is not my own. And if for instance, the property of others was not sacred to me. I should look on it as mine, which I should take to myself when occasion offered. Or, on the other side, if I regard the face of the Chinese emperor as sacred, it remains strange to my eye, which I close at its appearance. Why is an incontrovertible mathematical truth which might even be called eternal according to the common understanding of words, not sacred, because it is not revealed or not the revelation of a higher being. If by revealed we understand only the so-called religious truths, we go far astray and entirely fail to recognize the breadth of the concept higher being. Atheists keep up their scoffing at the higher being, which was also honored under the name of the highest or etre supreme, and trample in the dust one proof of his existence after another, without noticing that they themselves, out of need for a higher being, only annihilate the old to make room for a new. Is man, perchance, not a higher essence than an individual man? And must not the truths, rights, and ideas which result from the concept of him be honored and counted sacred as revelations of this very concept? For, even though we should abrogate again many a truth that seemed to be made manifest by this concept, yet this would only evince a misunderstanding on our part, 
without in the least degree harming the sacred concept itself, or taking their sacredness from those truths that must rightly be looked upon as its revelations. Man reaches beyond every individual man, and yet, though he be his essence, is not in fact his essence, which rather would be as single as he the individual himself, but a general and higher, yes, for atheists, the highest essence. And as the divine revelations were not written down by God with his own hand, but made public through the Lord's instruments, so also the new highest essence does not write out its revelations itself, but lets them come to our knowledge through true men. Only the new essence betrays, in fact, a more spiritual style of conception than the old God, because the latter was still represented in a sort of embodiedness or form, while the undimmed spirituality of the new is retained, and no special material body is fancied for it. And withal, it does not lack corporeity, which even takes on a yet more seductive appearance, because it looks more natural and mundane, and consists in nothing less than an every bodily man. Yes, or outright in humanity, or all men. Thereby, the spectralness of the spirit in a seeming body has once again become really solid and popular. Sacred, then, is the highest essence and everything in which the highest essence reveals or will reveal itself. But hallowed are they who recognize this highest essence together with its own, together with its revelations. The sacred hallows in turn its reverer, who by his worship becomes himself a saint, as likewise what he does is saintly, a saintly walk, saintly thoughts, and saintly actions, imaginations, and aspirations. It is easily understood that the conflict over what is revered as the highest essence can be significant only so long as even the most embittered opponents concede to each other the main point that there is a highest essence to which worship or service is due. If one should smile compassionately at the whole struggle over a highest essence, as a Christian might at the war of words between a Shia and a Sunni, or between a Brahmin and a Buddhist, then the hypothesis of a highest essence would be null in his eyes, and the conflict on this basis an idle play. Whether then the one God or the three in one, whether the Lutheran God or the Atreus Supreme, or not God at all, but man, may represent the highest essence. That makes no difference at all for him who denies the highest essence itself. For in his eyes, those servants of a highest essence are one and all pious people, the most raging atheist, not less than the most faith-filled Christian. In the foremost place of the sacred, then, stands the highest essence and the faith in this essence, our holy faith. The Spook With ghosts we arrive in the spirit realm, in the realm of essences. What haunts the universe and has its occult, incomprehensible being there is precisely the mysterious spook that we call highest essence. And to get to the bottom of this spook, to comprehend it, to discover reality in it, to prove the existence of God. This task men set to themselves for thousands of years, with the horrible impossibility, the endless denied labor, of transforming the spook into a non-spook, the unreal into something real, the spirit into an entire and corporeal person, with this they tormented themselves to death. Behind the existing world they sought the thing in itself, the essence. Behind the thing they sought the unthing. When one looks to the bottom of anything, searches out its essence, one often discovers something quite other than what it seems to be. 
honeyed speech and a lying heart, pompous words and beggarly thoughts, and so on. By bringing the essence into prominence, one degrades the hitherto misapprehended appearance to a bare semblance, a deception. The essence of the world, so attractive and splendid, is for him who looks to the bottom of it, emptiness. Emptiness equals world's essence, world's doings. Now he who is religious does not occupy himself with the deceitful semblance, with the empty appearances, but looks upon the essence, and in the essence has the truth. The essences which are deduced from some appearances are the evil essences, and conversely from others, the good. The essence of human feeling, for instance, is love. The essence of human will is the good, that of one's thinking, the true, and so on. What at first passed for existence, such as the world and its like, appears now as bare semblance, and the truly existent is much rather the essence, whose realm is filled with gods, spirits, demons, with good or bad essences. Only this inverted world, the world of essences, truly exists now. The human heart may be loveless, but its essence exists, God, who is love. Human thought may wander in error, but its essence, truth, exists. God is truth and the like. To know and acknowledge essences alone and nothing but essences, that is religion. Its realm is a realm of essences, spooks, and ghosts. The longing to make the spook comprehensible or to realize nonsense has brought about a corporeal ghost, a ghost or spirit with a real body, an embodied ghost. How the strongest and most talented Christians have tortured themselves to get a conception of this ghostly apparition. But there always remained the contradiction of two natures, the divine and the human, the ghostly and sensual. There remained the most wondrous spook, a thing that was not a thing. Never yet was a ghost more soul-torturing, and no shaman who pricks himself to raving fury and nerve-lacerating cramps to conjure a ghost can endure such soul-torment as Christians suffered from that most incomprehensible ghost. But through Christ, the truth of the matter had at the same time come to light that the veritable spirit or ghost is man. The corporeal or embodied spirit, is just man. He himself is the ghostly being, and at the same time the being's appearance and existence. Henceforth, man no longer, in typical cases, shudders at ghosts outside himself, but at himself. He is terrified at himself. In the depth of his breast dwells the spirit of sin. Even the faintest thought, and this is itself a spirit, you know, may be a devil, etc. The ghost has put on a body. God has become man. But now man is himself the gruesome spook which he seeks to get back of, to exorcise, to fathom, to bring to reality and to speech. Man is spirit. What matter if the body wither, if only the spirit is saved? Everything rests on the spirit, and the spirit's or soul's welfare, becomes the exclusive goal. Man has become to himself a ghost, an uncanny spook, to which there is even assigned a distinct seat in the body, dispute over the seat of the soul, whether in the head, etc. You are not to me, and I am not to you, a higher essence. Nevertheless, a higher essence may be hidden in each of us, and call forth a mutual reverence. To take at once the most general, man lives in you and in me. If I did not see man in you, what occasion should I have to respect you? To be sure, you are not man in his true and adequate form, but only a mortal veil of his, from which he can withdraw without himself ceasing. But yet for the present this general and higher essence is housed in you, 
and you present before me, because an imperishable spirit has in you assumed a perishable body, so that really your form is only an assumed one, a spirit that appears, appears in you, without being bound to your body and to this particular mode of appearance, therefore a spook. Hence I do not regard you as a higher essence, but only respect that higher essence which walks in you. I respect man in you. The ancients did not observe anything of this sort in their slaves, and the higher essence man found as yet little response. To make up for this, they saw in each other ghosts of another sort. The people is a higher essence than an individual, and like man or the spirit of man, a spirit haunting the individual, the spirit of the people. For this reason they revered the spirit, and only so far as he served this or else a spirit related to it, as in the spirit of the family, could the individual appear significant, only for the sake of the higher essence, the people, was consideration allowed to the member of the people. As you are hallowed to us by man who haunts you, so at every time men have been hallowed by some higher essence or other, like people, family, and such. Only for the sake of a higher essence has anyone been honored from of old. Only as a ghost has he been regarded in the light of a hallowed, a protected, and recognized person. If I cherish you because I hold you dear, because in you my heart finds nourishment, my need satisfaction, then it is not done for the sake of a higher essence whose hallowed body you are, not on account of my beholding in you a ghost, an appearing spirit, but from egoistic pleasure. You yourself with your essence are valuable to me, for your essence is not a higher one, is not a higher and more general than you, is unique like yourself, because it is you. But it is not only man that haunts, so does everything. The higher essence, the spirit, that walks in everything, is at the same time bound to nothing, and only appears in it. Ghosts in every corner. Here would be the place to pass the haunting spirits in review, if they were not to come before us again further on in order to vanish before egoism. Hence, let only a few of them be particularized by way of example, in order to bring us at once to our attitude toward them. Sacred above all is the Holy Spirit. Sacred the truth. Sacred our right, law, a good cause, majesty, marriage, the common good, order, fatherland, and so on. Wheels in the Head Man, your head is haunted. You have wheels in your head. You imagine great things and depict to yourself a whole world of gods that has an existence for you, a spirit realm to which you suppose yourself to be called, an ideal that beckons to you. You have a fixed idea. Do not think that I am jesting or speaking figuratively when I regard those persons who cling to the higher, and because the vast majority belongs under this head, almost the whole world of men, as veritable fools, fools in a madhouse. What is it, then, that is called a fixed idea, an idea that has subjected the man to itself? When you recognize, with regard to such a fixed idea, that it is a folly, you shut its slave up in an asylum. And is the truth of the faith, say, which we are not to doubt, the majesty of the people, which we are not to strike yet, he who does is guilty of lay's majesty, virtue, against which the censor is not to let a word pass, that morality may be kept pure, are these not fixed ideas? Is not the stupid chatter of most of our newspapers the babble of fools who suffer from the fixed idea of morality, legality, Christianity, and so forth, and only seem to go about free because the madhouse in which they walk takes in so broad a space? 
Touch the fixed idea of such a fool, and you will at once have to guard your back against the lunatic's stealthy malice. For these great lunatics are like the little so-called lunatics in this point too, that they assail by stealth him who touches their fixed idea. They first steal his weapon, steal free speech from him, and then they fall upon him with their nails. Every day now, lays bare the cowardice and vindictiveness of these maniacs, and the stupid populace hurrahs for their crazy measures. One must read the journals of this period, and must hear the Philistines talk, to get the horrible conviction that one is shut up in a house with fools. Thou shalt not call thy brother a fool, if thou dost, etc. But I do not fear the curse, and I say, my brothers are arch-fools. Whether a poor fool of the insane asylum is possessed by the fancy that he is God the Father, Emperor of Japan, the Holy Spirit, or what not, or whether a citizen in comfortable circumstances conceives that it is his mission to be a good Christian, a faithful Protestant, a loyal citizen, a virtuous man, both these are one and the same fixed idea. He who has never tried and dared not to be a good Christian a faithful Protestant, a virtuous man, and the like, is possessed and prepossessed by faith, virtuousness, etc. Just as the schoolmen philosophized only inside the belief of the Church, as Pope Benedict the Fourteenth wrote fat books inside the papist superstition, without ever throwing a doubt upon this belief, as authors fill whole folios on the state without calling into question the fixed idea of the state itself, as our newspapers are crammed with politics because they are conjured into the fancy that man was created to be a zoon politicon. And so also subjects vegetate in subjection, virtuous people in virtue, liberals in humanity, without ever putting to these fixed ideas of theirs the searching knife of criticism undislodgeable like a madman's delusion those thoughts stand on a firm footing and he who doubts them lays hands on the sacred yes the fixed idea that is the truly sacred is it perchance only people possessed by the devil that meet us or do we as often come upon people possessed in the contrary way possessed by the good by virtue morality, the law, or some principle or other. Possessions of the devil are not the only ones. God works on us, and the devil does. The former workings of grace, the latter workings of the devil. Possessed people are set in their opinions. If the word possession displeases you, then call it prepossession. Yes, since the spirit possesses you, and all inspirations come from it. Call it inspiration and enthusiasm. I add the complete enthusiasm, for we cannot stop with the sluggish, halfway kind, is called fanaticism. It is precisely among cultured people that fanaticism is at home, for man is cultured so far as he takes an interest in spiritual things. An interest in spiritual things, when it is alive, is and must be fanaticism. It is a fanatical interest in the sacred, fanu. Observe our liberals. Look into the Zaxus and Fatislands better. Hear what Schlosser says. Holbach's company constituted a regular plot against the traditional doctrine and the existing system, and its members were as fanatical on behalf of their unbelief as monks and priests Jesuits and Pietists, Methodists, Missionary and Bible Societies, commonly are for mechanical worship and orthodoxy. Take notice how a moral man behaves, who today often thinks he is through with God and throws off Christianity as a bygone thing. If you ask him whether he has ever doubted that the copulation of brother and sister is incest, that monogamy is the truth of marriage, that filial piety is a sacred duty, then a moral shudder will come over him at the conception of one's being allowed to touch his sister as wife also. And whence this shudder? 
because he believes in those moral commandments. This moral faith is deeply rooted in his breast. Much as he rages against the pious Christians, he himself has nevertheless as thoroughly remained a Christian, to wit, a moral Christian. In the form of morality, Christianity holds him a prisoner, and a prisoner under faith. Monogamy is to be something sacred, and he who may live in bigamy is punished as a criminal. He who commits incest suffers as a criminal. Those who are always crying that religion is not to be regarded in the state, and the Jew is to be a citizen equally with the Christian, show themselves in accord with this. Is not this of incest and monogamy a dogma of faith? Touch it, and you will learn by experience how this moral man is a hero of faith also. Not less than Krumacher, not less than Philip II. These fight for the faith of the church, he for the faith of the state, or the moral law of the state, for articles of faith. Both condemn him who act otherwise than their faith will allow. The brand of crime is stamped upon him, and he may languish in reformatories in jails. Moral faith is as fanatical as religious faith. They call that liberty of faith, then, when brother and sister, on account of a relation that they should have settled with their conscience, are thrown into prison. But they set a pernicious example. Yes, indeed. Others might have taken the notion that the state had no business to meddle with their relation, and thereupon purity of morals would go to ruin. So then, the religious heroes of faith are zealous for the sacred God, the moral ones for the sacred good. Those who are zealous for something sacred often look very little like each other. How the strictly orthodox or old-style believers differ from the fighters for truth, light, and justice, from the philothes, the friends of light, the rationalists, and others. And yet how utterly unessential is this difference. If one buffets single traditional truths, miracles, and limited power of princes, then the rationalists buffet them too, and only the old-style believers wail. But if one buffets truth itself, he immediately has both as believers for opponents. And so with moralities, the strict believers are relentless, the clearer heads are more tolerant. But he who attacks morality itself gets both to deal with. Truth, morality, justice, light, etc. are to be and remain sacred. What anyone finds to censure in Christianity is simply supposed to be unchristian, according to the view of the, these rationalists. But Christianity must remain a fixture. To buffet it is outrageous, an outrage. To be sure, the heretic against pure faith no longer exposes himself to the earlier fury of persecution. But so much the more does it now fall upon the heretic against pure morals. End of section. Part First, Chapter Two, Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Continuation of Subdivision 2. The Possessed. Piety has for a century received so many blows, and had to hear its superhuman essence reviled as an inhuman one so often, that one cannot feel tempted to draw the sword against it again. And yet, it has almost always been only moral opponents that have appeared in the arena to assail the supreme essence in favor of 
another supreme essence. So Proudhon, unabashed, says, Man is destined to live without religion, but the moral law is eternal and absolute. Who would dare today to attack morality? Moral people skimmed off the best fat from religion, ate it themselves, and are now having a tough job to get rid of the resulting scrofola. If, therefore, we point out that religion has not by any means been hurt in its inmost part, so long as people reproach it only with its superhuman essence, and that it takes its final appeal to the spirit alone, for God is spirit, then we have sufficiently indicated its final accord with morality and can leave its stubborn conflict with the latter lying behind us. It is a question of a supreme essence with both, and whether this is a superhuman or a human one can make, since it is any case an essence over me, a supermine one, so to speak, but little difference to me. In the end, the relation to the human essence, or to man, as soon as ever it has shed the snakeskin of the old religion, will yet wear a religious snakeskin again. So Feuerbach instructs us that, if one only inverts speculative philosophy, always makes the predicate the subject, and so makes the subject the object and principle, one has the undraped truth pure and clean. Herewith, to be sure, we lost the narrow religious standpoint, lost the God, who from this standpoint is subject. But we take in exchange for it the other side of the religious standpoint, the moral standpoint. Thus we no longer say, God is love, but love is divine. If we further put in place of the predicate divine, the equivalent sacred, then, as far as concerns the sense, all the old comes back again. According to this, love is to be the good in man, his divineness, that which does him honor, his true humanity. It makes him man for the first time makes for the first time a man out of him. So then it would be more accurately worded thus, love is what is human in man, and what is inhuman is the loveless egoist. But precisely all that which Christianity and with it speculative philosophy, i.e. theology, offers as the good, the absolute, is to self-ownership simply not the good, or, what means the same, it is only the good. Consequently, by the transformation of the predicate into the subject, the Christian essence, and with it the predicate that contains the essence, you know, would only be fixed yet more oppressively. God and the divine would entwine themselves all the more inextricably with me. To expel God from his heaven and to rob him of his transcendence cannot yet support a claim of complete victory, if therein he is only chased into the human breast and gifted with indelible imminence. Now they say, the divine is the truly human. The same people who oppose Christianity as the basis of the state, who oppose the so-called Christian state, do not tire of repeating that morality is the fundamental pillar of social life and of the state, as if the dominion of morality were not a complete dominion of the sacred, a hierarchy. So we may here mention, by the way, that rationalist movement which, after theologians had long insisted that only faith was capable of grasping religious truths, that only to believers did God reveal himself, and that therefore only the heart, the feelings, the believing fancy was religious, broke out with the assertion that the natural understanding, human reason, 
was also capable of discerning God. What does that mean but that the reason laid claim to be the same visionary as the fancy? In this sense, Romarus wrote his most notable truths of natural religion. It had to come to this, that the whole man, with all his faculties, was found to be religious, heart and affections, understanding and reason, feeling, knowledge, and will. In short, everything in man appeared religious. Hegel had shown that even philosophy is religious. And what is not called religion today? The religion of love, the religion of freedom, political religion. In short, every enthusiasm. And so it is, too, in fact. To this day we use the Romance word religion, which expresses the concept of a condition of being bound. To be sure, we remain bound so far as religion takes possession of our inward parts. But is the mind also bound? On the contrary, that is free, is sole Lord, is not our mind, but absolute. Therefore the correct affirmative translation of the word religion would be freedom of mind. In whomsoever the mind is free, he is religious in just the same way as he in whom the senses have free course is called a sensual man. The mind binds the former, that desires the latter. Religion, therefore, is boundless or religio with reference to me. I am bound. It is freedom with reference to the mind. The mind is free or has freedom of mind. Many know from experience how hard it is on us when the desires run away with us, free and unbridled, but that the free mind, splendid intellectuality, enthusiasm for intellectual interests, or however this jewel may in the most various phrase be named, brings us into yet more grievous straits than even the wildest impropriety. People will not perceive, nor can they perceive it without being consciously egoists. Remorous, and all who have shown that our reason, our heart, etc., also lead to God, have therewithal shown that we are possessed through and through. To be sure, they vexed the theologians, from whom they took away the prerogative of religious exaltation. But for religion, for freedom of mind, they thereby conquered yet more ground. For, when the mind is no longer limited to feeling or faith, but also, as understanding, reason, and thought in general, belongs to itself the mind. When, therefore, it may take part in the spiritual and heavenly truths in the form of understanding, as well as in its other forms, then the whole mind is occupied only with spiritual things, that is, with itself, and is therefore free. Now we are so through and through religious that jurors, sworn men, condemn us to death, and every policeman, as a good Christian, takes us to the lockup by virtue of an oath of office. Morality could not come into opposition with piety till after the time when, in general, the boisterous hate of everything that looked like an order, decrees, commandments, etc., spoke out in revolt, and the personal absolute lord was scoffed at and persecuted. Consequently, it could arrive at independence only through liberalism, whose first form acquired significance in the world's history as citizenship and weakened the specifically religious powers. See liberalism below. For when morality not merely goes alongside of piety, but stands on feet of its own, then its principle lies no longer in the divine commandments, but in the law of reason, from which the commandments, so far as they are still to remain valid, must first await justification for their validity. In the law of reason, man determines himself out of himself. For man is rational, 
and out of the essence of man, those laws follow of necessity. Piety and morality part company in this, that the former makes God the lawgiver, the latter man. From a certain standpoint of morality, people reason about as follows. Either man is led by his sensuality and is following it immoral, or he is led by the good, which, taken up into will, is called moral sentiment, sentiment and prepossession in favor of the good. Then he shows himself moral. From this point of view, how, for instance, can Sand's act against Kotzebue be called immoral? What is commonly understood by unselfish, it certainly was, in the same measure as, among other things, St. Crispin's thieveries in favor of the poor. He should not have murdered, for it stands written, Thou shalt not murder. Then to serve the good, the welfare of the people, as Sand at least intended, or the welfare of the poor, like Crispin, is moral. But murder and theft are immoral, the purpose moral, the means immoral. Why? Because murder, assassination, is something absolutely bad. When the guerrillas enticed the enemies of the country into ravines and shot them down unseen from the bushes, do you suppose that was assassination? According to the principle of morality, which commands us to serve the good, you could really ask only whether murder could never in any case be a realization of the good, and would have to endorse that murder which realized the good. You cannot condemn Sand's deed at all. It was moral, because in the service of the good, because unselfish. It was an act of punishment, which the individual inflicted, an execution inflicted at the risk of the executioner's life. What else had his scheme been, after all, but that he wanted to suppress writings by brute force? Are you not acquainted with the same procedure as a legal and sanctioned one? And what can be objected against it from your principle of morality? But it was an illegal execution. So the immoral thing in it was the illegality, the disobedience to law, then you admit that the good is nothing else than law, morality, nothing else than loyalty. And to this externality of loyalty, your morality must sink. To this righteousness of works in the fulfillment of the law. Only that the latter is at once more tyrannical and more revolting than the old time righteousness of works. For in the latter, only to act is needed but you require the disposition to. One must carry in himself the law, the statute, and he who is most legally disposed is the most moral. Even the last vestige of cheerfulness in Catholic life must perish in this Protestant legality. Here at last, the domination of the law is for the first time complete. Not I live, but the law lives in me. Thus I have really come so far to be only the vessel of its glory. Every Prussian carries his gendarme in his breast, says a high Prussian officer. Why do certain opposition parties fail to flourish? solely for the reason that they refuse to forsake the path of morality or legality. Hence the measureless hypocrisy of devotion, love, etc., from whose repulsiveness one may daily get the most thrown at this rotten and hypocritical relation of a lawful opposition. In the moral relation of love and fidelity, a divided or opposed will cannot have place. The beautiful relation is disturbed if the one wills this and the other the reverse. But now, according to the practice hitherto, and the old prejudice of the opposition, the moral relation 
is to be preserved above all. What is then left of the opposition? Perhaps the will to have a liberty, if the beloved one sees fit to deny it? Not a bit. It may not will to have the freedom. It can only wish for it, petition for it, lisp a please, please. What would come of it if the opposition really willed, willed with the full energy of the will? No, it must renounce will in order to live to love, renounce liberty for love of morality. It may never claim as a right what it is permitted only to beg as a favor. Love, devotion, etc. demand with undeviating definiteness that there be only one will to which the others devote themselves, which they serve, follow, love. Whether this will is regarded as reasonable or as unreasonable, in both cases one acts morally when one follows it, and immorally when one breaks away from it. The will that commands the censorship seems to many unreasonable, but he who in a land of censorship evades the censoring of his book acts immorally, and he who submits it to the censorship acts morally. If someone let his moral judgment go and set up a secret press, one would have to call him immoral and imprudent in the bargain if he let himself be caught. But will such a man lay claim to a value in the eyes of the moral? Perhaps, that is, if he fancied he was serving a higher morality. The web of the hypocrisy of today hangs on the frontiers of two domains, between which our time swings back and forth attaching its fine threads of deception and self-deception. No longer vigorous enough to serve morality without doubt or weakening, not yet reckless enough to live wholly to egoism. It trembles now toward the one and now toward the other in the spider web of hypocrisy and, crippled by the curse of halfness, catches only miserable, stupid flies. If one has dared to make a free motion, immediately one waters it again with assurances of love and shams resignation. If, on the other hand, they have had the face to reject the free motion with moral appeals to confidence, immediately the moral courage also sinks, and they assure one how they hear the free words with special pleasure. They sham approval. In short, people would like to have the one, but not go without the other. They would like to have a free will, but not for their lives lack the moral will. Just come into contact with a servile loyalist, you liberals. You will sweeten every word of freedom with a look of the most loyal confidence, and he will clothe his servilism in the most flattering phrases of freedom. Then you go apart, and he, like you, thinks I know you, Fox. He scents the devil in you as much as you do the dark old Lord God in him. A Nero is a bad man only in the eyes of the good. In mind, he is nothing but a possessed man, as are the good, too. The good see in him an arch-villain, and relegate him to hell. Why did nothing hinder him in his arbitrary course? Why did people put up with so much? Do you suppose the tame Romans, who let all their will be bound by such a tyrant, were a hair the better? In old Rome they would have put him to death instantly, never would have been his slaves. But the contemporary good among the Romans opposed to him only moral demands, not their will. They sighed that their emperor did not do homage to morality like them. They themselves remained moral subjects, till at last one found courage to give up moral, obedient subjection. And then the same good Romans, who, 
as obedient subjects, had borne all the ignominy of having no will, hurrahed over the nefarious, immoral act of the rebel. Where, then, in the good, was the courage for the revolution, that courage which they now praised, after another had mustered it up? The good could not have this courage, for a revolution and an insurrection into the bargain is always something immoral, which one can resolve upon only when one ceases to be good and becomes either bad or neither of the two. Nero was no viler than his time, in which one could only be one of the two, good or bad. The judgment of his time on him had to be that he was bad, and this in the highest degree, not a milksop, but an arch scoundrel. All moral people can pronounce only this judgment on him. Rascals such as he was are still living here and there today. See, for example, the memoirs of Ritter von Lanck in the midst of the moral. It is not convenient to live among them, certainly, as one is not sure of his life for a moment. But can you say that it is more convenient to live among the moral? One is just as little sure of his life there, only that one is hanged in the way of justice. But least of all is one sure of his honor, and the national cockade is gone before you can say Jack Robinson. The hard fist of morality treats the noble nature of egoism altogether without compassion. But surely one cannot put a rascal and an honest man on the same level. Now, no human being does that oftener than you judges of morals. Yes, still more than that, you imprison as a criminal an honest man who speaks openly against the existing constitution, against the hallowed institutions, and you entrust portfolios and still more important things to a crafty rascal. So in proxy, you have nothing to reproach me with. But in theory, now there I do put both on the same level, as two opposite poles, to wit, both on the level of the moral law. Both have meaning only in the moral world, just as in the pre-Christian time, a Jew who kept the law and one who broke it had meaning and significance only in respect to the Jewish law. Before Jesus Christ, on the contrary, the Pharisee was no more than the sinner and publican. So before self-ownership, the moral Pharisee amounts to as much as the immoral sinner. Nero became very inconvenient by his possessiveness, but a self-owning man would not silly oppose to him the sacred, and whine if the tyrant does not regard the sacred. He would oppose to him his will. How often the sacredness of the inalienable rights of man has been held up to their foes, and some liberty or other shown and demonstrated to be a sacred right of man. Those who do that deserve to be laughed out of court, as they actually are, were it not that in truth they do, even though unconsciously, take the road that leads to the goal. They have a presentiment that, if only the majority is once won for that liberty, it will also will the liberty, and will then take what it will have. The sacredness of the liberty, and all possible proofs of this sacredness, will never procure it. Lamenting and petitioning only shows beggars. The moral man is necessarily narrow, in that he knows no other enemy than the immoral man. He who is not moral is immoral, and accordingly reprobate, despicable, etc. Therefore, the moral man can never comprehend the egoist. Is not unwedded cohabitation an immorality? The moral man may turn as he pleases. He will have to stand by this verdict. Amelia Galati gave up her life for this moral truth. And it is true. It is an immorality. 
A virtuous girl may become an old maid. A virtuous man may pass the time in fighting his natural impulses until he has perhaps dulled them. He may castrate himself for the sake of virtue, as St. Origen did for the sake of heaven. He thereby honors sacred wedlock, sacred chastity, as inviolable. He is moral. Unchastity can never become a moral act. However indulgently the moral man may judge and excuse him who committed it, it remains a transgression, a sin against a moral commandment. There clings to it an indelible stain. As chastity once belonged to the monastic vow, so it does to moral conduct. Chastity is a good. For the egoist, on the contrary, even chastity is not a good without which he could not get along. He cares nothing at all about it. What now follows from this for the judgment of the moral man? This, that he throws the egoist into the only class of men that he knows besides moral men, into that of the immoral. He cannot do otherwise. He must find the egoist immoral in everything in which the egoist disregards morality. If he did not find him so, then he would already have become an apostate from morality without confessing it to himself. He would already no longer be a truly moral man. One should not let himself be led astray by such phenomena, which at the present day are certainly no longer to be classed as rare, but should reflect that he who yields any point of morality can as little be counted among the truly moral as Lessing was a pious Christian when, in the well-known parable, he compared the Christian religion, as well as the Mohammedan and Jewish, to a counterfeit ring. Often people are already further than they venture to confess to themselves. For Socrates, because in culture he stood on the level of morality, it would have been an immorality if he had been willing to follow Credo's seductive indictment and escape from the dungeon. To remain was the only moral thing. But it was solely because Socrates was a moral man. The unprincipled, sacrilegious men of the revolution, on the contrary, had sworn fidelity to Louis the Sixteenth, and decreed his deposition, yes, his death. But the act was an immoral one at which moral persons will be horrified to all eternity. Yet all this applies, more or less, only to civic morality, on which the freer look down with contempt. For it, like civism, its native ground, in general, is still too little removed and free from the religious heaven not to transplant the latter's laws without criticism or further consideration to its domain instead of producing independent doctrines of its own. Morality cuts quite a different figure when it arrives at the consciousness of its dignity and raises its principle, the essence of man, or man with a capital M, to be the only regulative power. Those who have worked their way through to such a decided consciousness break entirely with religion, whose God no longer finds any place alongside their man and, as they see below, themselves scuttle the ship of state, so too they crumble away that morality which flourishes only in the state, and logically have no right to use even its name any further. For what this critical party calls morality is very positively distinguished from the so-called civic or political morality, and must appear to the citizen like an insensate an unbridled liberty. But at bottom, it has only the advantage of the purity of the principle, which, freed from its defilement with the religious, has now reached universal power in its clarified definiteness as humanity. Therefore, one should not wonder that the name morality is retained along with others, like freedom, benevolence, self-consciousness, 
and is only garnered now and then with the addition a free morality. Just as, though the civic state is abused, yet the state is to arise again as a free state, or, if not even so, yet as a free society. Because this morality completed into humanity has fully settled its accounts with the religion out of which it historically came forth, nothing hinders it from becoming a religion on its own account. For a distinction prevails between religion and morality only so long as our dealings with the world of men are regulated and hallowed by our relation to a superhuman being, or so long as our doing is a doing for God's sake. If, on the other hand, it comes to the point that man is to man the supreme being, then that distinction vanishes, and morality, being removed from its subordinate position, is completed into religion. For then, the higher being, who had hitherto been subordinated to the highest, man, has ascended to absolute height, and we are related to him as one is related to the highest being, religiously. Morality and piety are now as synonymous as in the beginning of Christianity, and it is only because the supreme being has come to be a different one that a holy walk is no longer called a holy one, but a human one. If morality has conquered, then a complete change of masters has taken place. After the annihilation of faith, Feuerbach thinks to put into the supposedly safe harbor of love. The first and highest law must be the love of man to man. Homo homini deus est. This is the supreme practical maxim. This is the turning point of the world's history. But, properly speaking, only the God is changed, the Deus. Love has remained. There love to the superhuman God, here love to the human God, to Homo as Deus. Therefore, man is to me sacred, and everything truly human is to me sacred. Marriage is sacred of itself, and so it is with all moral relations. Friendship is and must be sacred for you and property and marriage and the good of every man, but sacred in and of itself. Haven't we the priest again there? Who is his God? Man with a great M. What is the divine, the human? Then the predicate has indeed only been changed into the subject. And instead of the sentence, God is love, they say, love is divine. Instead of God has become man, man has become God, etc. It is nothing more or less than a new religion. All moral relations are ethical are cultivated with a moral mind, only where of themselves, without religious consecration by the priest's blessing, they are counted religious. Feuerbach's proposition, theology is anthropology, means only religion must be ethics, ethics alone is religion. Altogether, Feuerbach accomplishes only a transposition of subject and predicate, a giving of preference to the latter. But since he himself says, love is not and has never been considered by men sacred through being a predicate of God, but it is a predicate of God because it is divine in and of itself, he might judge that the fight against the predicates themselves, against love and all sanctities, must be commenced. How could he hope to turn men away from God when he left them the divine? And if, 
as Feuerbach says, God himself has never been the main thing to them, but only his predicates. Then he might have gone on, leaving them the tinsel longer yet, since the doll, the real colonel, was left at any rate. He recognizes, too, that with him it is only a matter of annihilating an illusion. He thinks, however, that the effect of the illusion on men is downright ruinous, since even love, in itself the truest, most inward sentiment, becomes an obscure, illusory one through religiousness, since religious love loves man only for God's sake, therefore loves man only apparently, but in truth God only. Is this different with moral love? Does it love the man, this man, for this man's sake, or for morality's sake? And so, for homo homini deus, for God's sake? End of section. Part First, Chapter Two, Section B, of the Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Continuation of Subdivision 2. The Possessed. The wheels in the head have a number of other formal aspects, some of which it may be useful to indicate here. Thus self-renunciation is common to the holy with the unholy, to the pure and the impure. The impure man renounces all better feelings, all shame, even natural timidity, and follows only the appetite that rules him. The pure man renounces his natural relation to the world, renounces the world, and follows only the desire which rules him. Driven by the thirst for money, the avaricious man renounces all admonitions of conscience, all feeling of honor, all gentleness, and all compassion. He puts all considerations out of sight. The appetite drags him along. The holy man behaves similarly. He makes himself the laughingstock of the world, is hard-hearted and strictly just, for the desire drags him along. As the unholy man renounces himself before mammon, so the holy man renounces himself before God and the divine laws. We are now living in a time when the shamelessness of the holy is every day more and more felt and uncovered, whereby it is at the same time compelled to unveil itself and lay itself bare more and more every day. Have not the shamelessness and stupidity of the reasons with which men antagonize the progress of the age long surpassed all measure and all expectation? But it must be so. The self-renouncers must as holy men, take the same course that they do as unholy men, as the latter little by little sink to the fullest measure of self-renouncing vulgarity and lowness, so the former must ascend to the most dishonorable exaltation. The mammon of the earth and the god of heaven both demand exactly the same degree of self-renunciation. The low man, like the exalted one, reaches out for a good, the former for the material good, the latter for the ideal, the so-called supreme good. And at last, both complete each other again too, as the material-minded man sacrifices everything to an ideal phantasm, his vanity, and the spiritually-minded man to a material gratification, the life 
of enjoyment. Those who exhort men to unselfishness think they are saying an uncommon deal. What do they understand by it? Probably something like what they understand by self-renunciation. But who is the self that is to be renounced and to have no benefit? It seems that you yourself are supposed to be it. And for whose benefit is unselfish self-renunciation recommended to you? Again, for your benefit and behoof, only that through unselfishness you are procuring your true benefit. You are to benefit yourself, and yet you are not to seek your benefit. People regard as unselfish the benefactor of men, a Franke who founded the orphan asylum, an O'Connell who works tirelessly for his Irish people, but also the fanatic who, like St. Boniface, hazards his life for the conversion of the heathen, or like Robespierre, sacrifices everything to virtue, like Kerne, dies for God, king, and fatherland. Hence, among others, O'Connell's opponents try to trump up against him some selfishness or mercenariness, for which the O'Connell Fund seems to give them a foundation. For, if they were successful in casting suspicion on his unselfishness, they would easily separate him from his adherents. Yet what could they show further than that O'Connell was working for another end than the ostensible one? But, whether he may aim at making money or at liberating the people, it still remains certain, in one case as in the other, that he is striving for an end, and that his end, selfishness here as there, only that his national self-interest would be beneficial to others too, and so would be for the common interest. Now, do you suppose unselfishness is unreal and nowhere extant? On the contrary, nothing is more ordinary. One may even call it an article of fashion in the civilized world, which is considered so indispensable that, if it costs too much in solid material, people at least adorn themselves with its tinsel counterfeit and feign it. Where does unselfishness begin? right where an end ceases to be our end and our property, which we, as owners, can dispose of at pleasure, where it becomes a fixed end or a fixed idea, where it begins to inspire, enthuse, fanaticize us. In short, where it passes into our stubbornness and becomes our master. One is not unselfish so long as he retains the end in his power, one becomes so only at that here I stand, here I cannot do otherwise. The fundamental maxim of all the possessed. One becomes so in the case of a sacred end, through the corresponding sacred zeal. I am not unselfish so long as the end remains my own. And I, instead of giving myself up to be the blind means of its fulfillment, leave it always an open question. My zeal need not on that account be slacker than the most fanatical, but at the same time I remain toward it frostily cold, unbelieving, and its most irreconcilable enemy. I remain its judge because I am its owner. Unselfishness grows rank as far as possessedness reaches, as much on possessions of the devil as on those of a good spirit. There, vice, folly, and the like. Here, humility, devotion, and so forth. Where could one look without meeting victims of self-renunciation? There sits a girl opposite me, who perhaps has been making bloody sacrifices to her soul for ten years already. Over the buxom form droops a deathly tired head, and pale cheeks betray the slow bleeding away of her youth. Poor child, how often the passions may have beaten at your heart, and the rich powers of youth have demanded their right. When your head rolled in the soft pillow, how awakening nature quivered through your limbs, the blood swelled your veins, 
and fiery fancies poured the gleam of voluptuousness into your eyes. Then appeared the ghost of the soul and its external bliss. You were terrified. Your hands folded themselves. Your tormented eyes turned its look upward. You prayed. The storms of nature were hushed. A calm glided over the ocean of your appetites. Slowly the weary eyelids sank over the life extinguished under them. The tension crept out unperceived from the rounded limbs. The boisterous waves dried up in the heart. The folded hands themselves rested a powerless weight on the unresisting bosom. One last faint, oh dear, moaned itself away, and the soul was at rest. You fell asleep to awake in the morning to a new combat and a new prayer. Now the habit of renunciation cools the heat of your desire, and the roses of your youth are growing pale in the chlorosis of your heavenliness. The soul is saved, the body may perish. O Laius, O Ninon, how well you did to scorn this pale virtue. One free grisette against a thousand virgins grown gray in virtue. The fixed idea may also be perceived as maxim, principle, standpoint, and the like. Archimedes, to move the earth, asked for a standpoint outside it. Men sought continually for this standpoint, and every one seized upon it as well as he was able. This foreign standpoint is the world of mind, of ideas, thoughts, concepts, essences. It is heaven. Heaven is the standpoint from which the earth is moved, earthly doings surveyed and despised. To assure to themselves heaven, to occupy the heavenly standpoint firmly and forever, how painfully and tirelessly humanity struggled for this. Christianity has aimed to deliver us from a life determined by nature, from the appetites as actuating us, and has so meant that man should not let himself be determined by his appetites. This does not involve the idea that he was not to have appetites, but that the appetites were not to have him, that they were not to become fixed, uncontrollable, indissoluble, now, could not what Christianity, religion, contrived against the appetites be applied to us to its own precept that mind, thought, conceptions, ideas, faith, must determine us? Could we not ask that neither should mind, or the conception, the idea, be allowed to determine us, to become fixed and inviolable or sacred? Then it would end in the dissolution of mind, the dissolution of all thoughts, of all conceptions. As we there had to say, we are indeed to have appetites, but the appetites are not to have us. So we should now say, we are indeed to have mind, but mind is not to have us. If the latter seems lacking in sense, Think of the fact that with so many a man, a thought becomes a maxim, whereby he himself is made prisoner to it, so that it is not he that has the maxim, but rather it that has him. And with the maxim, he has a permanent standpoint again. The doctrines of the catechism become our principles before we find it out and no longer brook rejection. Their thought, or mind, has the sole power, and no protest of the flesh is further listened to. Nevertheless, it is only through the flesh that I can break the tyranny of mind, for it is only when a man hears his flesh along with the rest of him that he hears himself wholly, 
and it is only when he hears himself that he is a hearing or rational being. The Christian does not hear the agony of his enthralled nature, but lives in humility. Therefore, he does not grumble at the wrong which befalls his person. He thinks himself satisfied with the freedom of the spirit. But, if the flesh once takes the floor, and its tone is passionate, indecorous, not well disposed, spiteful, as it cannot be otherwise, then he thinks he hears voices of devils, voices against the spirit, for decorum, passionlessness, kindly disposition, and the like, is spirit, and is justly zealous against them. He could not be a Christian if he were willing to endure them. He listens only to morality and slaps unmorality in the mouth. He listens only to legality and gags the lawless word. The spirit of morality and legality holds him a prisoner, a rigid, unbending master. They call that the mastery of the spirit. It is at the same time the standpoint of the spirit. And now whom do the ordinary liberal gentlemen mean to make free? Whose freedom is it that they cry out and thirst for? The spirits. That of the spirit of morality, legality, piety, the fear of God. That is what the anti-liberal gentlemen also want, and the whole contention between the two turns on a matter of advantage, whether the latter are to be the only speakers, or the former are to receive a share in the enjoyment of the same advantage. The spirit remains the absolute lord for both, and their only quarrel is over who shall occupy the hierarchical throne that pertains to the vice-regent of the Lord. The best of it is that one can calmly look upon the stir with the certainty that the wild beasts of history will tear each other to pieces just like those of nature. Their putrefying corpses fertilize the ground for our crops. <laughs> we shall come back later to many other wheels in the head. For instance, those of vocation, truthfulness, love, and the like. When one's own is contrasted with what is imparted to him, there is no use in objecting that we cannot have anything isolated, but receive everything as a part of the universal order, and therefore through the impression of what is around us, and that consequently we have it as something imparted. For there is a great difference between the feelings and thoughts which are aroused in me by other things and those which are given to me. God, immortality, freedom, humanity, are drilled into us from childhood as thoughts and feelings which move our inner being more or less strongly, either ruling us without our knowing it, or sometimes in richer natures manifesting themselves in systems and works of art, but are always not aroused but imparted feelings, because we must believe in them and cling to them, that an absolute existed, and that it must be taken in, felt, and thought by us, was settled as a faith in the minds of those who spent all the strength of their mind on recognizing it and setting it forth. The feeling for the absolute exists there as an imparted one, and thenceforth results only in the most manifold revelations of itself. So in Klopstock, the religious feeling was an imparted one, which in the Messiad simply found artistic expression. If, on the other hand, the religion with which he was confronted had been for him only an incitation to feeling and thought, and if he had known how to take an attitude completely his own toward it, then there would have resulted, instead of religious inspiration, a dissolution and consumption of the religion itself. 
Instead of that, he only continued in mature years his childish feelings received in childhood, and squandered the powers of his manhood in decking out his childish trifles. The difference is, then, whether feelings are imparted to me or only aroused. Those feelings which are aroused are my own, egoistic, because they are not as feelings drilled into me, dictated to me, and pressed upon me. But those which are imparted to me I receive with open arms. I cherish them in me as a heritage, cultivate them, and am possessed by them. Who is there that has never, more or less consciously, Notice that our whole education is calculated to produce feelings in us, impart them to us, instead of leaving their production to ourselves, however they may turn out. If we hear the name of God, we are to feel veneration. If we hear that of the Prince's majesty, it is to be received with reverence, deference, submission. If we hear that of morality, we are to think that we hear something inviolable, if we hear of the evil one, or evil ones, we are to shudder. The intention is directed to these feelings, and he who should hear with pleasure the deeds of the bad would have to be taught what's what with the rod of discipline. Thus stuffed with imparted feelings, we appear before the bar of majority and are pronounced of age. Our equipment consists of elevated feelings, lofty thoughts, inspiring maxims, eternal principles. The young are of age when they twitter like the old. They are driven through school to learn the old song. And when they have this by heart, they are declared of age. We must not feel at every thing and every name that comes before us what we could and would like to feel thereat. At the name of God, we must think of nothing laughable, feel nothing disrespectful, it being prescribed and imparted to us what and how we are to feel and think at the mention of that name. That is the meaning of the care of souls, that my soul, or my mind, be tuned as others think right, not as I myself would like. How much trouble does it not cost one, finally to secure to oneself a feeling of one's own at the mention of at least this or that name? and to laugh in the face of many who expect from us a holy face and a composed expression at their speeches. What is imparted is alien to us. It is not our own, and therefore is sacred, and it is hard work to lay aside the sacred dread of it. Today one again hears seriousness praised. Seriousness in the presence of highly important subjects and discussions, German seriousness, and so on. This sort of seriousness proclaims clearly how old and grave lunacy and possession have already become. For there is nothing more serious than a lunatic when he comes to the central point of his lunacy. Then his great earnestness incapacitates him for taking a joke. See Madhouses. End of section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A, Subdivision 3, The Hierarchy. The historical reflections on our Mongolism which I propose to insert episodically at this place, are not given with the claim of thoroughness, or even of approved soundness, but solely because it seems to me that they may contribute toward making the rest clear. The history of the world, whose shaping properly belongs altogether to the Caucasian race, 
seems till now to have run through two Caucasian ages, in the first of which we had to work out and work off our innate negroidity. This was followed in the second by mongoloidity, Chineseness, which must likewise be terribly made an end of. Negroidity represents antiquity, the time of dependence on things, on cocks eating, birds flight, on sneezing, on thunder and lightning, on the rustling of sacred trees, and so forth. Mongoloidity, the time of dependence on thoughts, the Christian time. Reserved for the future are the words, I am owner of the world of things, and I am owner of the world of mind. In the Negroid age fall the campaigns of Sesostris and the importance of Egypt and of northern Africa in general. To the Mongoloid age belong the invasions of the Huns and Mongols, up to the Russians. The value of me cannot possibly be rated high so long as the hard diamond of the not me bears so enormous a price as was the case both with God and with the world. The not me is still too stony and indomitable to be consumed and absorbed by me. Rather, men only creep about with extraordinary bustle on this immovable entity on this substance, like parasitic animals on a body from whose juices they draw nourishment, yet without consuming it. It is the bustle of vermin, the assiduity of Mongolians. Among the Chinese, we know, everything remains as it used to be, and nothing essential or substantial suffers a change. All the more actively do they work away at that which remains, which bears the name of the old, ancestors, and the like. Accordingly, in our Mongolian age, all change has been only reformatory or ameliorative, not destructive or consuming and annihilating. The substance, the object, remains. All our assiduity was only the activity of ants and the hopping of fleas, jugglers' tricks on the immovable tightrope of the objective, corvée service under the leadership of the unchangeable or eternal. The Chinese are doubtless the most positive nation, because totally buried in precepts, but neither has the Christian age come out from the positive, from limited freedom freedom within certain limits. In the most advanced stage of civilization, this activity earns the name of scientific activity, of working on a motionless presupposition, a hypothesis that is not to be upset. In its first and most unintelligible form, morality shows itself as habit. To act according to the habit and usage, mores, of one's country is to be moral there. Therefore, pure moral action, clear, unadulterated morality, is most straightforwardly practiced in China. They keep to the old habit and usage and hate each innovation as a crime worthy of death. For innovation is the deadly enemy of habit, of the old, of permanence. In fact, too, it admits of no doubt that through habit man secures himself against the obtrusiveness of things, of the world, and forms a world of his own, in which alone he is and feels at home, builds himself a heaven. Why, heaven has no other meaning than that it is a man's proper home, in which nothing alien regulates and rules him any longer, no influence of the earthly any longer makes him himself alien. In short, in which the dross of the earthly is thrown off, and the combat against the world has found an end, in which, therefore, nothing is any longer denied him. 
Heaven is the end of abnegation. It is free enjoyment. There, man no longer denies himself anything, because nothing is any longer alien and hostile to him. But now habit is a second nature, which detaches and frees man from his first and original natural condition, in securing him against every casualty of it. The fully elaborated habit of the Chinese has provided for all emergencies, and everything is looked out for. Whatever may come, the Chinaman always knows how he has to behave, and does not need to decide first according to the circumstances. No unforeseen case throws him down from the heaven of his rest. The morally habituated and inured Chinaman is not surprised and taken off his guard. He behaves with equanimity, that is, with equal spirit or temper, toward everything, because his temper, protected by the precaution of his traditional usage, does not lose its balance. Hence, on the ladder of culture or civilization, humanity mounts the first round through habit, and, as it conceives that, in climbing to culture, it is at the same time climbing to heaven, the realm of culture or second nature. It really mounts the first round of the ladder to heaven. If Mongoldom has settled the existence of spiritual beings, if it has created a world of spirits, a heaven. The Caucasians have wrestled for thousands of years with these spiritual beings, to get to the bottom of them. What were they doing then, but building on Mongolian ground? They have not built on sand, but in the air. They have wrestled with Mongolism, stormed the Mongolian heaven, Tian. When will they at last annihilate this heaven? When will they at last become really Caucasians and find themselves? When will the immortality of the soul, which in these latter days thought it was giving itself still more security if it presented itself as an immortality of mind, at last change to the mortality of mind? It was when, in the industrious struggle of the Mongolian race, men had built a heaven, that those of the Caucasian race, since in their Mongolian complexion they have to do with heaven, took upon themselves the opposite task, the task of storming that heaven of custom, heaven-storming activity, to dig under all human ordinance in order to set up a new and better one on the cleared site to wreck all customs in order to put up new and better customs in their place. Their act is limited to this. But is it thus already purely and really what it aspires to be? And does it reach its final aim? No. In this creation of a better, it is tainted with Mongolism. It storms heaven only to make a heaven again, it overthrows an old power only to legitimate a new power. It only improves. Nevertheless, the point aimed at, often as it may vanish from the eyes at every new attempt, is the real, complete downfall of heaven, customs. In short, of man secured only against the world, of the isolation or inwardness of man. Through the heaven of culture, man seeks to isolate himself from the world, to break its hostile power. But this isolation of heaven must likewise be broken, and the true end of heaven storming is the downfall of heaven, the annihilation of heaven. Improving and reforming is the Mongolism of the Caucasian because thereby he is always getting up again what already existed. To it, a precept, a generality, a heaven. He harbors the most irreconcilable enmity to heaven, and yet builds new heavens daily, piling heaven on heaven. He only crushes one by another. 
the Jews' heaven destroys the Greeks, the Christians the Jews, the Protestants the Catholics. If the heaven-storming men of Caucasian blood throw off their Mongolian skin, they will bury the emotional man under the ruins of the monstrous world of emotion, the isolated man under his isolated world, the paradisaical man under his heaven. And heaven is the realm of spirits, the realm of freedom of the spirit. The realm of heaven, the realm of spirits and ghosts, has found its right standing in the speculative philosophy. Here it was stated as the realm of thoughts, concepts, and ideas. Heaven is peopled with thoughts and ideas. And this realm of spirits is then the true reality. To want to win freedom for the spirit is Mongolism. Freedom of the spirit is Mongolian freedom. Freedom of feeling, moral freedom, and so forth. We may find the word morality taken as synonymous with spontaneity, self-determination. But that is not involved in it. Rather has the Caucasian shown himself spontaneous only in spite of his Mongolian morality. The Mongolian heaven, or morals, remained the strong castle, and only by storming incessantly at this castle did the Caucasian show himself moral. If he had not had to do with morals at all any longer, if he had not had therein his indomitable, continual enemy, the relation to morals would cease, and consequently morality would cease. That his spontaneity is still a moral spontaneity, therefore, is just the mongoloidity of it, is a sign that in it he has not arrived at himself. Moral spontaneity corresponds entirely with religious and orthodox philosophy constitutional monarchy, the Christian state, freedom within certain limits, the limited freedom of the press, or, in a figure, to the hero fettered to a sickbed. Man has not really vanquished shamanism and its spooks till he possesses the strength to lay aside not only the belief in ghosts or in spirits, but also the belief in the spirit. He who believes in a spook no more assumes the introduction of a higher world than he who believes in the spirit, and both seek behind the sensual world a supersensual one. In short, they produce and believe another world, and this other world the product of their mind is a spiritual world, for their senses grasp and know nothing of another, a non-sensual world. Only their spirit lives in it. Going on from this Mongolian belief in the existence of spiritual beings to the point that the proper being of man, too, is his spirit, and that all care must be directed to this alone, to the welfare of his soul is not hard. Influence on the spirit, so-called moral influence, is hereby assured. Hence it is manifest that Mongolism represents utter absence of any rights of the sensuous, represents non-sensuousness and unnature, and that sin and the consciousness of sin was our Mongolian torment that lasted thousands of years. But who then will dissolve the spirit into its nothing? He who by means of the spirit set forth nature as the null, finite, transitory, he alone can bring down the spirit too to like nullity. I can. Each one among you can who does his will as an absolute I. In a word, the egoist can. 
Before the sacred, people lose all sense of power and all confidence. They occupy a powerless and humble attitude toward it. And yet no thing is sacred of itself, but by my declaring it sacred, by my declaration, my judgment, my bending the knee, in short, by my conscience. Sacred is everything which for the egoist is to be unapproachable, not to be touched, outside his power, above him. Sacred, in a word, is every matter of conscience. For this is a matter of conscience to me, means simply, I hold this sacred. For little children, as for animals, nothing sacred exists. Because in order to make room for this conception, one must already have progressed so far in understanding that he can make distinctions like good and bad, warranted and unwarranted. Only at such a level of reflection or intelligence, the proper standpoint of religion, can unnatural, that is, brought into existence by thinking, reverence, sacred dread, step into the place of natural fear. To this sacred dread belongs holding something outside oneself for mightier, greater, better warranted, better. The attitude in which one acknowledges the might of something alien, not merely feels it, then, but expressly acknowledges it, admits it, yields, surrenders, lets himself be tied. Devotion, humility, servility, submission. Here walks the whole ghostly troop of the Christian virtues. Everything toward which you cherish any respect or reverence deserves the name of sacred. You yourself, too, say that you would feel a sacred dread of laying hands on it. And you give this tinge even to the unholy, gallows, crime, etc. You have a horror of touching it. There lies in it something uncanny, that is, unfamiliar, or not your own. If something or other did not rank as sacred in a man's mind, why, then all bars would be let down to self-will, to unlimited subjectivity. Fear makes the beginning, and one can make himself fearful to the coarsest man. Already, therefore, a barrier against his insolence. But in fear there always remains the attempt to liberate oneself from what is feared, by guile, deception, tricks, etc. In reverence, on the contrary, it is quite otherwise. Here something is not only feared, but also honored. What is feared has become an inward power which I can no longer get clear of. I honor it and captivated by it and devoted to it, belong to it. By the honor which I pay it, I am completely in its power and do not even attempt liberation any longer. Now I am attached to it with all the strength of faith. I believe. I and what I fear are one. Not I live, but the respected lives in me. Because the spirit, the infinite, does not allow of coming to any end, therefore it is stationary. It fears dying. It cannot let go its dear Jesus. The greatness of finiteness is no longer recognized by its blinded eye. The object of fear, now raised to veneration, may no longer be handled. Reverence is made eternal. The respected is deified. The man is now no longer employed in creating, but in learning, knowing, investigating. 
occupied with a fixed object, losing himself in its depths, without returning to himself. The relation to this object is that of knowing, fathoming, basing, not that of dissolution, abrogation. Man is to be religious. That is settled. Therefore, people busy themselves only with the question how this is to be attained, what is the right meaning of religiousness, etc. Quite otherwise, when one makes the axiom itself doubtful and calls it in question, even though it should go to smash. Morality, too, is such a sacred conception. One must be moral and must look only for the right how the right way to be so. One dares not go at morality itself with the question whether it is not itself an illusion. It remains exalted above all doubt, unchangeable. And so we go on with the sacred, grade after grade, from the holy to the holiest of holies. End of section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A, Continuation of Subdivision 3, The Hierarchy Men are sometimes divided into two classes, cultured and uncultured. The former, so far as they were worthy of their name, occupied themselves with thoughts, with mind, and, because in the time since Christ of which the very principle is thought, they were the ruling ones, demanded a servile respect for the thoughts recognized by them. State, emperor, church, God, morality, order, are such thoughts or spirits that exist only for the mind. A merely living being, an animal, cares as little for them as a child, but the uncultured are really nothing but children, and he who attends only to the necessities of his life is indifferent to those spirits. But, because he is also weak before them, he succumbs to their power and is ruled by thoughts. This is the meaning of hierarchy. Hierarchy is dominion of thoughts, dominion of mind. We are hierarchic to this day, kept down by those who are supported by thoughts. Thoughts are the sacred. But the two are always clashing, now one and now the other giving the offense. And this clash occurs not only in the collision of two men, but in one and the same man. For no cultured man is so cultured is not to find enjoyment in things too, and so be uncultured, and no uncultured man is totally without thoughts. In Hegel it comes to light at last what a longing for things even the most cultured man has, and what a horror of every hollow theory he harbors. With him reality, the world of things, is altogether to correspond to the thought and no concept is to be without reality. This caused Hegel's system to be known as the most objective, as if in it thought and thing celebrated their union. But this was simply the extremest case of violence on the part of thought, its highest pitch of despotism and soul dominion, the triumph of mind, and with it the triumph of philosophy. Philosophy cannot hereafter achieve anything higher, 
for its highest is the omnipotence of mind, the almightiness of mind. Steiner's footnote. Rousseau, the philanthropists, and others were hostile to culture and intelligence, but they overlooked the fact that this is present in all men of the Christian type and assailed only learned and refined culture. End footnote. Spiritual men have taken into their head something that is to be realized. They have concepts of love, goodness, and the like, which they would like to see realized. Therefore, they want to set up a kingdom of love on earth, in which no one any longer acts from selfishness, but each one from love. Love is to rule. What have they taken into their head? What shall we call it but fixed idea? Why, their head is haunted. The most oppressive spook is man. Think of the proverb, the road to ruin is paved with good intentions. The intention to realize humanity altogether in oneself, to become altogether man, is of such ruinous kind. Here belong the intentions to become good, noble, loving, and so forth. In the sixth part of the Denkwürdigkeiten, page 7, Bruno Bauer says, quote, That middle class, which was to receive such a terrible importance for modern history, is capable of no self-sacrificing action, no enthusiasm for an idea, no exaltation. It devotes itself to nothing but the interests of its mediocrity, i.e., it remains always limited to itself, and conquers at last only through its bulk, with which it has succeeded in tiring out the efforts of passion, enthusiasm, consistency, through its surface, into which it absorbs a part of the new ideas. End quote. And, page 6, quote, It has turned the revolutionary ideas for which not it, but unselfish or impassioned men sacrifice themselves, solely to its own profit, has turned spirit into money. That is, to be sure, after it has taken away from those ideas their point, their consistency, their destructive seriousness, fanatical against all egoism, end quote. These people, then, are not self-sacrificing, not enthusiastic, not idealistic, not consistent, not zealots. They are egoists in the usual sense, selfish people, looking out for their advantage, sober, calculating. Who, then, is self-sacrificing? In the fullest sense, surely, he who ventures everything else for one thing, one object, one will, one passion. Is not the lover self-sacrificing, who forsakes father and mother, endures all dangers and privations to reach his goal? Or the ambitious man, who offers up all his desires, wishes, and satisfactions to the single passion, or the avaricious man, who denies himself everything to gather treasures. Or the pleasure seeker, he is ruled by a passion to which he brings the rest as sacrifices. And are these self-sacrificing people perchance not selfish, not egoist? As they have only one ruling passion, so they provide for only one satisfaction, but for this the more strenuously. They are wholly absorbed in it. Their entire activity is egoistic, but it is a one-sided, unopened, narrow egoism. 
it is possessedness. Why, those are petty passions, by which, on the contrary, man must not let himself be enthralled. Man must make sacrifices for a great idea, a great cause. A great idea, a good cause, is, it may be, the honor of God, for which innumerable people have met death. Christianity, which has found its willing martyrs, the Holy Catholic Church, which has greedily demanded sacrifices of heretics, liberty and equality, which were waited on by bloody guillotines. He who lives for a great idea, a great cause, a doctrine, a system, a lofty calling, may not let any worldly lusts, any self-seeking interest, spring up in him. Here we have the concept of clericalism, or, as it may be also called in its pedagogic activity, schoolmasterliness, for the idealists play the schoolmaster over us. The clergyman is especially called to live to the idea and to work for the idea, the truly good cause. Therefore the people feel how little it befits him to show worldly haughtiness, to desire good living, to join in such pleasures as dancing and gaming. In short, to have any other than a sacred interest. Hence, too, doubtless, is derived the scanty salary of teachers, who are to feel themselves repaid by the sacredness of their calling alone and to renounce other enjoyments. Even a directory of the sacred ideas, one or more of which man is to look upon as his calling, is not lacking. Family, fatherland, science, etc., may find in me a faithful servant to his calling. Here we come upon the old, old craze of the world which has not yet learned to do without clericalism, that to live and work for an idea is man's calling, and according to the faithfulness of its fulfillment, his human worth is measured. This is the dominion of the idea. In other words, it is clericalism. Thus Robespierre and Jean Just were priests through and through, inspired by the idea, enthusiasts, consistent instruments of the idea, idealistic men. So Saint Just claims in a speech, there is something terrible in the sacred love of country. It is so exclusive that it sacrifices everything to the public interest without mercy, without fear, without human consideration. It hurls Manlius down the precipice, it sacrifices its private inclinations. It leads Regulus to Carthage, throws a Roman into the chasm, and sets Marat, as a victim of his devotion, in the Pantheon. Now, over these representatives of ideal or sacred interests stands a world of innumerable personal, profane interests. No idea, no system, no sacred cause is so great as never to be outrivaled and modified by these personal interests. Even if they are silent momentarily, and in times of rage and fanaticism, yet they soon come uppermost again through the sound sense of the people. Those ideas do not completely conquer till they are no longer hostile to personal interests, till they satisfy egoism. The man who is just now crying herrings in front of my window has a personal interest in good sales, and, if his wife or anyone else wishes him the like, this remains a personal interest all the same. If, on the other hand, a thief deprived him of his basket, then there would at once arise an interest of the many, of the whole city, of the whole country, or in a word, 
of all who abhor theft, an interest in which the herring seller's person would become indifferent, and in its place the category of the robbed man would come into the foreground. But even here all might yet resolve itself into a personal interest, each of the partakers reflecting that he must concur in the punishment of the thief, because unpunished stealing might otherwise become general and cause him too to lose his own. Such a calculation, however, can hardly be assumed on the part of many, and we shall rather hear the cry that the thief is a criminal. Here we have before us a judgment, the thief's action receiving its expression in the concept crime. Now the matter stands thus. Even if a crime did not cause the slightest damage either to me or to any of those in whom I take an interest, I should nevertheless denounce it. Why? Because I am enthusiastic for morality, filled with the idea of morality. What is hostile to it, I everywhere assail. Because in his mind, theft ranks as abominable without any question. Proudhon, for instance, thinks that with the sentence, property is theft, he has at once put a brand on property. In the sense of the priestly, theft is always a crime, or at least a misdeed. Here the personal interest is at an end. This particular person who has stolen the basket is perfectly indifferent to my person. It is only the thief, this concept of which that person represents a specimen, that I take an interest in. The thief and man are in my mind irreconcilable opposites. For one is not truly man when one is a thief. One degrades man or humanity in himself when one steals. Dropping out of personal concern, one gets into philanthropism, friendliness to man, which is usually misunderstood as if it were a love to men, to each individual, while it is nothing but a love of man, the unreal concept, the spook. It is not tus anthropus, men, but ton anthropon, man, that the philanthropist carries in his heart. To be sure, he cares for each individual, but only because he wants to see his beloved ideal realized everywhere. So there is nothing said here of care for me, you, us. That would be personal interest and belongs under the head of worldly love. Philanthropism is a heavenly, spiritual, a priestly love. Man must be restored in us, even if thereby we poor devils should come to grief. It is the same priestly principle as that famous fiat justitia, periat mundus. Man and justice are ideas, ghosts, for love of which everything is sacrificed. Therefore, the priestly spirits are the self-sacrificing ones. He who is infatuated with man leaves persons out of account as far as that infatuation extends and floats in an ideal, sacred interest. Man, you see, is not a person, but an ideal, a spook. Now things as different as possible can belong to man and be so regarded. If one finds man's chief requirement in piety, there arises religious clericalism. If one sees it in morality, then moral clericalism raises its head. On this account, the priestly spirits of our day want to make a religion of everything, a religion of liberty, religion of equality, etc. And for them, every idea becomes a sacred cause, even citizenship, politics, publicity, freedom of the press, trial by jury. Now what does unselfishness mean in this sense? Having only an ideal interest, 
before which no respect of persons avails. The stiff head of the worldly man opposes this, but for centuries has always been worsted at least so far as to have to bend the unruly neck and honor the higher power. Clericalism pressed it down. When the worldly egoist had shaken off a higher power, such as the Old Testament law, the Roman Pope, then at once a seven times greater one was over him again, such as faith in the place of the law, the transformation of all laymen into divines in place of the limited body of clergy, and so on. His experience was like that of the possessed man into whom seven devils passed when he thought he had freed himself from one. In the passage quoted above, all ideality is denied to the middle class. It certainly schemed against the ideal consistency with which Robespierre wanted to carry out the principle. The instinct of its interest told it that this consistency harmonized too little with what its mind was set on, and that it would be acting against itself if it were willing to further the enthusiasm for principle. Was it to behave so unselfishly as to abandon all its aims in order to bring a harsh theory to its triumph? It suits the priests admirably, to be sure, when people listen to their summons, cast away everything and follow me, or sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Some decided idealists obey this call but most act like Ananias and Sapphira, maintaining a behavior half clerical or religious and half worldly, serving God and mammon. I do not blame the middle class for not wanting to let its aims be frustrated by Robespierre, for inquiring of its egoism how far it might give the revolutionary idea a chance. But one might blame, if blame were in place here anyhow, those who let their own interests be frustrated by the interests of the middle class. However, will not they likewise sooner or later learn to understand what is to their advantage? August Becker says, To win the producers, proletarians, a negation of the traditional conception of right is by no means enough. Folks unfortunately care little for the theoretical victory of the idea. One must demonstrate to them, ad oculos, how this victory can be practically utilized in life, end quote. And, quote, you must get hold of folks by their real interests if you want to work upon them, end quote. Immediately after this, he shows how a fine looseness of morals is already spreading among our peasants, because they prefer to follow their real interests rather than the commands of morality. Because the revolutionary priests or schoolmasters served man, they cut off the heads of men. The revolutionary laymen, those outside the sacred circle, did not feel any great horror of cutting off heads, but were less anxious about the rights of man than about their own. How comes it, though, that the egoism of those who affirm personal interest and always inquire of it is nevertheless forever succumbing to a priestly or schoolmasterly, that is an ideal, interest. Their person seems to them too small, too insignificant, and is so in fact, to lay claim to everything and be able to put itself completely in force. There is a sure sign of this in their dividing themselves into two persons, an eternal and a temporal, always caring either only for the one or only for the other, on Sunday for the eternal, on the workday for the temporal, in prayer for the former, in work for the latter. They have the priest in themselves, therefore they do not get rid of him, but hear themselves lectured inwardly every Sunday. How men have struggled and calculated to get at a solution regarding these dualistic essences, Idea followed upon idea, principle upon principle, system upon system, and none knew how to keep down permanently the contradiction of the worldly man, the so-called egoist. 
Does not this prove that all those ideas were too feeble to take up my whole will into themselves and satisfy it? They were and remained hostile to me, even if the hostility lay concealed for a considerable time. Will it be the same with self-ownership? Is it, too, only an attempt at mediation? Whatever principle I turned to, it might be to that of reason. I always had to turn away from it again. Or can I always be rational? Arrange my life according to reason and everything? I can, no doubt, strive after rationality. I can love it, just as I can also love God and every other idea. I can be a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, as I love God. But what I love, what I strive for, is only in my idea, my conception, my thoughts. It is in my heart, my head. It is in me like the heart, but it is not I. I am not it. To the activity of priestly minds belongs especially what one often hears called moral influence. Moral influence takes a start where humiliation begins. Yes, it is nothing else than this humiliation itself, the breaking and bending of the temper down to humility. If I call to someone to run away when a rock is to be blasted, I exert no moral influence by this demand. If I say to a child, you will go hungry if you will not eat what is put on the table, this is not moral influence. But if I say to it, you will pray, honor your parents, respect the crucifix, speak the truth, for this belongs to man and is man's calling, or even this is God's will, then moral influence is complete. Then a man is to bend before the calling of man, be tractable, become humble, give up his will for an alien one which is set up as a rule and law. He is to abase himself before something higher, self-abasement. He that abaseth himself shall be exalted. Yes, yes, children must early be made to practice piety godliness, and propriety. A person of good breeding is one into whom good maxims have been instilled and impressed, poured in through a funnel, thrashed in and preached in. If one shrugs his shoulders at this, at once the good wring their hands despairingly and cry, But for heaven's sake, if one is to give children no good instruction, why, then they will run straight into the jaws of sin and become good-for-nothing hoodlums. Gently, you prophets of evil. Good-for-nothing in your sense they certainly will become, but your sense happens to be a very good-for-nothing sense. The impudent lads will no longer let anything be whined and chattered into them by you, and will have no sympathy for all the follies for which you have been raving and driveling since the memory of man began. They will abolish the law of inheritance. They will not be willing to inherit your stupidities as you inherited them from your fathers. They destroy inherited sin. Now, I've only been reading Stirner's footnotes, but here's an important footnote from the translator and editor. Footnote called in English theology, original sin, and footnote. If you command them, bend before the Most High, they will answer. If he wants to bend us, let him come himself and do it. We, at least, will not bend of our own accord. And if you threaten them with his wrath and his punishment, they will take it like being threatened with the boogeyman. If you are no more successful in making them afraid of ghosts, then the dominion of ghosts is at an end, and nurses' tales find no faith. And is it not precisely the liberals again that press for good education and improvement of the educational system? For how could their liberalism, 
their liberty within the bounds of law, come about without discipline, even if they do not exactly educate to the fear of God, yet they demand the fear of man all the more strictly, and awaken enthusiasm for the truly human calling by discipline. A long time passed away, in which people were satisfied with the fancy that they had the truth, without thinking seriously whether perhaps they themselves must be true to possess the truth. This time was the Middle Ages. With the common consciousness, the consciousness which deals with things, that consciousness which has receptivity only for things, or for what is sensuous and sense-moving, they thought to grasp what did not deal with things and what was not perceptible by the senses. As one does indeed also exert his eye to see the remote, or laboriously exercise his hand till its fingers have become dexterous enough to press the keys correctly. So they chasten themselves in the most manifold ways, in order to become capable of receiving the supersensual wholly into themselves. But what they chastened was, after all, only the sensual man, the common consciousness, so-called finite or objective thought. Yet is this thought, this understanding, which Luther decries under the name of reason, is incapable of comprehending the divine. Its chastening contributed just as much to the understanding of the truth as if one exercised the feet year in and year out in dancing and hoped that in this way they would finally learn to play the flute. Luther with whom the so-called Middle Ages end, was the first who understood that the man himself must become other than he was if he wanted to comprehend truth, must become as true as truth itself. Only he who already has truth in his belief, only he who believes in it, can become a partaker of it. Only the believer finds it accessible and sounds its depths. Only that organ of man which is able to blow can attain the further capacity of flute playing, and only the man can become a partaker of truth who has the right organ for it. He who is capable of thinking only what is sensuous, objective, pertaining to things, figures to himself in truth only what pertains to things. But truth is spirit, stuff altogether inappreciable by the senses, and therefore only for the higher consciousness, not for that which is earthly-minded. With Luther, accordingly, dawns the perception that truth, because it is a thought, is only for the thinking man. And this is to say that man must henceforth take an utterly different standpoint, to wit, the heavenly, believing, scientific standpoint, or that of thought in relation to its object, the thought, that of mind in relation to mind. Consequently, only the like apprehend the like. You are like the spirit that you understand. Because Protestantism broke the medieval hierarchy, the opinion could take root that hierarchy in general had been shattered by it, and it could be wholly overlooked that it was precisely a reformation, and so a reinvigoration of the antiquated hierarchy. That medieval hierarchy had been only a weakly one, as it had to let all possible barbarism of unsanctified things run on uncoerced beside it, and it was the Reformation that first steeled the power of hierarchy. If Bruno Bauer thinks, quote, as the Reformation was mainly the abstract rendering of the religious principle from art, state, and science, and so its liberation from those powers with which it had joined itself in the antiquity of the Church, and in the hierarchy of the Middle Ages, 
so too the theological and ecclesiastical movements which proceeded from the Reformation are only the consistent carrying out of this abstraction of the religious principle from the other powers of humanity. End quote. I regard, precisely, the opposite as correct, and think that the dominion of spirits, or freedom of mind, which comes to the same thing, was never before so all-embracing and all-powerful, because the present one, instead of rending the religious principle from art, state, and science, lifted the latter altogether out of secularity, into the realm of spirit, and made them religious. Luther and Descartes have been appropriately put side by side, in their He Who Believes in God, and I Think, Therefore I Am, Cogito Ergo Sum. Man's heaven is thought, mind. Everything can be wrested from him, except thought, except faith. Particular faith, like faith of Zeus, Astarte, Jehovah, Allah, may be destroyed but faith itself is indestructible. In thought is freedom. What I need and what I hunger for is no longer granted to me by any grace, by the Virgin Mary, by intercession of the saints, or by the binding and loosing church, but I procure it for myself. In short, my being, the sum, is a living in the heaven of thought, of mind, a cogitare. But I myself am nothing other than mind, thinking mind, according to Descartes, believing mind, according to Luther. My body I am not. My flesh may suffer from appetites or pains. I am not my flesh, but I am mind, only mind. This thought runs through the history of the Reformation till today. Only by the more modern philosophy since Descartes has a serious effort been made to bring Christianity to complete efficacy, by exalting the scientific consciousness to be the only true and valid one. Hence it begins with absolute doubt, dubitare, with grinding common consciousness to atoms, with turning away from everything that mind, thought, does not legitimate. To it, nature counts for nothing, and it does not rest till it has brought reason into everything, and can say, the real is the rational, and only the rational is the real. Thus it has at last brought mind, reason, to victory. And everything is mind, because everything is rational. Because all nature, as well as even the perversest opinions of men, contains reason. For all must serve for the best, that is, lead to the victory of reason. Descartes' dubitare contains the decided statement that only cogitare, thought, mind, is. A complete break with common consciousness, which ascribes reality to irrational things. Only the rational is. Only mind is. This is the principle of modern philosophy. The genuine Christian principle. Descartes, in his own time, discriminated the body sharply from the mind, and the spirit tis that builds itself the body, says Goethe. But this philosophy itself, Christian philosophy, still does not get rid of the rational, and therefore inveighs against the merely subjective, against fantasies, fortuities, arbitrariness, etc. What it wants is that the divine should become visible in everything, 
and all consciousness become a knowing of the divine. And man, behold God everywhere. But God never is without the devil. For this very reason, the name of philosopher is not to be given to him, who has indeed opened eyes for the things of the world, a clear and undazzled gaze, a correct judgment about the world, but who sees in the world just the world, in objects, only objects, and in short, everything prosaically as it is. But he alone is a philosopher who sees and points out or demonstrates heaven in the world, the supernal in the earthly, the divine in the mundane. The former may be ever so wise. There is no getting away from this. Quote, what wise men see not by their wisdom's art is practiced simply by a childlike heart. It takes this childlike heart, this eye for the divine, to make a philosopher. The first named man has only a common consciousness, but he who knows the divine and knows how to tell it as a scientific one. On this ground, Bacon was turned out of the realm of philosophers. And certainly what is called English philosophy seems to have got no further than to the discoveries of so-called clear heads, such as Bacon and Hume. The English did not know how to exalt the simplicity of the childlike heart to philosophic significance, did not know how to make philosophers out of childlike hearts. This is as much as to say, their philosophy was not able to become theological or theology, and yet it is only as theology that it can really live itself out, complete itself. The field of its battle to the death is in theology. Bacon did not trouble himself about theological questions and cardinal points. End of this section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A, Continuation of Subdivision 3, The Hierarchy. Cognition as its object in life. German thought seeks, more than that of others, to reach the beginnings and fountainheads of life, and sees no life till it sees it in cognition itself. Descartes' cogito ergo sum has the meaning, one lives only when one thinks. Thinking life is called intellectual life. Only mind lives. Its life is the true life. Then, just so in nature only the eternal laws, the mind or the reason of nature, are its true life. In man, as in nature, only the thought lives. Everything else is dead. To this abstraction, to the life of generalities or of that which is lifeless, the history of mind had to come. God, who is spirit, alone lives. Nothing lives but the ghost. 
How can one try to assert of modern philosophy or modern times that they have reached freedom, since they have not freed us from the power of objectivity? Or am I perhaps free from a despot when I am not afraid of the personal potentate, to be sure, but of every infraction of the loving reverence which I fancy I owe him? The case is the same with modern times. They only changed the existing objects, the real ruler, into conceived objects, into ideas, before which the old respect not only was not lost, but increased in intensity. Even if people snapped their fingers at God and the devil in their former crass reality, people devoted only the greater attention to their ideas. Quote, they are rid of the evil one. Evil is left. The decision having once been made not to let oneself be imposed on any longer by the extant and palpable, little scruple was felt about revolting against the existing state or overturning the existing laws, but to sin against the idea of the state, not to submit to the idea of law. Who would have dared that? So one remained a citizen and a law-respecting, loyal man. Yes, one seemed to himself to be only so much more law-respecting, the more rationalistically one abrogated the former defect of law in order to do homage to the spirit of the law. In all this, the objects had only suffered a change of form. They had remained in their preponderance and preeminence. In short, one was still involved in obedience and possessiveness, lived in reflection, and had an object on which one reflected, which one respected, and before which one felt reverence and fear. One had done nothing but transform the things into conceptions of the things, into thoughts and ideas whereby one's dependence became all the more intimate and indissoluble. Thus it is not hard to emancipate oneself from the commands of parents, or to set aside the admonitions of uncle and aunt, the entreaties of brother and sister. But the renounced obedience easily gets into one's conscience, and the less one does give way to the individual demands, because he rationistically, by his own reason, recognizes them to be unreasonable, so much the more conscientiously does he hold fast to filial piety and family love, and so much the harder is it for him to forgive himself a trespass against the conception which he has formed of family love and of filial duty. Released from dependence as regards the existing family, one falls into the more binding dependence on the idea of the family. One is ruled by the spirit of the family. The family consisting of John, Maggie, etc., whose dominion has become powerless, is only internalized, being left as family in general, to which one just applies the old saying, We must obey God rather than man, whose significance here is this. I cannot, to be sure, accommodate myself to your senseless requirements, but, as my family, you still remain the object of my love and care. For the family is a sacred idea, which the individual must never offend against. And this family, internalized and desensualized into a thought, a conception, now ranks as the sacred whose despotism is tenfold more grievous because it makes a racket in my conscience. This despotism is broken when the conception family also becomes a nothing to me. The Christian dicta, Woman, what have I to do with thee? I am come to stir up a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and others are accompanied by something that refers us to the heavenly or true family, and mean no more than the state's demand, in case of a collision between it and the family, 
we obey its commands. The case of morality is like that of the family. Many a man renounces morals, but with great difficulty the conception of morality. Morality is the idea of morals, their intellectual power, their power over the conscience. On the one hand, morals are too material to rule the mind, and do not fetter an intellectual man, a so-called independent, a free thinker. The Protestant may put it as he will. The Holy Scripture, the Word of God, still remains sacred for him. He for whom this is no longer holy has ceased to be a Protestant. But herewith, what is ordained in it, the public authorities appointed by God, etc., also remain sacred for him. For him these things remain indissoluble, unapproachable, raised above all doubt. And as doubt, which in practice becomes a buffeting, is what is most man's own, these things remain raised above himself. He who cannot get away from them will believe, for to believe in them is to be bound to them. Through the fact that in Protestantism the faith becomes a more inward faith, the servitude has also become a more inward servitude. One has taken those sanctities up into himself, entwined them with all his thoughts and endeavors, made them a matter of conscience, constructed out of them a sacred duty for himself. Therefore, what the Protestant's conscience cannot get away from is sacred to him, and conscientiousness most clearly designates his character. Protestantism has actually put a man in the position of a country governed by secret police. The spy and the eavesdropper, conscience, watches over every motion of the mind, and all thought and action is for it a matter of conscience, that is, police business. This tearing apart of man into natural impulse and conscience inner populace, and inner police, is what constitutes the Protestant. The reason of the Bible, in place of the Catholic reason of the Church, ranks as sacred, and this feeling and consciousness that the word of the Bible is sacred is called conscience. With this, then, sacredness is laid upon one's conscience. If one does not free himself from conscience, the consciousness of the sacred, he may act unconsciously indeed, but never conscienceless.ly The Catholic finds himself satisfied when he fulfills the command. The Protestant acts according to his best judgment and conscience. For the Catholic is only a layman. The Protestant is himself a clergyman. Just this is the progress of the Reformation period beyond the Middle Ages, and at the same time its curse, that the spiritual becomes complete. What else was the Jesuit moral philosophy than a continuation of the sale of indulgences? Only that the man who was relieved of his burden of sin now gained also an insight into the remission of sins, and convinced himself how really his sin was taken from him since in this or that particular case, casuists, it was so clearly no sin at all that he committed. The sale of indulgences had made all sins and transgressions permissible, and silenced every movement of conscience. All sensuality might hold sway if it was only purchased from the church. This favoring of sensuality was continued by the Jesuits, while the strictly moral, dark, fanatical, repentant, contrite, praying Protestants, as the true completers of Christianity, to be sure, acknowledged only the intellectual and spiritual man. Catholicism, especially the Jesuits, 
gave aid to egoism in this way found involuntary and unconscious adherence within Protestantism itself, and saved us from the subversion and extinction of sensuality. Nevertheless, the Protestant spirit spreads its dominion farther and farther, and as, beside it the divine, the Jesuit spirit represents only the diabolical, which is inseparable from everything divine. The latter can never assert itself alone, but must look on and see how in France, for example, the Philistinism or Protestantism wins at last, and mind is on top. Protestantism is usually complimented on having brought the mundane into repute again, such as marriage, the state, etc. But the mundane itself as mundane the secular, is even more indifferent to it than to Catholicism, which lets the profane world stand, yes, and relishes its pleasures, while the rational, consistent Protestant sets about annihilating the mundane altogether, and that simply by hollowing it. So marriage has been deprived of its naturalness by becoming sacred not in the sense of the Catholic sacrament, where it only receives its consecration from the Church, and so is unholy at bottom, but in the sense of being something sacred in itself to begin with, a sacred relation. Just so the state, also. Formerly the Pope gave consecration and his blessing to it and its princes. Now the state is intrinsically sacred, Majesty is sacred without needing the priest's blessing. The order of nature, or natural law, was altogether hallowed as God's ordinance. Hence it is said in the Augsburg Confession, Article 2, So now we reasonably abide by the saying, as the jurist consults have wisely and rightly said, that man and woman should be with each other is a natural law. Now, if it is a natural law, then it is God's ordinance, therefore implanted in nature, and therefore a divine law also. And is it anything more than Protestantism brought up to date? When Feuerbach pronounces moral relations sacred, not as God's ordinance indeed, but instead for the sake of the spirit that dwells in them? Quote, but marriage, as a free alliance of love, of course, is sacred of itself, by the nature of the union that is formed here. That marriage alone is a religious one, that is a true one, that corresponds to the essence of marriage, love. And so it is with all moral relations. They are ethical, are cultivated with a moral mind, only where they rank as religious of themselves. True friendship is only where the limits of friendship are preserved with religious conscientiousness, with the same conscientiousness with which the believer guards the dignity of his God. Friendship is and must be sacred for you, and property, and marriage, and the good of every man, but sacred in and of itself. End quote. That is a very essential consideration. In Catholicism, the mundane can indeed be consecrated or hallowed but it is not sacred without this priestly blessing. In Protestantism, on the contrary, mundane relations are sacred of themselves, sacred by their mere existence. The Jesuit maxim, the end hollows the means, corresponds precisely to the consecration by which sanctity is bestowed. No means are holy or unholy, in themselves, but their relation to the church, 
their use for the church hollows the means. Regicide was named as such. If it was committed for the church's behoof, it could be certain of being hollowed by the church, even if the hollowing was not openly pronounced. To the Protestant, majesty ranks as sacred. To the Catholic, only that majesty which is consecrated by the pontiff can rank as such, and it does rank as such to him only because the Pope, even though it be without a special act, confers this sacredness on it once and for all. If he retracted his consecration, the king would be left only a man of the world, or layman, an unconsecrated man, to the Catholic. If the Protestant seeks to discover a sacredness in the sensual itself, that he may then be linked only to what is holy, the Catholic strives rather to banish the sensual from himself into a separate domain, where it, like the rest of nature, keeps its value for itself. The Catholic Church eliminated mundane marriage from its consecrated order, and withdrew those who were its own from the mundane family. The Protestant Church declared marriage and family ties to be holy, and therefore not unsuitable for its clergymen. A Jesuit may, as a good Catholic, hollow everything. He needs only, for example, to say to himself, I, as a priest, am necessary to the Church but serve it more zealously when I appease my desires properly. Consequently, I will seduce this girl, have my enemy there poisoned, etc. My end is holy because it is a priest. Consequently, it hollows the means. <laughs> for in the end, it is still done for the benefit of the church. Why should the Catholic priest shrink from handing Emperor Henry VII the poisoned wafer for the church's welfare? The genuinely churchly Protestants invade against every innocent pleasure, because only the sacred, the spiritual, can be innocent. What they could not point out the Holy Spirit in, the Protestants had to reject. Dancing theater, ostentation in the church, and the like. Compared with this puritanical Calvinism, Lutheranism is again more on the religious, spiritual track, is more radical. For the former excludes at once a great number of things as sensual and worldly, and purifies the church. Lutheranism, on the contrary, tries to bring spirit into all things as far as possible, to recognize the Holy Spirit as an essence in everything, and so to hollow everything worldly. No one can forbid a kiss in honor. The spirit of honor hollows it. Hence it was that the Lutheran Hegel he declares himself such in some passage or other. He, quote, wants to remain a Lutheran, unquote, was completely successful in carrying the idea through everything. In everything, there is reason, Holy Spirit, or the real is rational. For the real is, in fact, everything as in each thing, for instance, each lie, the truth, can be detected. There is no absolute lie, no absolute evil, and the like. Great works of mind were created almost solely by Protestants, as they alone were the true disciples and consummators of mind. How little 
man is able to control. He must let the sun run its course, the sea roll its waves, the mountains rise to heaven. Thus he stands powerless before the uncontrollable. Can he keep off the impression that he is helpless against this gigantic world? It is a fixed law to which he must submit. It determines his fate. Now, what did pre-Christian humanity work toward? Toward getting rid of the eruptions of the destinies, not letting oneself be vexed by them. The Stoics attained this in apathy, declaring the attacks of nature indifferent, and not letting themselves be affected by them. Horace utters the famous Nil Admirari, by which he likewise announces the indifference of the other, the world. It is not to influence us, not to rouse our astonishment. And that in Paphidium Ferient Ruinae expresses the very same imperturbability as Psalms chapter 46, verse 3. We do not fear that the earth should perish. In all this, there is room made for the Christian proposition that the world is empty, for the Christian contempt of the world. The imperturbable spirit of the wise man with which the old world worked to prepare its end now underwent an inner perturbation against which no ataraxia, no stoic courage, was able to protect it. The spirit, secured against all influence of the world, insensible to its shocks and exalted above its attacks, admiring nothing, not to be disconcerted by any downfall of the world, foamed over irrepressibly again, because gases, spirits, were evolved in its own interior and, after the mechanical shock that comes from without had become ineffective, chemical tensions that agitate within began their wonderful play. In fact, ancient history ends with this, that I have struggled till I have won my ownership of the world. All things have been delivered to me, by my father, Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. It has ceased to be overpowering, unapproachable, sacred, divine for me. It is undeified, and now I treat it so entirely as I please that, if I cared, I could exert on it all miracle-working power that is, power of mind. Remove mountains. Command mulberry trees to tear themselves up and transplant themselves into the sea. Luke 17, verse 6. And do everything possible, thinkable. All things are possible to him who believes. Mark chapter 7, verse 23. I am the Lord of the world. Mine is the glory. The world has become prosaic, for the divine has vanished from it. It is my property, which I dispose of as I, to wit, the mind, choose. When I had exalted myself to be the owner of the world, Egoism had won its first complete victory, had vanquished the world, had become worldless, and put the acquisitions of a long age under lock and key. The first property, the first glory, has been acquired. But the Lord of the world is not yet Lord of his thoughts, his feelings, his will, 
he is not lord and owner of the spirit, for the spirit is still sacred, the holy spirit, and the worldless Christian is not able to become godless. If the ancient struggle was a struggle against the world, the medieval Christian struggle is a struggle against self, the mind, the former against the outer world, the latter against the inner world. The medieval man is the man whose gaze is turned inward, the thinking, meditative man. All wisdom of the ancients is the science of the world. All wisdom of the moderns is the science of God. The heathen, Jews included, got through with the world. But now the thing was to get through with self, the spirit too, to become spiritless or godless. For almost 2,000 years, we have been working at subjecting the Holy Spirit to ourselves. And little by little, we have torn off and trodden underfoot many bits of sacredness, but the gigantic opponent is constantly rising anew under a changed form and name. The spirit has not yet lost its divinity, its holiness, its sacredness. To be sure, it has long ceased to flutter over our heads as a dove. To be sure, it no longer gladdens its saints alone, but lets itself be caught by the laity too, but as spirit of humanity, as spirit of man. It remains still an alien spirit to me or you, still far from becoming our unrestricted property, which we dispose of at our pleasure. However, one thing certainly happened that visibly guided the progress of post-Christian history. This one thing was the endeavor to make the Holy Spirit more human and bring it nearer to men, or men to it. Through this, it came about that at last it could be conceived as the spirit of humanity. And under different expressions like idea of humanity, mankind, humaneness, general philanthropy, appeared more attractive, more familiar, and more accessible. Would not one think that now everybody could possess the Holy Spirit, take up into himself the idea of humanity, bring mankind to form an existence in himself? No. The Spirit is not stripped of its holiness and robbed of its unapproachableness is not accessible to us, not our property. For the spirit of humanity is not my spirit. My ideal it may be, and as a thought I call it mine. The thought of humanity is my property, and I prove this sufficiently by propounding it quite according to my views, and shaping it today so, tomorrow otherwise, we represent it to ourselves in the most manifold ways. But it is, at the same time, an entail, which I cannot alienate nor get rid of. Among many transformations, the Holy Spirit became, in time, the absolute idea, which, again, in manifold refractions, split into the different areas of philanthropy reasonableness, civic virtue, and so on. But can I call the idea my property if it is the idea of humanity? And can I consider the spirit as vanquished if I am to serve it, sacrifice myself to it? Antiquity, at its close, had gained its ownership of the world only when it had broken the world's overpoweringness and divinity, recognized the world's powerlessness and vanity. The case with regard to the spirit 
corresponds. When I have degraded it to a spook and its control over me to a cranky notion, then it is to be looked upon as having lost its sacredness, its holiness, its divinity, and then I use it as one uses nature at pleasure without scruple. The nature of the case, the concept of the relation, is to guide me in dealing with the case or in contracting the relation. As if a concept of the case existed on its own account and was not rather the concept that one forms of the case. As if a relation which we enter into was not, by the uniqueness of those who enter into it, itself unique. As if it depended on how others stamp it. But as people separated the essence of man from the real man, and judged the latter by the former, so they also separate his action from him, and appraise it by human value. Concepts are to decide everywhere, concepts to regulate life, concepts to rule. This is the religious world to which Hegel gave a systematic expression, bringing method into the nonsense and completing the conceptual precepts into a rounded, firmly based dogmatic. Everything is sung according to concepts. And the real man, I, am compelled to live according to these conceptual laws. Can there be a more grievous dominion of law? And did not Christianity confess at the very beginning that it meant only to draw Judaism's dominion of law tighter? Not a letter of the law shall be lost. Liberalism simply brought other concepts on the carpet, human instead of divine, political instead of ecclesiastical, scientific instead of doctrinal, or more generally, real concepts and eternal laws instead of crude dogmas and precepts. Now, nothing but mind rules in the world. An innumerable multitude of concepts buzz about in people's heads. And what are those doing who endeavor to get further? They are negating these concepts to put new ones in their place. They are saying, you form a false concept of right, of the state, of man, of liberty, of truth, of marriage. The concept of right, etc., is rather that one which we now set up. Thus, the confusion of concepts moves forward. The history of the world has dealt cruelly with us, and the spirit has obtained an almighty power. You must have regard for my miserable shoes, which could protect your naked foot, my salt, by which your potatoes would become palatable, and my stage carriage, whose possession would relieve you of all need at once. You must not reach out after them. Man is to recognize the independence of all these and innumerable other things. They are to rank his mind as something that cannot be seized or approached. They are to be kept away from him. He must have regard for it, respect them. Woe to him if he stretches out his fingers desirously. We call that being light-fingered. How beggarly little is left us. Yes, how really nothing. Everything has been removed. We must not venture on anything unless it is given us. We continue to live only by the grace of the giver. You must not pick up a pin unless you have got leave to do so. And got it from whom? From respect. Only when this lets you have it as property, only when you can respect it as property, only then may you take it. And again, you are not to conceive a thought, speak a syllable, commit an action, that should have their warrant in you alone, instead of receiving it from morality or reason or humanity. Happy unconstraint of the desirous man, how mercilessly people have tried to slay you on the altar of constraint. But around the altar rise the arches of a church, and its walls keep moving further and further out. What they enclose is sacred. 
You can no longer get to it, no longer touch it. Shrieking with the hunger that devours you, you wander round these walls in search of the little that is profane. And the circles of your course keep growing more and more extended. Soon that church will embrace the whole world, and you will be driven out to the extreme edge. Another step of the sacred has conquered. You sink into the abyss. Therefore take courage while it is yet time. Wander about no longer in the profane, where now it is dry feeding. Dare the leap, and rush in through the gates into the sanctuary itself. If you devour the sacred, you have made it your own. Digest the sacramental wafer, and you are rid of it. End of section 11「The Ego and His Own」by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Subdivision C, The Free. The ancients and the moderns having been presented above in two divisions, it may seem as if the free were here to be described in a third division, as independent and distinct. This is not so. Free are only the more modern and most modern among the moderns, and are put in a separate division merely because they belong to the present. And what is present, above all, claims our attention here. I give the free only as a translation of the liberals, but must, with regard to the concept of freedom, as in general with regard to so many other things whose anticipatory introduction cannot be avoided, refer to what comes later. Section 1. Political Liberalism after the chalice of so-called absolute monarchy had been drained down to the dregs in the eighteenth century people became aware that their drink did not taste human too clearly aware not to begin to crave a different cup since our fathers were human beings after all they at last desired also to be regarded as such whoever sees in us something else in him we likewise will not see a human being, but an inhuman being, and will meet him as an inhuman being. On the other hand, whoever recognizes us as human beings and protects us against the danger of being treated inhumanly, him we will honor as our true protector and guardian. Let us then hold together and protect the man and each other. Then we find the necessary protection in our holding together, and in ourselves, those who hold together, a fellowship of those who know their human dignity and hold together as human beings. Our holding together is the state. We who hold together are the nation. In our being together as nation or state, we are only human beings. How we deport ourselves in other respects as individuals, and what self-seeking impulses we may there succumb to, belong solely to our private life. Our public or state life is a purely human one. Everything unhuman or, quote, egoistic, unquote, that clings to us is degraded to a, quote, private matter, unquote, and we distinguish the state definitely from, quote, civil society, unquote, which is the sphere of, quote, egoisms, unquote, activity. The true man is the nation. 
but the individual is always an egoist. Therefore strip off your individuality, or isolation wherein dwells discord and egoistic inequality, and consecrate yourself wholly to the true man, the nation, or the state. Then you will rank as men, and have all that is man's. The state, the true man, will entitle you to what belongs to it, and give you the rights of man. Man gives you his rights. So runs the speech of the Comity. Editor's footnote regarding the word Comity. Comity, or citizenhood. The word, das Bürgertum, means either the condition of being a citizen or citizen-like principles of the body of citizens or of the middle or business class, the bourgeoisie. End footnote. The commulty is nothing else than the thought that the state is all in all, the true man, and that the individual's human value consists in being a citizen of the state. In being a good citizen, he seeks his highest honor. Beyond that, he knows nothing higher than at most the antiquated, being a good Christian. The commulty developed itself in the struggle against the privileged classes, by whom it was cavalierly treated as third estate, and confounded with the canaille. In other words, up to this time the state had recognized caste. The son of a nobleman was selected for post to which the most distinguished commoners aspired in vain. The civic feeling revolted against this. No more distinction. No giving preference to persons, no difference of classes, let all be alike. No separate interest is to be pursued longer, but the general interest of all. The state is to be a fellowship of free and equal men, and everyone is to devote himself to the welfare of the whole, to be dissolved in the state, to make the state his end and ideal. State, state. So ran the general cry, and thenceforth people sought for the right form of state, the best constitution, and so the state in its best conception. The thought of the state passed into all hearts and awakened enthusiasm. To serve it, this mundane God, became the new divine service and worship. The properly political epoch had dawned. To serve the state or the nation became the highest ideal. The state's interest, the highest interest. State service, for which one does not by any means need to be an official, the highest honor. So then, the separate interests and personalities had been scared away, and sacrifice for the state had become the shibboleth. One must give up himself and live only for the state. One must act disinterestedly, not want to benefit himself, but the state. Hereby the latter has become the true person, before whom the individual personality vanishes. Not I live, but it lives in me. Therefore, in comparison with the former self-seeking, this was unselfishness and impersonality itself. Before this God state, all egoism vanished, and before it, all were equal. They were without any other distinction. Men, nothing but men. The revolution took fire from the inflammable material of property. The government needed money. Now it must prove the proposition that it is absolute, and so master of all property, sole proprietor. It must take to itself its money, which was only in the possession of the subjects, not their property. Instead of this, it calls states general to have this money granted to it. The shrinking from strictly logical action destroyed the illusion of an absolute government. He who must have something granted to him cannot be regarded as absolute. 
the subjects recognized that they were real proprietors and that it was their money that was demanded. Those who had hitherto been subjects attained the consciousness that they were proprietors. Bailly depicts this in a few words. If you cannot dispose of my property without my consent, how much less can you of my person, of all that concerns my mental and social position? All this is my property, like the piece of land that I till, and I have a right, an interest, to make the laws myself. By these words sound, certainly, as if everyone was a proprietor now. However, instead of the government, instead of the prince, the nation now became proprietor and master. From this time on, the ideal is spoken of as, quote, popular liberty, unquote, quote, a free people, unquote, etc. As early as July 8, 1789, the declaration of the Bishop of Autun and Berere took away all semblance of the importance of each and every individual in legislation. It showed the complete powerlessness of the constituents. The majority of the representatives has become master. When on July 9th, the plan for division of the work on the Constitution is proposed, Mirabeau remarks that, quote, the government has only power, no rights. Only in the people is the source of all right to be found, unquote. On July 16th, the same Mirabeau exclaims, is not the people the source of all power? The source, therefore, of all right and the source of all power. By the way, here the substance of right becomes visible. It is power. He who has power has right. The commonalty is the heir of the privileged classes. In fact, the rights of the barons, which were taken from them as usurpations, only passed over to the commonalty. For the commonalty was now called the nation. Quote, into the hands of the nation, unquote, all prerogatives were given back. Thereby they ceased to be prerogatives, they became rights. From this time on, the nation demands tithes, compulsory services. It has inherited the Lord's court, the rights of Vare and Venison, the serfs. The night of August 4th was the death night of privileges or prerogatives. Cities, communes, boards of magistrates were also privileged, furnished with prerogatives and seigneurial rights, and ended with the new morning of right the, quote, rights of the state, the, quote, rights of the nation, unquote. The monarch in the person of the royal master had been a paltry monarch compared with this new monarch, the sovereign nation. This monarchy was a thousand times severer, stricter, and more consistent. Against the new monarch, there was no longer any right, any privilege at all. How limited the absolute king of the ancient regime looks in comparison. The revolution affected the transformation of limited monarchy into absolute monarchy. From this time on, every right that is not conferred by this monarch is an assumption with every prerogative that he bestows, a right. The times demanded absolute royalty, absolute monarchy. Therefore, down fell that so-called absolute royalty, which had so little understood how to become absolute that it remained limited by a thousand little lords. What was longed for and striven for through thousands of years to wit, 
to find that absolute lord beside whom no other lords and lordlings any longer exist to clip his power the bourgeoisie has brought to pass it has revealed the lord who alone confers rightful titles and without whose warrant nothing is justified Quote, so now we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other god save the one first corinthians chapter 8 verse 4 against right one can no longer as against a right come forward with the assertion that it is quote a wrong unquote one can say now only that it is a piece of nonsense an illusion if one called it wrong one would have to set up another right in opposition to it and measure it by this if on the contrary one rejects right as such right in and of itself altogether then one also rejects the concept of wrong and dissolves the whole concept of right to which the concept of wrong belongs What is the meaning of the doctrine that we all enjoy equality of political rights? Only this, that the state has no regard for my person, that to it I, like every other, am only a man, without having another significance that commands its deference. I do not command its deference as an aristocrat, a nobleman's son, or even as heir of an official whose office belongs to me by inheritance, as in the Middle Age countships, etc., and later under absolute royalty, where hereditary offices occur. Now the state has an innumerable multitude of rights to give away. The right to lead a battalion, a company, etc., the right to lecture at a university, and so forth. It has them to give away because they are its own, namely state rights or quote, political unquote, rights withal it makes no difference to it to whom it gives them if the receiver only fulfills the duties that spring from the delegated rights to it we are all of us all right and equal one worth no more and no less than another it is indifferent to me who receives the command of the army, says the sovereign state, provided the grantee understands the matter properly. Quote, equality of political rights, unquote, has, consequently, the meaning that everyone may acquire every right that the state has to give away, if only he fulfills the conditions annexed thereto, conditions that are to be sought only in the nature of the particular right not in a predilection for the person persona grata the nature of the right to become an officer bears with it the necessity that one possess sound limbs and a suitable measure of knowledge but it does not have noble birth as a condition if on the other hand even the most deserving commoner could not reach that station then an inequality of political rights would exist. Among the states of today, one has carried out that maxim of equality more, another less. The monarchy of the states, so I will call absolute royalty, the time of the kings before the revolution, kept the individual independence on a lot of little monarchies. These were fellowships, societies, like the guilds, the nobility, the priesthood, the burgher class, cities, communes. Everywhere the individual must regard himself first as a member of this little society and yield unconditional obedience to its spirit, the esprit de corps, as his monarch. More than the individual nobleman himself must his family, the honor of his race, be to him only by means of his corporation his estate 
did the individual have relation to the greater corporation, the state? As in Catholicism, the individual deals with God only through the priest. To this, the third estate now, showing courage to negate itself as an estate, made an end. It decided no longer to be and be called an estate beside other estates, but to glorify and generalize itself into the nation. Hereby it created a much more complete and absolute monarchy, and the entire previously ruled principle of estates, the principle of little monarchies inside the great, went down. Therefore, it cannot be said that the revolution was a revolution against the first two privileged estates. It was against the little monarchies of estates in general. But if the estates and their despotism were broken, the king too, we know, was only a king of estates, not a citizen king. The individuals freed from the inequality of estate were left. Were they now really to be without estate? and, quote, out of gear, unquote, no longer bound by any estate, without a general bond of union? No. For the third estate had declared itself the nation, only in order not to remain an estate beside other estates, but to become the sole estate. This sole estate is the nation, the, quote, state." Unquote. What had the individual now become? A political Protestant, for he had come into immediate connection with his God, the state. He was no longer as an aristocrat in the monarchy of the nobility, as a mechanic in the monarchy of the guild, but he, like all, recognized and acknowledged only one Lord, the state, as whose servants they all received the equal title of honor, citizen. The bourgeoisie is the aristocracy of desert. Its motto, let desert wear its crowns. It fought against the lazy aristocracy, for according to it, the industrious aristocracy, acquired by industry and desert. It is not the, quote, born, unquote, who are free, nor yet I who am free either, but the, quote, deserving, unquote, man, the honest servant of his king of the state, of the people in constitutional states. Through service, one acquires freedom, that is, acquires deserts, even if one served mammon. One must deserve well of the state, of the principle of the state, of its moral spirit. He who serves the spirit of the state is a good citizen. Let him live to whatever honest branch of industry he will. In its eyes, innovators practice a breadless art. Only the quote-unquote shopkeeper is quote-unquote practical, and the spirit that chases after public office is as much the shopkeeping spirit as is that which tries in trade to feather its nest or otherwise to become useful to itself and anybody else. But if the deserving count as the free, for what does the comfortable commoner the faithful office holder, lack of that freedom that his heart desires, then the servants are the free. The obedient servant is the free man. What glaring nonsense! Yet this is the sense of the bourgeoisie and its poet, Goethe, as well as its philosopher, Hegel succeeded in glorifying the dependence of the subject on the object, obedience to the objective world. He who only serves the cause devotes himself entirely to it, 
as the true freedom. And among thinkers, the cause was reason, that which, like the state and church, gives general laws and puts the individual man in irons by the thought of humanity. It determines what is, quote, true, unquote, according to which one must then act. No more, quote, unquote, rational people than the honest servants, who primarily are called good citizens as servants of the state. Be rich as Croesus or poor as Job. The state of the commonality leaves that to your option. But only have a good disposition. This it demands of you, and counts it its most urgent task to establish this in all. Therefore it will keep you from evil promptings, holding the ill-disposed in check and silencing their inflammatory discourses under censors' cancelling marks or press penalties and behind dungeon walls, and will, on the other hand, appoint people of, quote, good disposition, unquote, as censors, and in every way have a moral influence exerted on you by, quote, well-disposed and well-meaning, unquote, people. If it has made you deaf to evil promptings, then it opens your ears again, all the more diligently, to good promptings. With the time of the bourgeoisie begins that of liberalism. People want to see what is rational, suited to the times, etc., established everywhere. The following definition of liberalism, which is supposed to be pronounced in its honor, characterizes it completely. Quote, liberalism is nothing else than the knowledge of reason applied to our existing relations, unquote. Its aim is a, quote, rational order, unquote, a, quote, moral behavior, unquote, a, quote, limited freedom, unquote, not anarchy, lawlessness, selfhood. But if reason rules, then the person succumbs. Art has for a long time not only acknowledged the ugly, but considered the ugly as necessary to its existence, and takes it up into itself. It needs the villain. In the religious domain, too, the extremist liberals go so far that they want to see the most religious man regarded as a citizen, that is, the religious villain. They want to see no more of trials for heresy. But against the, quote, rational law, no one is to be rebel. Otherwise, he is threatened with the severest penalty. What is wanted is not free movement and realization of the person or of me, but of reason, the dominion of reason, a dominion. The liberals are zealots, not exactly for the faith or God, but certainly for reason, their master. They brook no lack of breeding, and therefore no self-development and self-determination. They play the guardian as effectively as the most absolute rulers. Quote, political liberty. Unquote. What are we to understand by that? Perhaps the individual's independence of the state and its laws? No. On the contrary, the individual's subjection in the state and the state's laws. But why, quote unquote, liberty? Because one is no longer separated from the state by intermediaries but stands in direct and immediate relation to it. Because one is a citizen, not the subject of another, not even of the king as a person, but only in his quality as, quote, 
supreme head of the state. Unquote. Political liberty, this fundamental doctrine of liberalism, is nothing but a second phase of Protestantism and runs quite parallel with, quote, religious liberty, unquote. Or would it perchance be right to understand by the latter an independence of religion? Anything but that. Independence of intermediaries is all that it is intended to express. Independence of mediating priests, the abolition of the quote-unquote laity, and so direct and immediate relation to religion. Or to God. Only on the supposition that one has religion can he enjoy freedom of religion. Freedom of religion does not mean being without religion, but an inwardness of faith, unmediated intercourse with God. To him who is religiously free, religion is an affair of the heart. It is to him his own affair. It is to him a sacredly serious matter. To the, quote, politically free, unquote, man, the state is a sacredly serious matter. It is his heart's affair, his chief affair, his own affair. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 13. Political Liberalism, Part 2. Political liberty means that the polis, the state, is free. Freedom of religion, that religion is free, as freedom of conscience signifies that conscience is free. Not, therefore, that I am free from the state, from religion, from conscience, or that I am rid of them. It does not mean my liberty, but the liberty of a power that rules and subjugates me. It means that one of my despots, like state, religion, conscience, is free. State, religion, conscience, these despots, make me a slave, and their liberty is my slavery. That in this they necessarily follow the principle, the end hallows the means, is self-evident. If the welfare of the state is the end, war is a hallowed means. If justice is the state's end, homicide is a hallowed means and is called by its sacred name execution. The sacred state hallows everything that is serviceable to it. Individual liberty, over which civic liberalism keeps jealous watch, does not by any means signify a completely free self-determination by which actions become altogether mine, but only independence of persons. Individually free is he who is responsible to no man. Taken in this sense, and we are not allowed to understand it otherwise, not only the ruler is individually free, that is, irresponsible toward men, before God we know he acknowledges himself responsible, but all who are responsible only to the law. This kind of liberty was won through the revolutionary movement of the century, to wit, independence of arbitrary will, or tel est notre plaisir. Hence, the constitutional prince, must himself be stripped of all personality, deprived of all individual decision, that he may not as a person, as an individual man, violate the individual liberty of others. The personal will of the ruler has disappeared in the constitutional prince. It is with a right feeling, therefore, that absolute princes resist this. Nevertheless, these very ones profess to be in best sense Christian princes. For this, however, they must become a purely spiritual power, as the Christian is subject only to spirit. God is spirit. The purely spiritual power is consistently represented only by the constitutional prince, he who, without any personal significance, 
stands there spiritualized to the degree that he can rank as a sheer uncanny spirit as an idea the constitutional king is a truly christian king the genuine consistent carrying out of the christian principle in the constitutional monarchy individual dominion that is a real ruler that wills has found its end here therefore individual liberty prevails independence of every individual dictator of every one who could dictate to me with a tel à notre plaisir it is the completed christian state life a spiritualized life the behavior of the commonality is liberal through and through every personal invasion of another sphere revolts the civic sense if the citizen sees that one is dependent on the humor the pleasure the will of a man as individual that is as not as authorized by a higher power at once he brings his liberalism to the front and shrieks about arbitrariness in fine the citizen asserts his freedom from what is called orders ordinance no one has any business to give me orders orders carries the idea that what i am to do is another man's will while law does not express the personal authority of another the liberty of the commonality is liberty or independence from the will of another person so-called personal or individual liberty for being personally free means being only so free that no other person can dispose of mine or that what i may or may not do does not depend on the personal decree of another the liberty of the press for example is such a liberty of liberalism liberalism fighting only against the coercion of the censorship as that of personal wilfulness but otherwise showing itself extremely inclined and willing to tyrannize over the press by press laws that is the civic liberals want liberty of writing for themselves for as they are law-abiding their writings will not bring them under the law only liberal matter that is only lawful matter is to be allowed to be printed otherwise the press laws threaten press penalties if one sees personal liberty assured one does not notice at all how if a new issue happens to arise the most glaring unfreedom becomes dominant for one is rid of orders indeed and no one has any business to give his orders but one has become so much the more submissive to the law one is enthralled now in due legal form in the citizen state there are only free people who are compelled to thousands of things for example to deference to a confession of faith etc but what does that amount to why it is only the state the law not any man that compels them what does the commonality mean by inveighing against every personal order that is every order not founded on the cause on reason it is simply fighting in the interest of the cause footnote sache which commonly means thing and footnote against the dominion of persons but the mind's cause is the rational good lawful etc that is the good cause the commonality wants an impersonal ruler furthermore if the principle is this that only the cause is to rule man to wit the cause of morality the cause of legality etc then no personal balking of one by the other may be authorized either as formerly for example the commoner was balked of the aristocratic offices the aristocrat of common mechanical trades etc free competition must exist only through the thing footnote sache and footnote can one bark another for example the rich man barking the impecunious man by money a thing not as a person henceforth only one lordship the lordship of the state is admitted personally no one is any longer lord of another even at birth the children belong to the state and to the parents only in the name of the state which for example does not allow infanticide demands their baptism etc but all the state's children furthermore are of quite equal account in its eyes civic or political equality and they may see to it themselves how they get along with each other they may compete free competition means nothing else than that every one can present himself assert himself fight against another of course the feudal party set itself against this as its existence depended on an absence of competition 
the contests in the time of the restoration in france had no other substance than this that the bourgeoisie was struggling for free competition and the feudalists were seeking to bring back the guild system now free competition has won and against the guild system it had to win see below for the further discussion if the revolution ended in a reaction this only showed what the revolution really was for every effort arrives at reaction when it comes to discreet reflection and storms forward in the original action only so long as it is an intoxication an indiscretion discretion will always be the cue of the reaction because discretion sets limits and liberates what was really wanted that is the principle from the initial unbridledness and unrestrainedness wild young fellows bumptious students who set aside all considerations are really philistines since with them as with the latter considerations form the substance of their conduct only that as swaggerers they are mutinous against considerations and in negative relations to them but as philistines later they give themselves up to considerations and have positive relations to them in both cases all their doing and thinking turns upon considerations but the philistine is reactionary in relation to the student he is the wild fellow come to discreet reflection as the latter is the unreflecting philistine daily experience confirms the truth of this transformation and shows how the swaggerers turn to philistines in turning grey so too the so-called reaction in germany gives proof that it was only the discreet continuation of the warlike jubilation of liberty the revolution was not directed against the established but against the establishment in question against a particular establishment it did away with this ruler not with the ruler on the contrary the french were ruled most inexorably it killed the old vicious rulers but wanted to confer on the virtuous ones a securely established position that is it simply set virtue in the place of vice vice and virtue again are on their part distinguished from each other only as a wild young fellow from a philistine etc to this day the revolutionary principle has gone no farther than to assail only one or another particular establishment that is be reformatory much as may be improved strongly as discreet progress may be adhered to always there is only a new master set in the old one's place and the overturning is a building up we are still at the distinction of the young philistine from the old one the revolution began in bourgeois fashion with the uprising of the third estate the middle class in bourgeois fashion it dries away it was not the individual man and he alone is man that became free but the citizen the citoyen the political man who for that very reason is not man but a specimen of the human species and more particularly a specimen of the species citizen a free citizen in the revolution it was not the individual who acted so as to affect the world's history but a people the nation the sovereign nation wanted to affect everything a fancied i an idea for example the nation is appears acting the individuals contribute themselves as tools of this idea and act as citizens the commonality has its power and at the same time its limits in the fundamental law of the state in a charter in a legitimate or just prince who himself is guided and rules according to rational laws in short in legality footnote legitimate or righteous german rechtlich just gerecht and footnote the period of the bourgeoisie is ruled by the british spirit of legality an assembly of provincial estates for example is ever recalling that its authorization goes only so and so far and that it is called at all only through favor and can be thrown out again through disfavor it is always reminding itself of its vocation it is certainly not to be denied that my father begot me but now that i am once begotten surely his purposes in begetting do not concern me a bit and whatever he may have called me to do i do what i myself will therefore even a called assembly of estates the french assembly in the beginning of the revolution recognized quite rightly that it was independent of the caller it existed 
and would have been stupid if it did not avail itself of the right of existence, but fancied itself dependent as on a father. The cold one no longer has to ask, what did the caller want when he created me? But what do I want after I have once followed the call? Not the caller, not the constituents, not the charter according to which their meeting was called out. Nothing will be to him a sacred, inviolable power. He is authorized for everything that is in his power. He will know no restrictive authorization, will not want to be loyal. This, if any such thing could be expected from chambers at all, would give a completely egoistic chamber, severed from all navel string and without consideration. But chambers are always devout, and therefore one cannot be surprised if so much half-way or undecided that is, hypocritical, egoism parades in them. The members of the estates are to remain within the limits that are traced for them by the charter, by the king's will, etc. If they will not or cannot do that, then they are to step out. What dutiful man could act otherwise, could put himself, his conviction, and his will as the first thing? Who could be so immoral as to want to assert himself, even if the body corporate and everything should go to ruin over it? people keep carefully within the limits of their authorization. Of course, one must remain within the limits of his power anyhow, because no one can do more than he can. My power, or, if it be so, powerlessness, be my sole limit, but authorizations only restraining precepts? Should I profess this all supposed view? No, I am a law-abiding citizen." The commonality professes a morality which is most closely connected with its essence. The first demand of this morality is to the effect that one should carry on a solid business, an honourable trade, lead a moral life. Immoral to it is the sharper, the demi-rap, the thief, robber and murderer, the gamester, the penniless man without a situation, the frivolous man. The doughty commoner designates the feeling against these immoral people as his deepest indignation. All these lack settlement, the solid quality of business, a solid, seemly life, a fixed income, etc. In short, they belong because their existence does not rest on a secure basis to the dangerous individuals or isolated persons, to the dangerous proletariat. They are individual bowlers who offer no guarantee and have nothing to lose and so nothing to risk. The forming of family ties, for example, binds a man. He who is bound furnishes security, can be taken hold of, not so the street-walker. The gamester stakes everything on the game, ruins himself and others, no guarantee. All who appear to the commoner suspicious, hostile, and dangerous might be comprised under the name vagabonds. Every vagabondish way of living displeases him for there are intellectual vagabonds, too, to whom the hereditary dwelling-place of their fathers seems too cramped and oppressive for them to be willing to satisfy themselves with a limited space any more, instead of keeping within the limits of a temperate style of thinking, and taking as inviolable truth what furnishes comfort and tranquillity to thousands. They overlap all bounds of the traditional, and run wild with their impudent criticism and untamed mania for doubt these extravagating vagabonds. They form the class of the unstable, restless, changeable, that is, of the proletariat, and, if they give voice to their unsettled nature, are called unruly fellows. Such a broad sense has the so-called proletariat, or pauperism. How much one would err if one believed the commonality to be desirous of doing away with poverty, pauperism, to the best of its ability. On the contrary, the good citizen helps himself with the incomparably comforting conviction that the fact is that the good things of fortune are unequally divided and will always remain so, according to God's wise decree. The poverty which surrounds him in every alley does not disturb the true commoner further than that at most he clears his account with it by throwing an alms, or finds work and food for an honest and serviceable fellow. But so much the more does he feel his quiet enjoyment clouded by innovating and discontented poverty, by those poor who no longer behave quietly and endure, but begin to run wild and become restless. Lock up the vagabond, thrust the breeder of unrest into the darkest dungeon. He wants to arouse dissatisfaction and incite people against existing institutions in the state. 
stone him stone him but from these identical discontented ones comes a reasoning somewhat as follows it need not make any difference to the good citizens who protects them and their principles whether an absolute king or a constitutional one a republic if only they are protected and what is their principle whose protector they always love not that of labour not that of birth either but that of mediocrity of the golden mean a little birth and a little labour that is an interest-bearing possession possession is here the fixed the given inherited birth interest drawing is the exertion about it labour labouring capital therefore only no immoderation no ultra no radicalism right of birth certainly but only hereditary possessions labour certainly yet little or none at all of one's own but labour of capital and of the subject labourers if an age is imbued with an error some always derive advantage from the error while the rest have to suffer from it in the middle ages the error was general among christians that the church must have all power or the supreme lordship on earth the hierarchs believed in this truth not less than the laymen and both were spellbound in the like error but by it the hierarchs had the advantage of power the laymen had to suffer subjection however as the saying goes one learns wisdom by suffering and so the layman at last learned wisdom and no longer believed in the medieval truth a like relation exists between the commonality and the labouring class commoner and labourer believe in the truth of money they who do not possess it believe in it no less than those who possess it the layman therefore as well as the priests money governs the world is the keynote of the civic epoch a destitute aristocrat and a destitute labourer as starvelings amount to nothing so far as political consideration is concerned birth and labour do not do it but money brings consideration footnote das geld gibt geld zum and footnote the possessors rule but the state trains up from the destitute its servants to whom in proportion as they are to rule govern in its name it gives money a salary i receive everything from the state have i anything without the state's assent what i have without this it takes from me as soon as it discovers the lack of a legal title do i not therefore have everything through its grace its assent on this alone on the legal title the commonality rests the commoner is what he is through the protection of the state through the state's grace he would necessarily be afraid of losing everything if the state's power were broken but how is it with him who has nothing to lose how with the proletarian as he has nothing to lose he does not need the protection of the state for his nothing he may gain on the contrary if that protection of the state is withdrawn from the protege therefore the non-possessor will regard the state as a power protecting the possessor which privileges the latter but does nothing for him the non-possessor but to suck his blood the state is a commoner's state is the estate of the commonality it protects man not according to his labour but according to his tractableness loyalty to wit according to whether the rights entrusted to him by the state are enjoyed and managed in accordance with the will that is laws of the state under the regime of the commonality the labourers always fall into the hands of the possessors of those who have at their disposal some bit of the state domains and everything possessable in state domain belongs to the state and is only a fief of the individual especially money and land of the capitalist therefore the labourer cannot realize on his labour to the extent of the value that it has for the consumer labour is badly paid the capitalist has the greatest profit from it well paid and more than well paid are only the labours of those who heighten the splendour and dominion of the state the labours of high state servants the state pays well that its good citizens the possessors may be able to pay badly without danger it secures to itself by good payment its servants out of whom it forms a protecting power a police open brackets to the police belong soldiers officials of all kinds for example those of justice education etc 
in short, the whole machinery of the state, close brackets, for the good citizens, and the good citizens gladly pay high tax rates to it in order to pay so much lower rates to their laborers. But the class of laborers, because unprotected in what they essentially are, open brackets, for they do not enjoy the protection of the state as laborers, but as its subjects they have a share in the enjoyment of the police, a so-called protection of the law, close brackets, remains a power hostile to this state, this state of possessors, this citizen kingship. Its principle, labor, is not recognized as to its value. It is exploited, a spoil of the possessors, the enemy. Footnote. Exploited is ausgebeutet. Spoil is kriegsbeute. End footnote. The laborers have the most enormous power in their hands, and, if they once became thoroughly conscious of it and used it, nothing would withstand them. They would only have to stop labor, regard the product of labor as theirs, and enjoy it. This is the sense of the labor disturbances which show themselves here and there. The state rests on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. End of section 13section fourteen of the ego and his own this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anna simon the ego and his own by max stenner section fourteen social liberalism we are free-born men and wherever we look we see ourselves made servants of egoists are we therefore to become egoists too heaven forbid we want rather to make egoists impossible we want to make them all ragamuffins all of us must have nothing that quote, all may have end quote. so say the socialists who is this person that you call all it is society but is it corporeal then we are its body you why you are not a body yourselves you sir are corporeal to be sure you too and you but you all together are only bodies not a body accordingly the united society may indeed have bodies at its service but no one body of its own like the nation of the politicians it will turn out to be nothing but a spirit its body only semblance the freedom of man is in political liberalism freedom from persons from personal dominion from the master securing of each individual person against other persons personal freedom no one has any orders to give the law alone gives orders but even if the persons have become equal yet their possessions have not and yet the poor man needs the rich the rich the poor the former the rich man's money the latter the poor man's labor so no one needs another as a person but needs him as a giver and thus as one who has something to give as holder or possessor so what he has makes the man and in having or in possessions people are unequal consequently social liberalism concludes no one must have as according to political liberalism no one was to give orders that is as in that case the state alone obtained command so now society alone obtains the possessions for the state protecting each one's person and property against the other separates them from one another each one is his special part and has his special part he who is satisfied with what he is and has finds this state of things profitable but he who would like to be and have more looks around for this more and finds it in the power of other persons here he comes upon a contradiction as a person no one is inferior to another and yet one person has what another has not but would like to have so he concludes the one person is more than the other after all for the former has what he needs the latter has not the former is a rich man the latter a poor man he now asks himself further are we to let what we rightly buried come to life again are we to let this circuitously restored inequality of persons pass 
No, on the contrary, we must bring quite to an end what was only half accomplished. Our freedom from another's person still lacks the freedom from what the other's person can command, from what he has in his personal power, in short, from personal property. Let us then do away with personal property. Let no one have anything any longer. Let everyone be a ragamuffin. Let property be impersonal. Let it belong to society. Before the supreme ruler, the sole commander, we had all become equal, equal persons, that is, nullities. Before the supreme proprietor, we all become equal, ragamuffins. For the present, one is still, in another's estimation, a ragamuffin, a have-nothing. But then this estimation ceases. We are all ragamuffins together, and as the aggregate of communistic society, we might call ourselves a ragamuffin crew. When the proletarian shall really have founded his proposed society, in which the interval between rich and poor is to be removed, then he will be a ragamuffin, for then he will feel that it amounts to something to be a ragamuffin, and might lift ragamuffin to be an honourable form of address, just as the revolution did with the word citizen. Ragamuffin is his ideal. We are all to become ragamuffins. This is the second robbery of the personal in the interest of humanity. Neither command nor property is left to the individual. The state took the former, society the latter. Because in society the most oppressive evils make themselves felt, therefore the oppressed especially, and consequently the members of the lower regions of society, think they found the fault in society, and make it their task to discover the right society. This is only the old phenomenon, that one looks for the fault first in everything but himself, and consequently in the state, in the self-seeking of the rich, etc., which yet have precisely our fault to thank for their existence. The reflections and conclusions of communism look very simple. As matters lie at this time, in the present situation with regard to the state, therefore, some, and they the majority, are at a disadvantage compared to others, the minority. In this state of things, the former are in a state of prosperity, the latter in a state of need. Hence the present state of things, that is, the state itself, must be done away with. And what in its place? Instead of the isolated state of prosperity, a general state of prosperity, a prosperity of all. Through the revolution the bourgeoisie became omnipotent, and all inequality was abolished by every one's being raised or degraded to the dignity of a citizen. The common man raised, the aristocrat degraded. The third estate became sole estate, that is, namely, the estate of citizens of the state. Now communism responds, our dignity and our essence consist not in our being all, the equal children of our mother, the state, all born with equal claim to her love and her protection, but in our all existing for each other. This is our equality, or herein we are equal in that we, I as well as you, and you, and all of you, are active, or labour each one for the rest, in that each of us is a labourer, then. The point for us is not what we are for the state, citizens, not our citizenship, therefore, but what we are for each other, that each of us exists only through the other, who, caring for my wants, at the same time sees his own satisfied by me. He labours, for example, for my clothing, tailor, I for his need of amusement, comedy writer, rope dancer, he for my food, farmer, I for his instruction, scientist. It is labour that constitutes our dignity and our equality. What advantage does citizenship bring us? burdens, and how high is our labour praised, as low as possible. But labour is our sole value all the same, that we are labourers is the best thing about us, this is our significance in the world, and therefore it must be our consideration too, and must come to receive consideration. What can you meet us with? Surely nothing but labour too. Only for labour or services do we owe you a recompense, not for your bare existence, not for what you are for yourselves either, but only for what you are for us. By what have you claims on us? Perhaps by your high birth? No, only by what you do for us that is desirable or useful. Be it thus, then. 
we are willing to be worth to you only so much as we do for you, but you are to be held likewise by us. Services determine value, that is, those services that are worth something to us, and consequently labours for each other, labours for the common good. Let each one be in the other's eyes a labourer. He who accomplishes something useful is inferior to none, or all labourers, labourers, of course, in the sense of labourers for the common good, that is, communistic labourers, are equal. But, as the labourer is worth his wages, let the wages too be equal. Footnote. In German, an exact quotation of Luke 10, 7. End footnote. As long as faith sufficed for man's honour and dignity, no labour, however harassing, could be objected to, if it only did not hinder a man in his faith. Now, on the contrary, when every one is to cultivate himself into man, condemning a man to machine-like labour amounts to the same thing as slavery. If a factory worker must tire himself to death twelve hours and more, he is cut off from becoming man. Every labour is to have the intent that the man be satisfied. Therefore he must become a master in it too, that is, be able to perform it as a totality. He who in a pin factory only puts on the heads, only draws the wire, works as it were mechanically, like a machine. He remains half trained, does not become a master. His labour cannot satisfy him, it can only fatigue him. His labour is nothing by itself, has no object in itself is nothing complete in itself. He labours only into another's hands, and is used, exploited, by this other. For this labourer in another's service there is no enjoyment of a cultivated mind, at most crude amusements. Culture, you see, is barred against him. To be a good Christian one needs only to believe, and that can be done under the most oppressive circumstances. Hence the Christian-minded take care only of the oppressed labourer's piety, their patience, submission, etc. Only so long as the downtrodden classes were Christians could they bear all their misery, for Christianity does not let their murmurings and exasperation rise. Now the hushing of desires is no longer enough, but their sating is demanded. The bourgeoisie has proclaimed the gospel of the enjoyment of the world, of material enjoyment, and now wonders that this doctrine finds adherence among us poor, it has shown that not faith and poverty, but culture and possessions, make a man blessed. We proletarians understand that too. The commonality freed us from the orders and arbitrariness of individuals, but that arbitrariness was left which springs from the conjuncture of situations, and may be called the fortuity of circumstances, favouring fortune, and those favoured by fortune still remain. When, for example, a branch of industry is ruined and thousands of labourers become breathless, people think reasonably enough to acknowledge that it is not the individual who must bear the blame, but that the evil lies in the situation. Let us change the situation, then, but let us change it thoroughly, and so that its fortuity becomes powerless and a law. Let us no longer be slaves of chance. Let us create a new order that makes an end of fluctuations, let this order then be sacred. Formerly one had to suit the lords to come to anything. After the revolution the word was grasp fortune. Luck hunting or hazard playing, civil life was absorbed in this. Then, alongside this, the demand that he who has obtained something shall not frivolously stake it again. Strange and yet supremely natural contradiction competition in which alone civil or political life unrolls itself is a game of luck through and through from the speculations of the exchange down to the solicitation of offices the hunt for customers looking for work aspiring to promotion and decorations the second-hand dealers petty haggling etc if one succeeds in supplanting and outbidding his rivals then the lucky throw is made for it must be taken as a piece of luck to begin with that the victor sees himself equipped with an ability, even though it has been developed by the most careful industry, against which the others do not know how to rise, consequently that no abler ones are found. And now those who ply their daily lives in the midst of these changes of fortune without seeing any arm in it are seized with the most virtuous indignation when their own principle appears in naked form and breeds misfortune as hazard-playing. Hazard-playing, you see, is too clear, 
too barefaced a competition, and, like every decided nakedness, offends honourable modesty. The socialists want to put a stop to this activity of chance, and to form a society in which men are no longer dependent on fortune, but free. In the most natural way in the world, this endeavour first utters itself as hatred of the unfortunate against the fortunate, that is, of those for whom fortune has done little or nothing, against those for whom it has done everything. But properly the ill-feeling is not directed against the fortunate, but against fortune, this rotten spot of the commonality. As the communists first declare free activity to be man's essence, they, like all workday dispositions, need a Sunday. Like all material endeavours, they need a God, an uplifting and edification alongside their witless labour. That the communist sees in you the man, the brother, is only the Sunday side of communism. According to the workday side, he does not by any means take you as man simply, but as human labourer or labouring man. The first view has in it the liberal principle. In the second, illiberality is concealed. If you were a lazy-bones, he would not indeed fail to recognise the man in you, but would endeavour to cleanse him, as a lazy man, from laziness, and to convert you to the faith that labour is man's destiny and calling. Therefore he shows a double face. With the one he takes heed that the spiritual man be satisfied, with the other he looks about him for means for the material or corporeal man. He gives man a twofold post, an office of material acquisition and one of spiritual. The commonality had thrown open spiritual and material goods, and left it with each one to reach out for them if he liked. Communism really procures them for each one, presses them upon him, and compels him to acquire them. It takes seriously the idea that, because only spiritual and material goods make us men, we must unquestionably acquire these goods in order to be man. The commonality made acquisition free. Communism compels to acquisition, and recognizes only the acquirer, him who practices a trade. It is not enough that the trade is free, but you must take it up. So all that is left for criticism to do is to prove that the acquisition of these goods does not yet by any means make us man. With a liberal commandment that every one is to make a man of himself, or every one to make himself man, there was posited the necessity that every one must gain time for his labour of humanization, that is, that it should become possible for every one to labour on himself. The commonality thought it had brought this about if it handed over everything human to competition, but gave the individual a right to every human thing. Each may strive after everything. Social liberalism finds that the matter is not settled with the may, because may means only it is forbidden to none, but not it is made possible to every one. Hence it affirms that the commonality is liberal only with the mouth and in words, supremely illiberal in act. It, on its part, wants to give all of us the means to be able to labour on ourselves. By the principle of labour, that of fortune or competition is certainly outdone, but at the same time the labourer, in his consciousness that the essential thing in him is the labourer, holds himself aloof from egoism and subjects himself to the supremacy of a society of labourers, as the commoner clung with self-abandonment to the competition state. The beautiful dream of a social duty still continues to be dreamed. People think again that society gives what we need, and we are under obligations to it on that account, owe it everything. Footnote. Proudhon, Création de l'Ordre, cries out, page 414, In industry, as in science, the publication of an invention is the first and most sacred of duties. And footnote. They are still at the point of wanting to serve a supreme giver of all good. That society is no ego at all which could give, bestow, or grant, but an instrument, or means, from which we may derive benefit. That we have no social duties, but solely interests for the pursuance of which society must serve us. That we owe society no sacrifice, but, if we sacrifice anything, sacrifice it to ourselves. Of this the socialists do not think because they, as liberals, are imprisoned in the religious principle, and zealously aspire after a sacred society, for example, the state was hitherto. 
society from which we have everything is a new master a new spook a new supreme being which takes us into its service and allegiance the more precise appreciation of political as well as social liberalism must wait to find its place further on for the present we pass this over in order first to summon them before the tribunal of humane or critical liberalism End of section 14「Section 3, Part 1 As liberalism is completed in self-criticizing, critical liberalism, in which the critic remains a liberal and does not go beyond the principle of liberalism, man, this may distinctively be named after man and called the humane. The laborer is counted as the most material and egoistical man. He does nothing at all for humanity, does everything for himself, for his welfare. The commonalty, because it proclaimed the freedom of man only as to his birth, had to leave him in the claws of the unhuman man, the egoist, for the rest of life. Hence, under the regime of political liberalism, egoism has an immense field for free utilization. The laborer will utilize society for his egoistic ends as the commoner does the state. You have only an egoistic end after all, your welfare, is the humane liberal's reproach to the socialist. Take up a purely human interest, then I will be your companion. But to this, there belongs a consciousness stronger, more comprehensive than a laborer consciousness. The laborer makes nothing, therefore he has nothing, but he makes nothing because his labor is always a labor that remains individual, calculated strictly for his own want, a labor day by day. In opposition to this one might, e.g., consider the fact that Gutenberg's labor did not remain individual, but begot innumerable children, and still lives today. It was calculated for the want of humanity, and was an eternal, imperishable labor. The humane consciousness despises the commoner consciousness, as well as the laborer consciousness. For the commoner is indignant only at vagabonds, at all who have no definite occupation, and their immorality. The laborer is disgusted by the idler, lazybones, and his immoral, because parasitic and unsocial principles. To this, the humane liberal retorts, the unsettledness of many is only your product, Philistine, but that you, proletarian, demand the grind of all and want to make drudgery general is a part, still clinging to you, of your pack-mule life up to this time. Certainly you want to lighten drudgery itself by all having to drudge equally hard, yet only for this reason, that all may gain leisure to an equal extent. But what are they to do with their leisure? What does your society do that this leisure may be passed humanly? It must leave the gained leisure to egoistic preference again, and the very gain that your society furthers falls to the egoist as the gain of the commonality. The masterlessness of man could not be filled with a human element by the state, and therefore was left to arbitrary choice. 
It is assuredly necessary that man be masterless, but therefore the egoist is not to become master over man again either, but man over the egoist. Man must assuredly find leisure, but if the egoist makes use of it, it will be lost for man. Therefore, you ought to have given leisure a human significance, but you laborers undertake even your labor from an egoistic impulse because you want to eat, drink, live. How should you be less egoist in leisure? You labor only because having your time to yourselves, idling, goes well after work done, and what you are to while away your leisure time with is left to chance. But if every door is to be bolted against egoism, it would be necessary to strive after completely disinterested action, total disinterestedness. This alone is human, because only man is disinterested, the egoist always interested. If we let disinterestedness pass unchallenged for a while, then we ask, do you mean not to take an interest in anything, not to be enthusiastic for anything, not for liberty, humanity, etc.? Oh, yes, but that is not an egoistic interest, not interestedness, but a human, i.e. a theoretical interest, to wit, an interest not for an individual or individuals, all, but for the idea, for man. And you do not notice that you too are enthusiastic only for your idea, your idea of liberty. And further, do you not notice that your disinterestedness is again, like religious disinterestedness, a heavenly interestedness? Certainly benefit to the individual leaves you cold, and abstractly you could cry, Fiat libertas periat mundus. You do not take thought for the coming day either, and take no serious care for the individual's wants anyhow, not for your own comfort, nor for that of the rest. But you make nothing of all this, because you are a dreamer. Do you suppose the humane liberal will be so liberal as to aver that everything possible to man is human? On the contrary, he does not indeed share the Philistine's moral prejudice against the strumpet, but that this woman turns her body into a money-getting machine makes her despicable to him as human being. His judgment is, the strumpet is not a human being, or so far as a woman is a strumpet, so far as she unhuman, dehumanized. Further, the Jew, the Christian, the privileged person, the theologian, etc., is not a human being. So far as you are a Jew, etc., you are not a human being. Again, the imperious postulate, cast from you everything peculiar, criticize it away. Be not a Jew, not a Christian, but be a human being, nothing but a human being. Assert your humanity against every restrictive specification. Make yourself by means of it a human being and free from those limits. Make yourself a free man, i.e. recognize humanity as your all-determining essence. I say, you are indeed more than a Jew, more than a Christian, etc., but you are also more than a human being. Those are all ideas, but you are corporeal. Do you suppose, then, that you can ever become a human being as such? Do you suppose our posterity will find no prejudices and limits to clear away, for which our powers were not sufficient? Or... Do you perhaps think that in your fortieth or fiftieth year you have come so far that the following days have nothing more to dissipate in you 
and that you are a human being. The men of the future will yet fight their way to many a liberty that we do not even miss. What do you need that later liberty for? If you meant to esteem yourself as nothing before you had become a human being, you would have to wait till the last judgment, till the day when man or humanity shall have attained perfection. But, as you will surely die before that, what becomes of your prize of victory? Rather, therefore, invert the case and say to yourself, I am a human being. I do not need to begin by producing the human being in myself, for he belongs to me already, like all my qualities. But, asked the critic, how can one be a Jew and a man at once? In the first place, I answer, one cannot be either a Jew or a man at all, if one and Jew or man are meant to the same thing. One always reaches beyond those specifications, and let Isaacs be ever so Jewish. A Jew, nothing but a Jew, he cannot be, just because he is this Jew. In the second place, as a Jew, one assuredly cannot be a man, if being a man means being nothing special. But, in the third place, and this is the point, I can, as a Jew, be entirely what I can be. From Samuel or Moses and others, you hardly expect that they should have raised themselves above Judaism, although you must say that they were not yet men. They simply were what they could be. Is it otherwise with the Jews of today? Because you have discovered the idea of humanity, does it follow from this that every Jew can become a convert to it? If he can, he does not fail to, and if he fails to, he cannot. What does your demand concern him? What the call to be a man which you address to him? As a universal principle, in the human society which the humane liberal promises, nothing special which one or another has is to find recognition. Nothing which bears the character of private is to have value. In this way, the circle of liberalism, which has its good principle in man and human liberty, its bad in the egoist and everything private, its god in the former, its devil in the latter, rounds itself off completely. And if the special or private person lost his value in the state, no personal prerogative, if in the laborers or ragamuffin society, special private property is no longer recognized, so in human society, everything special or private will be left out of account, and when pure criticism shall have accomplished its arduous task, then it will be known just what we must look upon as private, and what, penetrated with a sense of our nothingness, we must let stand. Because state and society do not suffice for humane liberalism, it negates both, and at the same time retains them. So at one time the cry is that the task of the day is not a political, but a social one. And then again, the free state is promised for the future. In truth, human society is both the most general state and the most general society. Only against the limited state is it asserted that it makes too much stir about spiritual private interests, e.g., people's religious belief, and against limited society that it makes too much of material private interests. Both are to leave private interests to private people, and, as human society, concern themselves solely about general human interests. The politicians thinking to abolish personal will, self-will, or arbitrariness, did not observe that through property our self-will gained a secure place of refuge. The socialists, 
taking away property too, do not notice that this secures itself a continued existence in self-ownership. Is it only money and goods then that are a property, or is every opinion something of mine, something of my own? So every opinion must be abolished or made impersonal. The person is entitled to no opinion, but as self-will was transferred to the state, property to society, so opinion too must be transferred to something general, man, and thereby become a general human opinion. If opinion persists, then I have my God. Why, God exists only as my God. He is an opinion, or my faith, and consequently my faith, my religion, my thoughts, my ideals. Therefore, a general human faith must come into existence, the fanaticism of liberty. For this would be a faith that agreed with the essence of man. And because only man is reasonable, you and I might be very unreasonable. A reasonable faith. As self-will and property become powerless, so must self-ownership or egoism in general. In this supreme development of free man egoism, self-ownership is combated on principle, and such subordinate ends as the social welfare of the socialists, etc., vanish before the lofty idea of humanity. Everything that is not a general human entity is something separate, satisfies only some or one, or, if it satisfies all, it does this to them only as individuals, not as men, and is therefore called egoistic. To the socialists, welfare is still the supreme aim, as free rivalry was the approved thing to the political liberals. Now welfare is free too, and we are free to achieve welfare, just as he who wanted to enter into rivalry, competition, was free to do so. But to take part in the rivalry, you need only to be commoners. To take part in the welfare, only to be laborers. Neither reaches the point of being synonymous with man. It is truly well with man only when he is also intellectually free. For man is mind. Therefore, all powers that are alien to him, the mind, all superhuman, heavenly, unhuman powers must be overthrown and the name man must be above every name. So in this end of the modern age, age of the moderns, there returns again as the main point, what had been the main point at its beginning, intellectual liberty. To the communist in particular, the humane liberal says, if society prescribes to you your activity, then this is indeed free from the influence of the individual, i.e. the egoist. But it still does not on that account need to be a purely human activity, nor you to be a complete organ of humanity. What kind of activity society demands of you remains accidental, you know. It might give you a place in building a temple or something of that sort, or even if not that, you might yet on your own impulse be active for something foolish, therefore unhuman. Yes, more yet, you really labor only to nourish yourself in general to live for dear life's sake not for the glorification of humanity. Consequently, free activity is not attained till you make yourself free from all stupidities, from everything non-human, i.e. egoistic, pertaining only to the individual, not to the man in the individual. Dissipate all untrue thoughts that obscure man or the idea of humanity. In short, when you are not merely unhampered in your activity, but the substance too of your activity is only what is human, 
and you live and work only for humanity. But this is not the case so long as the aim of your effort is only your welfare and that of all. What you do for the society of ragamuffins is not yet anything done for human society. Laboring does not alone make you a man, because it is something formal and its object accidental. The question is who you that labor are. As far as laboring goes, you might do it from an egoistic, material impulse, merely to procure nourishment and the like. It must be a labor furthering humanity, calculated for the good of humanity, serving historical, i.e. human, evolution. In short, a human labor. This implies two things. One, that it be useful to humanity. Next, that it be the work of a man. The first alone may be the case with every labor, as even the labors of nature, e.g. of animals, are utilized by humanity for the furthering of science, etc. The second requires that he who labors should know the human object of his labor, and as he can have this consciousness only when he knows himself as man, the crucial condition is self-consciousness. Unquestionably much is already attained when you cease to be a fragment laborer, yet therewith you only get a view of the whole of your labor and acquire a consciousness about it, which is still far removed from a self-consciousness a consciousness about your true self, or essence, man. The laborer has still remaining the desire for a higher consciousness, which, because the activity of labor is unable to quiet it, he satisfies in a leisure hour. Hence, leisure stands by the side of his labor, and he sees himself compelled to proclaim labor and idling human in one breath, yes, to attribute the true elevation to the idler, the leisure enjoyer. He labors only to get rid of labor. He wants to make labor free, only that he may be free from labor. In fine, his work has no satisfying substance, because it is only imposed by society, only a stint, a task, a calling. And conversely, his society does not satisfy because it only gives work. His labor ought to satisfy him as a man. Instead of that, it satisfies society. Society ought to treat him as a man, and it treats him as a ragtag laborer or a laboring ragamuffin. Labor and society are of use to him not as he needs them as a man, but only as he needs them as an egoist. Such is the attitude of criticism toward labor. It points to mind wages the war, of mind with the masses, and pronounces communistic labor unintellectual mass labor. Averse to labor as they are, the masses love to make labor easy for themselves. In literature, which is today furnished in mass, this aversion to labor begets the universally known superficiality which puts from it the toil of research. Therefore, humane liberalism says, You want labor? All right, we want it likewise, but we want it in the fullest measure. We want it not that we may gain spare time, but that we may find all satisfaction in it in self. We want labor because it is our self-development. But then the labor too must be adapted to that end, Man is honored only by human self-conscious labor, only by the labor that has for its end no egoistic purpose. But man, and is man's self-revelation, so that the saying should be, laboro ergo sum, I labor, therefore I am a man. The humane liberal wants that labor of the mind which works up all material. He wants the mind, that leaves no thing quiet or in its existing condition, that acquiesces in nothing, analyzes everything, 
criticizes anew every result that has been gained. This restless mind is the true laborer. It obliterates prejudices, shatters limits and narrownesses, and raises man above everything that would like to dominate over him, while the communist labors only for himself, and not even freely, but from necessity. In short, represents a man condemned to hard labor. The laborer of such a type is not egoistic, because he does not labor for individuals, neither for himself nor for other individuals, not for private men, therefore, but for humanity and its progress. He does not ease individual pains, does not care for individual wants, but removes limits within each humanity's press dispels prejudices which dominate an entire time, vanquishes hindrances that obstruct the path of all, clears away errors in which men entangle themselves, discovers truths which are found through him for all and for all time. In short, he lives and labors for humanity. End of Section 3, Part 1, recorded by Eris Allen.